Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Treasury laws amendment, news media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code bill 2021. Resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. To give you some idea of the scope of the First Nations media sector, it includes over 230 radio broadcast sites coordinated by 35 licensed community-owned not-for-profit organisations. These radio services are able to reach around 320,000 First Nations people, including around 100,000 very hard to reach people in remote Indigenous communities, or approximately 48 per cent of the First Nations population. They broadcast live shows plus interviews, radio documentaries, news, emergency information, community events government and other messaging within community broadcasting guidelines. These video and film production services creating culture and language-based content for broadcast and online distribution. In the TV sphere, Madam Deputy President, we have NITV broadcasting nationally, local TV search services such as Galari TV at Broome, Larrakia TV at Darwin, an ICTV satellite TV service reaches 240,000 remote households, as well as their free-to-air regional locations. In terms of news production, First Nations media is rich with national, regional and local news and current affairs services for broadcast, as well as print and online news media such as National Indigenous Radio Service NERS and its National Indigenous News and Weekly News in Review. Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association's news service, including its Strong Voices program, there's Koori Radio's News and Current Affairs programming, NITV News and Living Black. Print media includes Koori Mail and National Indigenous Times, and there is a strong online presence with sites such as Indigenous X. First Nations media organisations did have a strong social media following and published content online daily. These channels offer a wide range of programming, including news and current affairs reporting from a First Nations perspective in over 25 Indigenous languages nationally, including the first language of many people in remote communities. These First Nations media organisations want to keep going from strength to strength. First Nations broadcasters and not-for-profit community organisations providing a primary and essential service to their communities. Radio services reach nearly 50 per cent of the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, but are prevented from providing a primary radio service to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people due to a lack of funding and spectrum availability. 
The sector reaches significant audience share, with 91 per cent of people in remote Indigenous communities being regular listeners to radio services and watching ICTV at least once per month. In the remote context, First Nations media is the most reliable radio and media service available to audiences. I'm very pleased to support First Nations Media Australia in their call for appropriate government reform that fairly treats and invests in diverse creators of public interest journalism, including smaller media organisations and community broadcasters. Many First, media, First Nations media organisations have built strong social media followings as a forum for community engagement on topics relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audiences. First Nations people are avid consumers of social media. In many ways, Facebook is the new Bush Telegraph. Certainly, uh, a lot of my families and kinship groups keep in touch through messenger and group chats with relatives from all over the country joining in, having a laugh, keeping in touch with all sorts of things, even as to whether the flood levels are up and rivers are impassable. So it's wonderful when I'm here doing work in the Senate in Canberra, I can still be in touch with what's going on in Borolula, in Nuka, in Numbua, in Papanya. But it is a double-edged sword, Madam Deputy President, because we know social media can be a prime vehicle for spreading untruths and misinformation as well. And it is especially worrying at this time when we're about to start a mass vaccination campaign in the fight against COVID-19. And First Nations communities are among those at the head of the queue to receive the vaccine. And we must make sure First Nations community broadcasters maintain their social media presence and can get out the facts and information to their audiences in the most appropriate way. At the beginning of this pandemic, First Nations media organisations were at the forefront of getting the information out to communities, keeping them safe and informed. Working with governments and community-controlled health services, the sector used their social media and broadcast channel to spread the word. Whether it was developing jingles in language to promote handwashing, animations that demonstrated the impact of community lockdowns, or using local leaders promoting health messages in language, First Nations media literally helped save lives. As the chair of First Nations Media Australia, Dot West, said last week, never has our media been more vital than during a global pandemic. In Dot West's words, First Nations media services are not the same as commercial outlets and should not be negatively impacted by an industry-wide response to corporate interests. First Nations Media Association provided input to the development of the proposed mandatory news bargaining code encouraging flexibility in the legislation to avoid unintended consequences such as what we're seeing. The financial interests of commercial enterprises should not come at the expense of independent publishers of information vital to community safety and democracy in this country. The federal government must heed the voice of Dot West and others and the First Nations Media Association and seek an immediate resolution to its conflict with Facebook and protect the First Nations media industry from further negative impacts. The government must also recognise the importance of First Nations news and journalism by providing support for the production of news content essential to First Nations communities. We must have appropriate government reform that fairly treats and invests in diverse creators of public interest journalism, including smaller media organisations and community broadcasters. You know, I reflect on the Catherine Times, the Centralian Advocate. It is vital that these regional newspapers are supported, but we have seen the demise of many of these across the country. The community broadcasters are vital cogs in our media landscape, producing and broadcasting both hyper-local and national news for millions of listeners across Australia creating significant employment, training and career opportunities and ultimately strengthening Australia's democracy by sharing diverse content by diverse and underrepresented voices. The government contends one of the reasons for these amendments was to support public interest journalism. 
and I totally agree that it needs to be supported. But that is not is what is happening under this government, who's busy pandering to the interests of big bus media business mates to be concerned about what is happening to the broadcasters and journalists who are embedded in our communities and keeping their voices alive. When we see so much of our smaller and regional media landscape gutted. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise today to make a contribution on the Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020. Last week, we saw a blatant attempt by a foreign owned company, one of the world's largest corporations, to bully Australia. The tactics used by Facebook to make its point included taking down the pages of children's ch cancer charities, domestic violence fundraisers, state health departments, women's legal services, even government websites responsible for issuing emergency and weather warnings. The reason for this unacceptable behaviour was that the Australian government is seeking to make laws that ensure that big tech companies do not abuse their market power in relation to Australia's journalism and news industry. Facebook or any other company is entitled to express a view and take a position on legislation proposed by the Australian government. But what kind of company would take down a children's cancer charity page to make their point? Countries around the world are becoming increasingly concerned about the market power of big tech and the way in which those companies are using that market power. Last year, a US Congress inquiry into big tech found that companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook and Apple wield their dominance in ways that erode entrepreneurship, degrade citizens' privacy online and undermine the vibrancy of the free and diverse press. The committee report from that inquiry was critical of the testimony of the CEOs of those corporations, saying answers were often evasive and non-responsive raising fresh questions about whether they believe they are beyond the reach of democratic oversight. Facebook's actions in Australia last week clearly raise the question of whether it believes it is beyond the reach of democratic oversight in this country. Quite clearly, their actions were designed to heavy the Australian government and indeed this Senate into not proceeding with this bill that we're discussing here today. They want to send a message that they are bigger and more powerful than the Australian people, that they can press a button and change the minds of those of us elected to represent the Australian people in the nation's parliament. Today, we are here sending the message that that is not the case. It's hard to deny that massive corporations like Facebook, Twitter and Google have made themselves central to public life and daily communication in Australia. Over the last decade, they have become primary methods for government departments, health and emergency authorities, news media, politicians and political parties to disseminate information amongst the public. It has become a fair expectation that a government health department, for example, has a Facebook and a Twitter account. People have become accustomed to going to these pages to find information they need. Yes, there are obviously other ways they can find that information from those organisations, but if you don't see the information in the way that you're accustomed to, what guarantee is there that you'll go and visit a website and track it down for yourself there? One could, of course, make the argument that nobody is compelled to use these services and it's not compulsory for these companies to provide a platform to every individual or organisation. That's true. But nobody could deny that in 2021, trying to communicate with a large audience without relying to some extent on these big tech platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Google, is going to seriously limit the amount of people you can reach. I acknowledge the decision of Google to, in this instance, act responsibly and negotiate with Australian news media organisations to reach a fair commercial outcome regarding the sharing of journalism on its platform. Nevertheless, we still have a situation in Australia where any of these major corporations has the power, if they choose to use it, to destroy an Australian business 
or to affect the outcomes of an undemocratic election, in, of rather a, of a democratic election in Australia. One of the most concerning actions of Facebook last week was that in the midst of the West Australian state election campaign, it suddenly and without warning took offline the page of the Western Australian opposition leader. People from all sides of politics have denounced this action because it reveals a very serious potential problem for our democracy. That problem is that these platforms are so dominant and play such a major role in how our society communicates with each other that if some participants in an election have access to platforms and others don't, we can reasonably expect that to have an impact on how people vote. What happens if big tech decides that it doesn't want a certain party to form government at the next election? or that they don't want certain senators elected? Does anyone really doubt that these massive foreign companies could have a major impact on the results of our democratic elections or that if they thought it was in their commercial interest to do so, that they would? Even before last week, it's clear that big tech companies are willing to take sides on political issues and public debates and remove access to their platforms to people they judge to have the wrong point of view. It's well documented that Twitter, for example, regularly bans accounts of women who tweet about sex-based rights for women. One of the most egregious examples that has been brought to my attention by constituents is an account which was banned for tweeting that only females get cervical cancer. Twitter judged this comment to be a violation of its rules against hateful conduct. Is it any wonder when Twitter bans simple statements of fact like that, a fact which is central to how we fight a deadly disease that kills millions of women, that we see other media censoring the same views and universities, governments, other institutions developing policies which are increasingly out of touch with reality. It's just one example of how tech giants can and do play a major role in public policy debates by using their power to determine what is seen as acceptable speech and what isn't, and what a politician or a political candidate can say and what they can't. While Facebook is clearly front of mind at the moment because of its misguided behaviour last week, and we've heard uh, extensively across the chamber from other senators expressing their views about this, we shouldn't overlook the fact that Twitter also has huge market power over the flow of information. As others have pointed out, these tech companies like Twitter and Facebook have very poor records at tackling illegal content on their platforms. Both have frankly been repeatedly too slow to take down accounts distributing child abuse material. Both have hosted material promoting violence and terrorism. They claim, when this is pointed out to them, that it's too difficult to find and take down these accounts. Yet Facebook had no problem pushing a button last week and banning all Australian news content. And Twitter has no problem removing an account that tweets that only females get cervical cancer. Of course, if Facebook or any other company doesn't wish to offer news content on their site, that's up to them. Ultimately, if that's the path they're going to pursue, then it's up to their customers to determine whether they'll keep using a platform which doesn't offer any real news or journalism. But what wasn't acceptable, Madam Deputy President, was the decision by these companies, by Facebook, to try and bully the Australian government and the Australian parliament into making a different decision by suddenly and arbitrarily banning all sorts of pages, as we saw last week. In my own state of Tasmania, the Facebook pages of our Women's Legal Service and Sexual Assault Support Service were both shut down. This is an absolute disgrace. It's been well documented that charities and essential services were also taken offline without any justification or prior notification. Mark my words, this is not the behaviour of a good corporate citizen. It's been interesting to note the reaction from around the world to Facebook's actions. Much of the commentary has focused on the fact that what Facebook is trying to do is send a message to the governments of other countries. 
As I referenced earlier, the issue of the dominance of big tech and the impact that they have on businesses and on our democracy is one which many countries are grappling with. Other nations may or may not choose to pursue the same type of laws we are debating here today, but it's clear that many nations will be taking steps to curtail the abuse of market power by big tech. That's why leaders from other countries have urged Australia to stand our ground and to not back down. Once again, Madam Deputy President, the world is looking to Australia as a leader in standing up to attempts at coercion. And once again, the Australian government is showing that leadership by demonstrating our sovereignty and our commitment to making laws which this parliament deems to be in the interest of the Australian people. As the Prime Minister has said repeatedly over the last 12 months, Australia does not respond to threats. We are a sovereign nation and we are not going to be bullied or coerced by other nations or by foreign corporations worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Madam Deputy President, uh, yes, Madam Deputy President, it has been pleasing that politicians from all sides have supported this principle and made clear that Facebook's actions last week were utterly unacceptable. And I sat in the chamber last night and listened to a range of contributions from around the chamber. And listening to those contributions, it would appear that the concerns that I have raised in my short remarks in the chamber today are, are widely shared. And it's one of those unfortunately sometimes rare moments in this place where we as parliamentarians come together and while we might disagree on the manner in which we determine to solve a problem, we agree that a problem exists and that something must be done to rectify it. And that's why as a nation and as a parliament we will continue to pass laws which are in the interests of our society, our economy and our people. And it might be the case that after the events of last week, we might in the future need to make further laws to tackle the undue influence of massive tech companies on our democracy. And if that is the case, Madam Deputy President, I'm confident that the government will do as it has always done, which is take advice from the experts and consult at length with the public and all affected participants and businesses before passing legislation. And it would be remiss of me in making these remarks to the chamber today to not mention the good work of the Senate Economics Committee chaired by Senator Slade Brockman, who I note is in the chamber and the inquiry that they undertook into this very piece of legislation that we are discussing here today, which canvassed many of the issues uh, that I have raised in my own contribution around the market power that these big tech companies have and the pervasive and, and somewhat disruptive impact that these businesses have had, both in terms of our media landscape in, uh, in Australia and more broadly, our democracy. Madam Deputy President, when I was compiling my notes to speak on this, uh, this bill today, I couldn't help but wonder, as one of the younger senators in this place, um, I am of the generation that effectively grew up with Facebook and Twitter and, um, before that, MySpace, although that is not necessarily um, the concern of what we're talking about here today, and thinking about how social media has changed the way that we uh, communicate with each other, but more importantly, how we get information. And, and fundamentally, it is that massive change in the last 10 to 15 years since uh, fellow millennials have grown up and embraced social media and seen all of the good that it can do, that we now see some of the challenges that it raises. And I think it's really pertinent that this government and that this parliament 
has turned its mind to some of these issues uh, and is looking at addressing them with the bill that we are debating here today. I suspect more needs to be done, but this is an incredibly important space for government to be proposing solutions. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. And I would also like to acknowledge in the chamber uh, the presence of Senator Slade Brockman, who has uh, chaired the Economics Legislative Committee uh, so ably through this process. And indeed, all of the senators who have been a part of the Economics Legislation uh, Committee that has held hearings into uh, this issue of considering a news media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code. As a member of that committee, uh, I had the opportunity to see firsthand the quite extraordinary behaviour of Google and Facebook. It was, uh, in many ways, a terrific example of just why this legislation has been considered and why it's so important. And the churlish actions, I have to say, of both companies uh, prior to the hearings um, during the hearings into the Australian media landscape uh, and, of course, subsequently in Facebook's uh, latest actions um, show that the attempts by the Morrison-McCormack government to bring fairness to the sector were exactly the right thing to do. Now, in Australia, we have a, a relatively small population, and this is not the only example where we've had to address a market imbalance um, through the introduction of a code. Uh, so there are many agricultural um, industries, uh, supermarkets uh, that have all benefited from a rebalancing of um, the market. And, uh, and indeed, the evidence from the ACCC and Professor Alan Fells uh, was quite startling in its directness about how there was a market failure and that it was so important to have a mandatory code in this space because it was only with the um, threat and then the execution of a mandatory code that would force these mega digital companies to come to the table and to negotiate with Australian uh, media businesses. So I just want to clarify again for anybody who is unsure the purpose uh, of this code. So it is a world first, and we will have much of the world looking at Australia and the success of this binding code that will address the bargaining power imbalance between news media businesses and digital platforms. This, media, uh, this bargaining code has been developed after extensive public consultation, which has gone on for nearly three years. And the code will ensure that news media businesses are fairly remunerated for the content they generate, helping to sustain public interest journalism in Australia. Because it is the role of the fourth estate, it is the role of the media to hold uh, business, um, uh, the government, politicians uh, to account, as well as um, manage that very important uh, process of uh, informing our communities and this idea of hyper-local media, which is so critical to the success of our communities. And if there's something that's come out of COVID, it has been our uh, desire to feel more connected, to understand more of what's going on uh, in our street, in our suburb, in our town, in our region, in our state, in our nation and in the world of increasingly global events, it is so important that we have a media that is capable of doing that. The code will support a diverse and sustainable Australian news media sector, including Australia's public broadcaster. And the most important part is to encourage the parties to undertake commercial negotiations outside of the code, which I am very pleased to note uh, has commenced. I think one of the things we heard during the um, evidence was uh, a lack of connection being made by these digital platforms around what their impact has been. They were 
uh, proposing that they were merely a, um, a, a platform that provided media to be read. But what they failed to uh, address was the number of Australian businesses who have been lured away from traditional advertising media. So by that I mean um, the local paper, adver advertisements in the local paper, um, advertising on the local radio, and this move to uh, advertising and promoting on Facebook, uh, buying Google AdWords. And I've spoken to so many businesses that have invested a significant amount of their marketing dollars into these global tech giants, but it has come at a price. And that price has been that our local media outlets have lost that advertising revenue, which of course then allowed them to pay for their journalists, pay for the news content. Uh, so what we have to understand is what percentage of the market that Facebook and Google have now obtained of the digital advertising space. We have to exclude things like uh, billboards, but understand of the marketing dollars being spent in Australia, uh, where they are, uh, how much it is and where it is going. So, uh, Senator Chandler has just made some terrific points as she spoke just then, uh, particularly around uh, Facebook making commentary around how difficult it was for them to manage content on their pages. And yet they were so quick to shut down so many pages uh, just recently. Um, charities, emergency services, important weather information like the Bureau Bureau of Meteorology, uh, we, women's legal centres, community notice boards, all of these that have been uh, now in the situation of providing really important local news and media uh, to their communities. So that was a really unfortunate own goal uh, to Facebook's credit. Much of it has been uh, quickly rec rectified. But it has demonstrated the extraordinary power and reach that these businesses now have. Uh, and I know that in my regional parts of Queensland how important these pages are. Senator McCarthy talked about the, uh, the, the Facebook groups and news groups that connect her across her people um, around the, uh, the north, and it is the same for me. Um, the shared joy and despondency as people read who's got the rain. Facebook page. Who's got it are very happy, and those who didn't uh, have to manage to contain their despair, but in some ways it's no different to the old uh, phone party lines where people used to ring up and, and share news of rain. But I personally know Queensland journalists who were made redundant in recent years as advertising dollars went from regional newspapers to the big tech companies and offshore instead of being reinvested into the industry. And as advertisers, advertisers devoted more of their budgets to Google and Facebook, News Corp made the decision to stop printing newspapers in the smaller centres, Charters Towers, Bowen, Whitsundays, Port Douglas, Atherton, Mareeba and Innisfail, uh, just to name a few, resulting not only in job losses but the loss of key local information sources in those communities. So I just wanted to call out a few of those incredible community leaders who have continued. People like Colin Jackson, the tireless editor of the Longreach Leader newspaper, who by his own admission has made his life so much tougher by expanding into other towns in central Queensland. The leader now covers a vast area from the western Queensland border right down to the southwest corner. And now, with papers operating in Emerald and elsewhere in central Queensland, it's great to see that local news is still a hot commodity in the bush. Colin's brother David has also started a paper in Home Hill in North Queensland, which is voraciously consumed by the townsfolk each edition. Now, you'll all be interested to know that there is a, a North Queensland businessman by the name of Scott Morrison, not our own Prime Minister, but a very uh, active uh, businessman who's recently started the Burdekin Local News. Uh, Carl Portella at the Mariborat Express, who's weathered the storm and continues to service 
the Atherton Tablelands. And I'd also like to acknowledge the commitment to local news of Al Curtin, the Group General Manager of North Queensland Radio, which covers from Innisfail to the Car Gulf of Carpentaria and all points <coughs> in between. I couldn't go on without mentioning Ben Dobbin, who on his regional Queensland Today show covers so many of the important issues uh, that stretch across our state. Um, Derek Barry, the North West Star and Mount Isa, one of the most committed newspaper editors I've seen when it comes to ensuring that everything from the very important to the very trivial local events are covered. Uh, we heard evidence from Country Press Australia, a terrifically important organisation which represents more than 160 independent regional and local mastheads across Australia. This organisation is more than 100 years old and has mastheads within its membership that are more than 160 years old. And so it is terrifically important that as part of this process we continue to consider regional newspapers uh, regional media and the role that they pay, play in holding uh, local members, local organisations and local issues to account. And that uh, when the code is reviewed in 12 months' time after its um, uh, introduction, that we also consider how those communities, um, community papers and media organisations um, are, are being uh, treated. Google and Facebook have now negotiated to pay Australian media outlets for the content they promote on their sites, and the ABC will be a beneficiary of this. Now, during the hearings, the ABC said it was committed to spending extra revenue on regional, regional journal, journalism, which is so important because the ABC uh, likes to promote itself as being somebody who covers um, uh, weather events, um, important issues around the nation. But of the ABC's 3,273 content makers, just 537 are located outside of capital cities. Now, this is a staggering uh, disparity, and it brings into sharp relief the work that has been done by journalists such as Charlie McKillop and Tom Major in far north Queensland. They never cease to amaze me by the miles they do and the important events they cover. There's also ABC North Queensland's Michael Clark, ABC Far North's Adam Stevens, uh, with whom I have regular contact through their radio sh um, shows, as well as Crystal Gordon, Zara Margolis at ABC Northwest, Shirley Way from Resonate Regional Radio, uh, Paula Tapiolis in Townsville, and Eric Barker just to name a very few more, because these journalists epitomise the commitment to regional journalism that must be admired and respected, because they are the ones, they are the ones who act as the photographer, the sound producer. Uh, they edit their own, they write and edit their own stories. They drive thousands of kilometres every year to get around, and yet they are so poorly resourced by the ABC. And I make a, a very clear call that, as part of the uh, uh, Senate inquiry, um, the ABC made a commitment that this additional revenue would flow to these kind of content makers and journalists, and I intend to hold them very carefully to that commitment. During the hearings, the ABC said it wanted to move 75 per cent of the Ultimo Bay staff out of Sydney within five years. But Given that Parramatta and Western Sydney is considered uh, regional, uh, then I am not holding much hope of them getting too far. But again, um, I'm sure that they will be making a very, uh, very valiant attempt to commit to genuinely regional Australia. So the, go the government running this agenda during COVID was terrifically important because we know how important it is to know what happens in your local community. And we need qualified and trained journalists to gather this information. We need it distilled, we need it presented, we need it fact-checked. And these journalists need to be paid for this important work. The code provides a framework for parties to reach commercial agreements so that news media businesses are fairly remunerated for the content they generate. 
An essential feature of the code is that it encourages parties to undertake commercial negotiations outside the code. It's encouraging to see recent reports that that is exactly what's happening. So the code, as I said, will be reviewed by Treasury one year after its operation to ensure that it is delivering the outcomes that are consistent with the government's stated policy intent. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Senator Small. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to address the Chamber today on the very important matter of the Treasury Laws Amendment News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill of 2020. And I think it comes to, or it should come, uh, as no surprise to honourable senators here today that yet again the eyes of the world are on Australia and on the Morrison government. Because not only uh, in our response to the global COVID 19 pandemic, but also in this very important area, uh, the Morrison government is uh, at, the, at the very forefront of progress on important matters. So uh, this bill, as we've heard around the chamber today, uh, establishes a world first mandatory code to address the bargaining power imbalances between digital platforms and Australian news businesses. As someone who grew up uh, in regional and rural Australia, uh, I found that Senator Macdonald's comments resonated very strongly with me as someone that understands fundamentally uh, the importance to Australian people of access to journalism that represents them, their lives, their communities, uh, the places that they choose to bring up their, their children. So it is absolutely right that it is a priority of the Morrison government uh, to ensure and sustain the public interest in quality journalism being accessible across Australia. I guess the reality of this situation is that uh, regulation around large digital platforms is a very new thing. Uh, when I first went to high school, uh, iPhones and iPods uh, were not yet a thing. And yet now we see Facebook and Google as ubiquitous in our lives, not only online in the content that we consume, but indeed in appliances and a, a sweeping connectivity thanks to the Internet of Things. So the very real question for governments, not just here in Australia but around the globe, is how to appropriately regulate those businesses in a way that doesn't undermine their business models, doesn't undermine the business models of other sectors and yet allows fairness, transparency and the integrity that we've come to expect uh, in all aspects of Australian business, but nonetheless the fourth estate. Consumers are obtaining more and more news online. That is you know, a statement, I guess, that reflects the broader shift uh, in the way that Australians consume much of the material that we, that we see, listen uh, and read. In fact, uh, I've long personally given away a paper subscription uh, and instead read uh, Australian journalism on my iPad, for instance. I think that that's not something that makes me an outlier, but very much in line with Australians uh, in issuing what, what uh, traditional business models have been disrupted by the rise and rise of technology. So it's very clear, I think, from uh, the, the, the bill before the parliament now that the Morrison government's intent here uh, is to ensure that the sustainability uh, and the future of Australian media outlets uh, is embedded in a system, a mandatory code, uh, that will not undermine but enhance the public interest in journalism. So it's no bad thing that the digital platforms are thriving. In fact, that's a very good thing for Australians. But the reality is that their advertising revenues are growing in leaps and bounds. Those very same advertising revenues were once uh, what supported quality journalism in rural, regional and urban Australia. My very first job was, in fact, delivering a regional newspaper. 
uh, and I was particularly grieved to see that the Bunbury Mail, uh, which provided me with that very first taste of what it is to be employed in Australia, uh, was unfortunately suspended at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Those are very fond memories of mine, Mr Acting Deputy President. Rising early in the morning, heading down to the warehouse with my uh, long-suffering mother, collecting fast bundles of uh, newspapers and the advertising pamphlets which we had to hand insert into each paper, uh, and then delivering those across the neighbourhood, all before turning up to school bright-eyed, bushy-tailed and ready to go again. So I guess uh, the point there, Mr Acting Deputy President, is that uh, quality journalism is important to me and is important to the Morrison government. Uh, and that's why we encourage the parties uh, to undertake commercial negotiations either inside or outside the provisions of this code. So the code itself does, however, set a minimum standard for commercial negotiations between Australian news and media businesses and the digital platforms uh, to address that power imbalance that was so clearly evident in the ACCC report. Uh, and has been the subject of further inquiry uh, with the good work of the Senate committee ably chaired by my colleague and fellow Western Australian, Senator Brockman. The minimum standards in that code are, of course, uh, an advance notice of major algorithm changes. Uh, and it's quite important that, that uh, we recognise that the, the, the bill contemplates only a content algorithm and not an advertising algorithm. Uh, good faith bargaining, which is a principle that upholds all business uh, relations in Australia, and that where a commercial deal cannot be reached, that there's a process of fair and balanced arbitration. And that, that process of arbitration, as we've seen uh, some, some uncertainty eliminated in recent days and weeks, uh, is a lump sum payment. It is no disincentive uh, to businesses doing well uh, in Australia today. Senator Macdonald raised a very uh, pertinent question, I think, in reflecting on just how much of that advertising revenue uh, goes to the big two digital giants, being Facebook and Google. So honourable senators would be startled to know uh, that $81 in every $100 of online advertising spend in Australia goes to Google and Facebook. In any other market where we saw two players uh, with 81 per cent of the market, Australians would rightly expect uh, that there be uh, mandatory, uh, uh, mandatory provisions within Australia to ensure that good faith element uh, and uphold uh, the sorts of things that we expect uh, in the course of life. So the code provides for digital platforms to publish standard offers which are a way for smaller news media businesses to avoid the cost and time of going to arbitration. And that's a very real uh, disadvantage for small uh, businesses, which I know too well, Mr Acting Deputy President, and so is a great thing. Enforcing clearly defined and open standards allows for greater transparency for both parties. I think the Treasurer has been clear that at this stage uh, the code will only apply to the Facebook news feed and Google search. And that very much reflects this 81 per cent share uh, of the market that they currently enjoy, and therefore that they have uh, the ability to clearly impact Australian society and Australia's uh, place in the world. Indeed, uh, we're seeing a, a, an unprecedented level of interest internationally in this Australian legislation precisely because of the fact that these platforms do have such an ability to influence life here and elsewhere. I can think of no better example uh, than, as uh, Senator Chandler raised, and this is something that I guess uh, stunned uh, myself, uh, Minister Reynolds and Senator Brockman as Western Australians, along with our fellow WA colleagues, and that was, of course, Facebook's egregious breach uh, of faith in blocking access to Zach Kirkup's Facebook page, whilst maintaining uh, full rights for the Premier of Western Australia, Mark McGowan, uh, to publish his material. This comes in the midst of an election campaign, 
Uh, it goes to, uh, I guess, fundamentally undermine uh, an important democratic process that's underway. Uh, and so, whilst it might be funny for some uh, to refer to Zach Kirkup as being zucked, uh, I think the rest of us look on aghast. And the reality is uh, that you know Zach Kirkup was not alone. Uh, WA has recently been struck by very serious uh, bushfires in the Perth Hills. Uh, so access to Western Australia's Department of Fire and Emergency Services page being blocked, along with the Hobart Women's Shelter, and dare I say that I am probably not going to uh, not go, going to come to the assistance of the ACTU in this place very often. However, even the ACTU was deprived of its ability to communicate effectively as a result of Facebook's actions. So I think that we've seen uh, a response from the Australian people to come out strongly in support of this bill, to come out in support of uh, what is fair and decent, protects uh, journalism and the generation of quality news content in Australia, particularly regional and rural Australia, um, and, and that's welcome, Mr Acting Deputy President. But I think it's also worthy um, of reflection that you know, uh, we actually encourage Facebook and Google to continue uh, their important role in Australia. We contemplate that this bill provides uh, for continued presence in Australia, uh, where they and uh, media businesses are able to thrive and prosper together. That is a good thing uh, for all Australians. So the actions that they took in retaliation to uh, Australian uh, parliaments, well, the Australian Parliament contemplating this provision were rightly egregious. They have since been wound back. Uh, so I think that we see that the, uh, the way forward is to reflect on the provisions of the bill, which have been subject to significant scrutiny. This was not a thought bubble. This was not an idea that the Morrison government has rolled out in, in undue haste. Uh, as honourable senators have previously reflected on, this is a matter of some three years now of reflection, uh, inquiry, and careful consideration. So, with with the transparency uh, of due process, with the support of the Australian Consumer Competition Commission, uh, with the good work that's been done by the Senate Committee, with the support of the House of Representatives, and therefore, I think, hopefully the support of the Australian Senate, uh, we will see a piece of legislation through this, pass, uh, through this place uh, which will um, absolutely see Australia in global headlines. And it will be in global headlines for introducing a world-leading and binding code that only addresses the power imbalance between news media businesses and digital platforms, but does allow uh, for those businesses to continue in Australia. It allows for those businesses to undertake commercial negotiations outside the code. Uh, and in fact, we have already seen that long before the passage of this bill be through the Senate. Uh, and that is a fantastic show of faith by the Australian business community. Uh, seeing uh, media businesses with an efficient pathway to finalise those agreements and without uh, in inhibition for small uh, and medium-sized enterprises to reach deals with global giants, Mr Acting Deputy President, will be something that Australians will applaud. Ensuring that an independent arbiter is able to, de to determine the level of that remuneration that should be paid under a fair and balanced final offer arbitration model uh, in the event of a dispute or the failure to see an agreement reached uh, is an appropriate safeguard. Uh, and setting clear and workable minimum standards for digital platforms, including requiring 14 days' advance notice uh, of deliberate algorithm changes, uh, is again something that Australians will see as fair. Australians will see that as reasonable. And most importantly, Australians in rural and regional Australia uh, will continue to be able to enjoy news content that's generated in rural and regional Australia news content that's meaningful to them and their families and their communities. Uh, so, in short, uh, we see only good things to come from this bill. But, as any responsible government would, we've undertaken for a review of this legislation just 12 months after its implementation 
to verify that the operation uh, of the bill is delivering the outcomes that are consistent with the very genuine uh, uh, policy intent with which this government acts. It's on that basis that I commend the, uh, the, the provisions of the news media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code to the Senate. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, we've seen so much change. Now, I'd, I'd never reflect on, on the age of, uh, of you, Mr Acting Deputy Chair, or myself, but uh, standing up after Senator Small, you know, the one of the uh, more recent arrivals to this place, and, and someone who is uh, a little younger than myself and following uh, uh, Senator Chandler, I will reflect that perhaps you and I saw a different telecommunications uh, environment, particularly when we were growing up. I mean, I very well remember. Admittedly, I was a, a little hacker, but I, I very well remember the fights over just getting connected to the uh, phone system uh, in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, the battles then were over access. The battles now are. Uh, and the challenges that we face as a government and as a society are over something very different. Uh, the mobile phone that we all carry in our pocket has now got a level of connectivity that was unimaginable half a generation ago. Access to information and news sources that was unimaginable half a generation ago. Uh, ubiquitous across our society uh, in a way that was an unimaginable just half a generation ago. I, I, I remember I and a group of friends had one of the first modems uh, in Western Australia uh, in, in the early 90s, and literally there were a few bulletin boards you could access. Uh, and today the internet obviously allows people, through their devices, uh, through their computers, to access news sources, not just in their own backyard, but right round this planet. And that puts an enormous pressure on our regulatory framework. It puts an enormous pressure on society. It puts an enormous pressure on us as lawmakers to make wise choices in an environment where technological change, quite frankly, outpaces the ability of the legal system to keep up. Uh, so it is a challenge, and getting the balance right in these things means that we must always be nimble, flexible, be willing to try a new approach, but then also to see if it is working and if it is not, see where it is working and where it needs to be changed. And I think in this bill we see uh, a willingness to embrace the need to address what is a clear and dramatic issue in the media environment, but also one where technological change, the platforms people use, the way people interact with the internet is also constantly changing and evolving. So we cannot stand still. We not, cannot pretend, and we do not pretend as a government, that this is a one-step process where all the problems that uh, uh, we currently see in, in the uh, news media environment will be solved by this legislation. In fact, uh, the, the, the ministers involved, uh, uh, the Treasurer, the Minister for Communications, understand fully that we need to look at this area constantly and we need to keep focusing on what is working, what is not working, and make sure that we deliver an environment in this country where we are balancing the needs of the commercial sector with the needs of the fourth estate to maintain a strong journalistic presence, delivering high quality, factual, evidence-based journalism uh, to the Australian people. People have a thirst for local news in this country, and it is one of the great shames that we've seen in this transition to a new, much more digital world, that those small regional, uh, particularly newspapers, small regional media outlooks Let's radio stations, TV stations, but particularly newspapers, have been uh, a, a, a severe casualty of the technological change uh, that's washed over uh, the, the world in the, in the last generation or so. 
Um, without those local media sources, people look around. They look at what options are available to them. And unfortunately, we have an environment where some of the options that are available are not necessarily uh, positive in terms of how those people interact with society and um, the political environment and information. And we, so we see the, the growth of, of sources of information that are, at best, dubious. Uh, and we see the need for those high-quality sources of information as being uh, so much more dramatic. Now, that said, uh, and, and a few people have mentioned in this place that as chair of the economics we had a look at this bill, and I come to the examination of an issue like this with the fundamental belief that if we can avoid regulation, we should do so, that we should not step in merely because there is a problem. We should only step in where there is a problem and there is also a way that the government can solve it without overly constraining people's ability to operate in a free and open society. And I think one of the very telling things we saw through that inquiry uh, was some of the comments made by Facebook. And I wish, I wish to acknowledge, um, before I go into that, I just wish to acknowledge the other members of the committee. Uh, uh, we've already heard from Senator Bragg and uh, Senator MacDonald, who are my colleagues on the committee. But I also particularly want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge Senator Alex Gallagher, uh, who's uh, the deputy chair of the committee. And um, Alex always comes at these issues with a very fair uh, perspective, very open mind, a very inquiring mind. Uh, yeah. Senator, Senator Jenny, Jenny McAllister and, and uh, and Senator Rex, Rex Patrick are also on the committee. And I think one of the things that really stood out uh, on the day when we heard from Google or, and Facebook was, was a, a question from my colleague, uh, Senator Bragg, uh, to Facebook. And he basically asked them what high quality, objective, independent Australian news was worth to them. And the answer was, well, not very much. Uh, and that, that was a shocking answer on a number of counts. I mean, it's shocking on its surface. Um, but it was also shocking because Facebook, were, at the same time as saying that, had done deals with media companies to pay them for content. So you've got them, on the one hand, saying that high-quality content has no commercial value to them. But on the other hand, they're paying for that same content. That's a circle that doesn't square. So we've got a situation where the environment in which news media is operating has changed so very dramatically. As I say, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Chair, when we were, when we were both younger men, we, um, the newspapers were you know, an inch thick. The classified sections were half the paper, and they delivered the proverbial rivers of gold to the large media organisations. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I do literally remember the West Australian was, was an inch thick some Saturdays with, with uh, a huge classified section, you know, 20 or 30 different um, pull-out advertising uh, materials, plus obviously the, the copy adverts uh, as well. And that funded a lot of public interest journalism in this country. Uh, right round this country, both at a very granular local level in cities like uh, Bunbury, where Senator Small comes from, uh, uh, right across the regional areas of Australia, and in the large cities, obviously, that provided a really significant source of revenue to provide the, the copy that uh, obviously drove sales in those papers, keeping people informed on the, of the events of the day. Um, and as those uh, classifieds disappeared, went online in a variety of different forms, the advertising drifted away. As Senator Small so rightly commented, now 81 per cent of digital advertising goes to those two large companies we're talking about today. Uh, you have a gutting of public interest journalism. Uh, and a significant diminution of the level of ability of 
on the ground media providers to, um, to continue. Now, not all of that can be addressed through a bill such as this. It doesn't pretend to address all those issues. Many of those issues are structural issues which, in, 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 a, in a fundamental way, can never be addressed. Um, it's difficult to see of an, envir of an environment where all those many hundreds, thousands of regional newspapers will ever exist again in the way they did before. That's not to say they cannot be replaced by something else. In fact, many of them have been replaced by online, online services of one form or another in those towns, um, perhaps not providing exactly what the newspapers provided, but certainly providing a source of information, news uh, and up-to-date uh, uh, information on local events. Uh, so in that frame, we have then these very large media companies having an extraordinarily dominant position and the government, uh, through the work of the ACCC, has developed this mandatory code to address this massive bargaining power imbalance which exists between the digital news platform and Australian news businesses. As we continue to uh, obtain more and more of our news online, we have to give those news media outlets a way of grappling with uh, the need to find those vi viable and sustainable business models for the provision of that journalism, which is so fundamental to a free and open democratic society. And I think the digital platforms themselves would acknowledge that they are thriving and have an extraordinarily central place uh, within uh, this new digital environment uh, that we're all operating in. So these behemoths that have such influence, such control over that digital advertising revenue, uh, earn revenue from the content that's been created by the media companies in Australia. And this code of conduct is a way of allowing those Australian news media businesses from being, for being, uh, being fairly remunerated for the provision of those services. Again, this all comes back to this massive imbalance of bargaining power. Now, as I've said, my preference would be for as, least, as little regulation as possible, and that is why I am extraordinarily pleased that we are seeing so many deals being commenced and concluded outside the code. I think it is very important that where a commercial deal can be struck between two players in a free market environment, that it is struck um, as soon as possible and with, as least, with the least regulatory impost as possible. So, and this was always part of the fundamental design of the code, and I think a, a really important part of the design of the code, and one I, I certainly wish to you know, acknowledge the work of, of uh, Ministers Fletcher and uh, Treasurer Frydenberg. Uh, it, it is very important that, in line with our principles and the way we approach these issues, that those agreements outside the code have standing in their own commercial right. They do not need to reference the code and they do um, not need to be within the code to still exist. So I, I think it's very important that uh, we listen to the media companies going forward, but we must also listen to Google and Facebook and the other large digital players going forward. Uh, as the committee recommended and as the government had, um, had uh, already um, acknowledged, this is a complex area of law which does need to be examined on an ongoing basis. Uh, ongoing basis. And we have, have the, um, the review in 12 months' time. Uh, it, it is important that we look to see 
how the digital environment evolves over the next 12 months. I think it is very fair to say, as Senator Small and, and many others who have made a contribution in this place uh, in, in today and, and yesterday, uh, have acknowledged the eyes of the world are on us as we do this. Uh, we want to, as a government, get this right. We want to be a demonstration to the rest of the world as to how they can get this right. Thank you, Senator Brockman, and I call Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This bill will, if passed, see big overseas tech corporations pay Australian news media outlets for content appearing on their platforms. The purpose of the News Media Bargaining Code is to level the playing field between news media and big tech when negotiating commercial agreements. The code was recommended by the Consumer Watch Watchdog, the ACCC, after its inquiry into digital platforms in Australia. Google and Facebook are gate gatekeepers of the internet. They are massive tech corporations which profit off ad revenue that used to support local and independent media. They also profit by harvesting, aggregating and selling data regarding their users. According to the ACCC, Google and Facebook generate more than $6 billion a year of advertising revenue in Australia. Massive revenues, massive profits, but they pay little or no tax in our country. These big, big tech corporations monetise their audiences, ordinary Australians, by selling advertising alongside the news content that they aggregate and curate on their platforms. At the same time, they are collecting huge amounts of personal data from each user, which is then monetised and used to better target future advertising at them. As Tristan Harris, a former Google design ethicist, warned on the documentary The Social Dilemma, if you don't pay for the product, you are the product. Due to their virtual monopolies, news media have had no choice but to distribute their journalism via these big tech platforms. But let's not fall into the trap of seeing media moguls like Rupert Murdoch as a victim in all of this. Because just like Facebook controls much of Australia's online activity, News Corporation, tragically for this country, controls much of the Australian media. But the similarities don't end there. Both are big corporations with offshore head offices that don't pay their fair share of tax in this country. And their respective leaders, Mark Zuckerberg and Rupert Murdoch, have far too much influence over Australian policy and Australian politics. That is why the Greens have long called for the government to show courage and will to deal with media concentration and online ownership by implementing new tax measures, funding public interest journalism and increasing media diversity. It's also why the Greens went into bat for the real underdogs being exploited by big tech, Australia's public media funded by Australian taxpayers as well as the AAP. We secured the inclusion of public broadcasters, the ABC and the SBS, in the code, along with public funding to protect AAP in the short term. And these are important reforms, but they are not the only reforms that we need to, say, need to see in the digital space. Tech giants have profited from a deregulated global market in which personal data is sold to the highest bidder. Australians are becoming more and more aware of how their personal and private data is being harvested and monetised by overseas big tech corporations. People are learning from everything from the Cambridge Analytica data scandal to documentary films like The Great Hack and The Social Dilemma. Learning, for example, about how Facebook has allowed itself to be weaponised by violent extremists and conspiracy theorists due to an algorithm that far too quickly leads far too many people to be swamped by conspiracy theories and exposed 
to the violent rhetoric of hate groups. Facebook's news feed can operate as a propaganda mill, which facilitates the dissemination of vile racism and the incitement of violence. Never forget Facebook live streamed the Christchurch massacre, where large numbers of Muslim people going about their peaceful daily prayer were mowed down in cold blood by a white supremacist terrorist, live streamed on Facebook. Yet we allow Facebook's billionaire, founder and CEO to determine what news millions of Australians are exposed to. <laughs> I mean, what a time to be alive. What a world we live in. Facebook also jumped into bed with Cambridge Analytica, a tech firm headed by former Trump adviser Steve Bannon, which had worked with Brexit Leave campaigns. Cambridge Analytica harvested the Facebook profiles of millions of people and used them to build a powerful software program to predict and influence voting decisions and the ballot box. That assisted the campaigns of people like Ted Cruz and of Donald Trump, as well as the Brexit campaign. Now, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg later said, while apologising for this breach of trust caused by Facebook's role in the Cambridge Analytica data scandal, and I'll quote from Mr Zuckerberg, we have a responsibility to protect your data and if we don't, if we can't, then we don't deserve to serve you. Well, at least I can agree with him on that. And then there's Google, with its long history of monopolistic and antitrust behaviour and billions of dollars worth of tax avoidance around the planet, including here in Australia. Google's worked with US federal agencies, the NSA, the CIA and the FBI to spy on private citizens. It's worked with governments to, de to develop products with censored search results. For example, Project Dragonfly, a, virgin, a version of Google's search engine that complied with the Chinese Communist Party's demands to censor sensitive speech and comply with China's data provenance and surveillance laws. This is the same Chinese government responsible for humanitarian atrocities on the Uyghur people, the death of democracy in Hong Kong and long-standing crimes against the people of Tibet. Google is also one of the single biggest invaders of personal privacy on the planet. Google tracks your movements, viewing and purchasing through its search engine, through its browser, through audio, through YouTube, through Gmail and devices like mobile phones running Android operating systems and Google Maps. Google CEO Mr Eric Schmidt once said, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place, which just shows that Google doesn't get it. Wanting privacy is not the same as having something to hide. And anyone who thinks it is shouldn't be trusted with our personal data. This from a company whose slogan used to be, don't be evil. Now, Australia has a Privacy Act, but in the digital world, it is clearly unfit for purpose. There is no greater contrast than between our Privacy Act 1998 and the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. Coming into force in 2018, the GDPR is considered the gold standard for the protection of consumer information. Whereas our Privacy Act provides very limited protection over personal information, the GDPR provides protection over, and I quote, any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person who can be identified directly or indirectly by personal data. The differences between the European regime and that here in Australia are born of basic philosophical differences. 
like the difference, for example, between neoliberalism on one hand and civil libertarianism on the other. Unlike Australia's neoliberal approach, focused primarily on corporate profit and corporate greed, adhered to by both major parties in this place since it was turbocharged 40 years ago by the Australian Labor Party under Mr Hawke and Mr Keating, and has then been built on uh, and expanded even more rapidly by the, the arch neoliberals inside the LNP. Unlike that approach in Australia, focused on corporate profit and corporate greed, the European regime takes a human rights approach, which is actually focused on people. What a refreshing change to see people focused on rather than corporate profit and corporate greed. Unlike Australia's Privacy Act, the GDPR applies to all organisations, regardless of location or size, who process or control any personal data of EU residents, requires consent to be given for an organisation to process or control a resident's personal data, and provides individual rights, such as the right to data portability, the right to object and the very important right to erasure, otherwise known as the right to be forgotten. The GDPR's regard for data protection as a fundamental right reflects data protection being a constitutionally enshrined right in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. But unlike the EU, or actually every other liberal democracy in the world, Australia alone does not have a constitutionally or legislatively enshrined Charter of Rights. We need one desperately. We actually needed one long ago. Because, as Justin Warren from Electronic Frontiers Australia has warned, you can't ever get privacy back. Now, we can't change the past, but we can change the future. We need to start legis legislating privacy protections now in this country. We need to stop the bleed and protect future generations from being exploited and monetised by big tech like our generation has been. That's why I'll be moving a second reading amendment that calls on the government to implement data uh, protections equivalent to the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. Ever since Cambridge Analytica, calls to nationalise social media and big tech have increased in frequency and force, and rightly so. Colleagues, I ask you to come with me on this. Just imagine if we had a publicly owned search engine which did not have to make a profit by selling our data, did not track people's online behaviour and had an algorithm that prioritised accuracy rather than popularity. And just imagine if we had a publicly owned social media platform, one that did not retain data or perhaps one which did offer the option of retaining people's data but provided it only to the user so that person could decide to sell their data if they wished or to donate it to a research institution for the public good. Just imagine how much stronger our democracy would be. Just imagine how much stronger and more cohesive our society would be. The problem we've got is that algorithms on platforms like Google, like Facebook, like YouTube are driving the destruction of our very democracy. They are bastardising elections. They prioritise things that get a reaction over things that are factual and truthful. When we look back on this time, not only in our country's history but our world's history, we will see, we will see abundant evidence that these algorithms developed and kept in secret 
by companies like Google and Facebook and YouTube are responsible for so many of the evils and the challenges of our world today. We need to rein in big tech. We need to properly regulate big tech. We need to break up some of the monopolistic big tech companies. It is not an exaggeration to suggest that the future of our democracy and our society depends on doing that. Thank you, Senator McKim. I call Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I always enjoy following Senator McKim because I know if I've come in here with uh, five minutes' worth of material after listening to Senator McKim, I'll probably have five hours' worth of material to debate. So I'd like to uh, take advantage of the opportunity which Senator McKim afforded me and uh, deal with at least three points which he raised uh, at, at the outset of this contribution I'm making on this bill. The first point I'd like to make is to congratulate everyone who was associated with the pressure that was imposed uh, to ensure that our public broadcasters were brought within the ambit of the code. I actually think that was incredibly important, and I think it's very good that the ABC, SBS are captured within the code. So uh, I'm certainly on the same page as Senator McKim in that regard. I'm also on the same page with Senator McKim in relation to the importance of uh, the Australian Associated Press. And I think it was so important that that institution continued. It provides an invaluable service to our com community and, from my perspective, encapsulates everything important about public interest journalism. So I certainly agree with you on that. Now we move. Now, and Senator McKim knows me well. There's always a bat, but I'll say not but and. Uh, I must say I diverge with respect to his, uh, his uh, drawing of a dichotomy between neoliberalism and uh, civil liberties. I must say I uh, intensely disagree with his characterisation of neoliberalism. From my perspective, uh, and I would quite happy to call myself a neoliberal, uh, also a classical liberal. And my philosophy is based in part on a book written by a fellow called John Stuart Mill called On Liberty, which means, uh, and I'll, I'll use Senator McKim as a bit of a prop in terms of my analogy. It means if 100 people were in a room with Senator McKim and Senator McKim was of one view and the 99 were of a different view, the 99 would have, as, uh, would have no more right to silence Senator McKim than Senator McKim would have to silence the 99. And that goes to the, that goes to the absolute core of my beliefs uh, in terms of classical liberalism. So for me, it actually comes down to the individual. It's not about big corporations. And indeed, if one reads a lot of the work of great neoliberals such as Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek, they'll decry, they'll actually decry the power that the big corporations had as rent seekers to get subsidies, etc., from government. They actually attack that, attack that on the basis that in a free society that should not occur. So I do diverge. I do diverge quite strongly from Senator McKim in terms of his, his uh, view that neoliberalism and civil liberties are, are dichotomous. I actually think uh, they should be. Maybe they're not always practised that way, but they should be on the same page. And lastly, with respect to, I must say, um, it caused me to smile when Senator McKim referred to people donating their data to uh, research institutes uh, in some sort of noble public uh, view. Great idea. I doubt, Senator McKim, that my data would be interesting enough. I'm not sure that it would, uh, I'm not sure that it would uh, take a lot of time for, uh, for whoever's looking at my data to come to uh, any great view with respect to its importance uh, in the context of whatever they're looking at. Maybe Senator Ciccone's would be far more interesting than my data. Um, goodness knows what people would find amongst Senator Stirl's data, but uh, it would be uh, extraordinarily interesting as well. And I must say, I was thinking of Senator Stirl when Senator Brockman was making his contribution, and he was, uh, he was referring to those huge Saturday newspapers we used to receive, with the, and I can remember them as a boy growing up, when, um, when uh, the, the retail classifieds used to be there, and it used to be half a foot thick. And I was thinking Senator Stirl would need his truck 
to actually transport that paper uh, back to his home for his uh, morning cup of coffee. But there you go. I think, uh, Madam Deputy President, we should be proud as a country. We should be proud as a country that we're actually at the forefront. We're actually at the forefront of making sure that companies like Google and Facebook actually pay their fair share for the news media, which is produced by others at others' cost, that Google and Facebook and potentially others pay their fair share and fairly remunerate the news media organisations that produce that data. I genuinely believe we should be proud as a country that we're at the forefront of that. And of course, when you're at the forefront of something, then sometimes it can get pretty willing in terms of the introduction of it and discussions relating to it. And we've seen that recently. Uh, first, I'd like to commend Google with respect to the extraordinarily constructive approach that they've adopted in terms of dealing with news media providers. And I think they should be congratulated. They should be congratulated and strongly so. With respect to Facebook, I note that discussions are perhaps continuing. But I would like to quote in this regard from a good friend of mine, uh, Mr Sam O'Connor MP, who is the state member for the state seat of Bonnie, which is on the Gold Coast. And, uh, Mr O'Connor is just an outstanding, an outstanding young state parliamentarian, and I'm sure Senator Stoker would agree with me when I make that observation. And when I wanted to get some information with respect to what are the, what are the news sites or what are the sites that are being blocked by Facebook? because of its concerns with respect to this legislation. I thought I'd, there's only one place I'd need to go. And Senator McGrath, I'm sure you would agree with me as well. I knew Sam O'Connor MP, state member for Bonnie, would be all over it, all over it. And sure enough, he is. And I want to quote from a Facebook post, a bit of irony there, a bit of irony there. I don't need to spill it out, probably, uh, in, in relation to this issue. And I quote, this is from Sam O'Connor MP, member for Bonnie, 18 February at 10.49, and I quote, Like many of you, I get a lot of my news through Facebook. It's even better when that news is written and fact-checked by actual journalists. Sadly, none of that reliable, trustworthy, accurate news will be on Facebook anymore. As of this morning, Facebook has decided to block all Australian news organisations from posting on here. They're clearly trying to bully the federal government into changing its proposed laws to make social media companies pay for news content. Now this is, and I'll continue the quote after this uh, interpolation. This is where it gets interesting because he actually lists some of the sites in Queensland that were blocked when Facebook adopted this strategy, which I think was totally unproductive. And I continue quoting again. Quote: Facebook has even banned and hidden all the posts of important sources of information, like Queensland Health, Gold Coast Health, TransLink and the Bureau of Meteorology and Domestic Violence Support Service 1800 RESPECT. Even the Batuta Advocate has been caught by the ban. This means many people won't see alerts about breaking news or even live stream press conferences by these outlets. With their absence, it adds fuel to the fire of misinformation that already runs rampant here. Yes, I realise the irony of posting this on Facebook, but that's kind of the point. Facebook is a vital source of information for most of us. We need what we're seeing on social media to be from reliable and trustworthy sources now more than we ever have. Update: The pages I mentioned have thankfully all been unblocked, but this still doesn't resolve the issue with our news outlets being banned from one of their main mediums of communication." End quote. That's from Sam O'Connor MP, member for Bonnie and I, in the Queensland Parliament, and I couldn't put it better myself. I'd also like to make a few comments with respect to the contribution from my good friend Senator Brockman. And as is typical in this place, uh, I agreed with just about I think everything Senator Brockman said. I can't think of any divergence of opinion from what Senator Brockman said. But one thing in particular, one thing in particular he said, which triggered something uh, in my own thoughts, and that is with respect to the importance of our regional newspapers. With respect to the importance of our regional newspapers. And from my perspective, from my perspective, when the review of this legislation is conducted from one year hence, from my perspective, one of the touchstones will be this. Has this legislation worked for smaller regional news providers and regional newspapers and news outlets? Has the legislation worked 
the smaller regional newspapers and regional news outlets. That is of key importance to me. And there are two outstanding publications in the vicinity of where my office is in Queensland, in the, uh, in the city of Springfield, which is part of the fastest growing region in Queensland, the Greater Ipswich region. And they are these. First, the Queensland Times, and secondly, the Guardian and Tribune newspaper. Two outstanding local community newspapers. And one of the touchstones as to whether or not this legislation is successful for me will be whether or not it gets the desired result for those smaller regional newspapers so that they can continue to provide, to the, as, as they're doing at the moment, to the absolute utmost of professional standards, local content for local communities. That is just so important from my perspective. And that's something I'll be looking closely at with respect to the review of the legislation in 12 months' time. There are a few other, uh, there are a few other comments I do want to make with respect to the legislation. And in particular, I would like to commend the Hon. Paul Fletcher MP with respect to the amendments which were proposed regarding the legislation. And from my perspective, uh, we have an absolutely outstanding Minister for Communications in the Hon. Paul Fletcher MP. And I congratulate him for working through these issues with all of the stakeholders and proposing a number of amendments. And I'd like to set those amendments out now. The first was to streamline the requirements for digital platforms to give advance notice of algorithm changes to make them more workable. Technical issue, but very, very important that that technical issue is, is sorted and it's effective, it's efficient and it's going to work in practice. Second, clarify the arbitration criteria so that it considers the reasonable costs of both the digital platform and news media business and amend the, amend the legislation to remove any doubt that arbitrated remuneration is to be in the form of lump sum payments. Again, important clarification. And if I can just say, before proceeding to the other two amendments, in relation to the arbitration, I think this legislation is extremely well crafted. And the reason I say that is it provides an incentive. It provides an incentive to the provider of the platform to negotiate with the news media organisation and come to an agreement. Come to an agreement. And then there's a process, if they can't come to an agreement, where they go to arbitration. But I can tell you, with my experience in terms of matters of commercial negotiation, I would fully expect, I would fully expe expect that both sides of that commercial discussion will want to come to an agreement rather than take the risk of an arbitrated outcome. Rather than take the risk of an arbitrated outcome. So I think the appropriate tension is included in this legislation to get the right result. Now return to number three of the four amendments uh, the Hon. Paul Fletcher MP has proposed to the legislation. And the third amendment is this. Clarify the role of the ACCC ensuring its focus is on providing factual information to assist the arbitrator. And I think that's an extraordinarily important amendment because in terms of this legislation and how it's crafted, the ACCC shouldn't be seen as an actor in the process. It's a regulator. It shouldn't be seen as, the act, as an actor in the process. So I think it's important that the ACCC's role and standing in this respect is protected. And I think, again, the legislation is well crafted with this amendment to make it clear that the ACCC isn't an actor in this process. It's simply providing factual information to assist the arbitrator. And that's important because it's terribly important that the arbitrator gets all of the relevant information needed as the arbitrator. If it gets to that, and as I said earlier, hopefully it doesn't get to that. Hopefully the parties can come to a commercial agreement. But if it does go to arbitration, it's very, very important that the arbitrator gets access to all the information and analysis that the arbitrator needs. And then the fourth, the fourth and final amendment uh, I'd like to speak to is the fact that an amendment be proposed to adjust the effect of anti-avoidance provisions so that they take effect from the commencement of the code and ensure the government's policy intent of not interfering with existing contractual rights under the code is achieved. And I think, again, that's important on a number of levels. There needs to be any avoidance provisions in this regard to keep all the parties honest in relation to this process. But there also needs to be a recognition 
There also needs to be a recognition with respect to commercial arrangements that have been entered into before the adoption of the code. So again, I commend the minister with respect to uh, the changes which he's proposed in that regard. And in terms of final comments, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I think that this legislation achieves the right balance. I think this legislation achieves the right balance, and I think we're seeing that in terms of the contributions from around the chamber. What I'm hearing is there is generally broad support with respect to this legislation. I think the instances of overreach, if I can describe it as that, characterise it as that by Facebook over the last week or so, has also led to greater community interest and public interest in this legislation. So I'm quite happy to commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Scar, and I call Senator Canavan. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, these are some very important and historic uh, laws and uh, uh, regulations, effectively, going through mm -hmm. this Parliament, and uh, uh, I do support this. In fact, uh, it is historic because mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we'll be the first, perhaps, or at least mm -hmm. one of the very first nations in the world to establish a, a new right, effectively, a new right uh, uh, for people who. Uh, do the hard work and, and, and write our news, uh, 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 who, who are in the profession of journalism, uh, a right to ensure that they get fair payment for their hard uh, work. And I know there's, there's some who I've discussed this with uh, from my own team and, and certainly those who support Liberal and National parties who are a little, a little cautious about establishing a, a new right like this because, in a way, I suppose, uh, the government here is creating a market. It's uh, creating a, a new market. Uh, it's establishing some new property rights. Now, normally, on our side of politics, we would uh, think that, that rights and, and property are, are best left to individuals to, to work out, but it's times like this when we always must reflect that there is a level of government involvement in all markets and the establishment of all property rights, that at some point in the past there had to be rules established uh, around who owned certain land, uh, who had the uh, right to, to, to develop uh, uh, areas of real estate, uh, uh, who had the right to, to build buildings and, and do other things that uh, create economic activity. And while we forget, I suppose, how a lot of those rights were established at different times in our history. They become kind of natural. Almost invariably, there was some degree of involvement uh, with government agencies, whether it was through a judiciary and a common law process or, or sometimes uh, through a legislative process in the parliament. So what's happening here, while it is historic, it's not unique. Uh, these are things that have been done in the past uh, involving other types of rights and effectively intellectual property. Uh, and this is just updating those rights for the modern age, because over the last uh, really 10 years or so, it's been very, very recent. Uh, uh, I don't know if, when I got on Facebook, but it was probably sometime in the, only in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, this wasn't really an issue. Uh, uh, there was a certain framework established for journalists to be to be compensated through 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 advertising and. Uh, charging for newspapers and what have you, but this has been a completely different uh, information model that's that's cropped up in the last decade or so. So rights have to evolve, rights have to change. And when you think about what we're establishing here through a news media and digital platforms code, it's very similar in a way to other types of intellectual property, because what journalists create in the end is intellectual property. Uh, we have traditionally consumed that intellectual property in the physical version of a newspaper or a magazine uh, or something we can see and touch, but it's not really the paper that has the value, it's the words that are written on the paper that creates the value that makes you want to buy, uh, pay $3 for a newspaper or 10 bucks for a magazine at the newsagents. Uh, it is that, it's the intellectual effort of writing those words and putting them together in a certain way that creates value. And other types of intellectual property are, are, are protected uh, and, and regulated to ensure they have uh, that the creators of the property get a certain uh, fair level of compensation. Every time you switch on your radio, or increasingly these days, uh, open up Spotify and play a song, you know, the artist that has created that intellectual property will get a payment. They get a payment. Uh, you cannot just set up a radio station and start broadcasting 
whatever music you like uh, for free. Uh, there are rules and regulations and laws around the fact that the creator of the song has an intellectual property right and they deserve a payment, a, a royalty payment, every time their song uh, is broadcast over the airwaves or, or now over the, the interwebs through our phone. So, you know, there's, a, I think, a very similar comparison here to this particular code and bill that uh, 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 we now have a situation where uh, people's intellectual property, the, the articles they write, can be shared through social media, extracts of them, parts of them, uh, can be shared through Facebook or Google, uh, and uh, uh, I think those people deserve uh, to have some compensation. Indeed, I, I was talking to a, to a friend the other day who, who did bemoan the, the, the passing or the implementation of these new news media codes because their way of accessing one particular newspaper in this country has been stopped uh, because previously they could just Google an article and, and a link would let them bring up the full article and read it um, without any uh, any need for them to subscribe or, 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 or uh, provide compensation through um, getting a subscription, getting through the paywall. Uh, uh, now, apparently, just in the last few weeks, that, that particular method of uh, accessing intellectual property created through news has been blocked. And, and look, I realise people would love to continue to get uh, uh, their news and, and media for free, but that model is not sustainable because if journalists are not paid for the work they do, if they're not given a fair pay, and we will have less journalists, we will have less newspapers, and we will all be poorer for it. We can all see that. That is happening before our eyes. Journalists uh, uh, are in a tough industry right now, and many have unfortunately lost their jobs in the last decade or two. And Nothing in this particular code will guarantee or protect all of those jobs. The industry is going through enormous levels of transition, um, which will seemingly continue for some time yet. I've had a We've had newspapers shut, print, or at least printed versions of newspapers shut in, in my area in regional Queensland. The Morning Bulletin, a great paper of over 100 years, is no longer in print. Uh, that's a great shame and tragedy. And I, unfortunately, even this, these changes, these historic changes we're making here, are, I don't think likely to bring that back. But I, I, I don't want to lose more. Uh, I, I don't want to see even the online version of the Morning Bulletin shut. Uh, I don't want to see us see more newsrooms close up their doors. I don't want to see more journalists lose their jobs if we can avoid it. And so something like this will provide a lifeline uh, to what is an essential industry in this country that deserves to get fair compensation uh, for their work. So we are setting up effectively a royalty payment um, for, uh, for news articles, for news content, uh, for, for news media, for TVs as well. All that sort of content is now can, can get a revenue stream from those that do wish to share that content through the internet. Now, there's no doubt that this code uh, will not be perfect on day one. As I say, we are doing something uh, uh, globally unique here. I don't think it's unique in the world of intellectual property, but it's globally unique. It's the first time, I think, that any country is doing this, and it is a very, very complicated area. So I support the codes being put here, but I recognise that some uh, some degree of adjustments will probably need needed to be made over time uh, as we learn and develop how this code is working in practice. Uh, I think it's right uh, that um, the uh, the government has sought to focus the code initially on the very large digital platforms. I believe just Facebook and Google search uh, are those um, identified. Uh, um, I don't think it would be right to try and extend it to, to many in the different um, digital platforms at this stage, particularly in its early years. Uh, Google and Facebook themselves are very large companies uh, with, I think, the means to navigate this process. Google mm -hmm. itself reported revenue in Australia of over a billion dollars in 2018-19, uh, and Facebook uh, reported revenue of $582 million. That's just in Australia. That's just in Australia. And so I think they have the means to, to navigate what no doubt are uh, difficult uh, uh, regulations for them to get their heads around, given, as I say, they are unique. I think it's important to make a point, though, that on that revenue that Google and Facebook uh, generate in Australia, they don't pay much tax. They don't pay a lot of tax. Now, I, I recognise that the figures I've quoted are uh, revenue, not profit, uh, but uh, uh, revenue is kind of a fact and profits uh, the fiction, I suppose, if you like, of the accounting world, because you can lots of different ways of getting to profit from your revenue lines. 
Uh, and so apparently, in Google's accounts, uh, they um, they had they made a billion dollars in revenue uh, in Australia, but only two hundred million dollars of of taxable income. Uh, that might be true, but they probably made a lot more revenue than one point one billion. I reckon uh, some of that would be hidden overseas. They paid just fifty billion dollars of tax on that, and Facebook, uh, in that five hundred and eighty million dollars in revenue I mentioned, declared taxable income of just fifty fifty million dollars and paid just fifteen million dollars in tax. Now, I, I think I think Google and Facebook are probably making higher profits than that from uh, their dominance of, of the advertising market in Australia. I'm not saying or accusing them of doing anything illegal. Uh, they are, I'm sure, legally seeking to minimise their profit, as any most taxpayers would seek to do. But but I do think there's probably some ability for those two very large companies to make contributions to the news content that is shared or hosted on their websites. Now, I think it's it's positive that Google themselves have reached a a voluntary agreement uh, with uh, news media organisations. That's what this code was seeking to encourage, and it's positive that that's occurred. It's unfortunate, I think, that um, that uh, that Facebook chose a different course of action. Um, but it's not terminal. It's not terminal. I think we're right to push ahead uh, with this, despite Facebook's actions last week, which were the biggest own goal uh, for some time in politics, given they couldn't themselves restrict uh, their, 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 their prohibitions to the news media industry. They, as has been well documented, caught up uh, emergency services, health services, uh, coronavirus information, all in their news media net. So for an organisation that says that they can't get rid of child pornography from their website to continue to uh, uh, or to overban on the case of news is a bit galling for all of us, I think, here in Australia. Uh, the, the bully boy tactics of Facebook last week, uh, I think, deserve to be called out. I don't think they were fighting this code. I think Facebook were trying to make an example of us to try and stop other countries doing the same. This was not their actions were not so much about Australia, especially. Apparently, Facebook only made $15 million in. Sorry, paid $50 million in tax. Apparently, they only made $50 million in profit in Australia. So, do you reckon they'd threaten their whole business for $50 million, bucks, one of the biggest companies in the world? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that we were trying, they were trying to make an example of poor little Australia to the rest of the world, but I'm, I'm heartened that we stood up to them last week. Uh, I'm heartened that the government has not decided to back down to these sort of tactics, and I'm also heartened by the support we have received from around the world. I've read over the weekend that Canada is seeking to progress similar laws to what we're uh, discussing here today, uh, and it seems like Facebook's tactics and actions have only redoubled uh, the commitment of the Canadian government to continue down that path. Because if we were to buckle, if we were to buckle to these kind of tactics from Facebook, we would be outsourcing the political decisions of our country uh, to a U.S.-based company. And I love America, great friends of this country, but I do not believe that an American-based company, an American-based company, should not should not decide what the laws are passed here in this country. They should certainly not uh, uh, have the control to regulate our speech and our political discourse uh, in this nation. And I think, while I support this code and its protection of news media. There's a larger agenda here that we need to focus on about how we protect the free speech of everyday Australians. Uh, it is right and proper for us to be protecting the speech, the free speech of, of and the rights and the property rights of news media companies, Australian companies, to make sure we continue to have Australian content. But I think it's also right and proper that we seek to protect the free speech of everyday Australians so they don't have their, their thoughts, their ideas uh, banned. Uh, by a company based uh, in America. That would be uh, particularly unfair. And I also believe that we need to turn, after these laws are passed, I think we've got widespread support for them, so after these laws are passed, we also need to turn our attention to the appropriate restrictions uh, on uh, overseas-based companies in, uh, in involving themselves in our media landscape. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I think, well-established and principled restrictions on foreign ownership of our domestic 
media entities, of our newspapers, of our TV stations. Uh, they have been long-standing uh, arrangements in our laws, but there are no such restrictions on foreign ownership in social media. In social media, in social media terms, uh, a foreigner can have 100 per cent of a particular platform. Indeed, I would suggest basically 100 per cent of our social media footprint in this country is owned by foreigners, almost 100 per cent. I've been contacted last week by a few Australian-based social media companies, and I wish them well. And I think it is about time that we seek to support them, uh, because I would like to see uh, Australian social media companies have a footprint. Australians use Australian uh, uh, IT businesses to discuss issues, to share things with friends, and make sure that we continue to be sovereign and independent of other countries when it comes to the protection of our rights and our speech. Thank you, Senator Canavan. I call Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment News, Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020. Now, this bill has been technically described as a mandatory code on which the registered Australian news business corporations and designated digital platform corporations must comply with mandatory requirements, including provision of information and non-differentiation, and may bargain about the amount to be paid for making available certain news content on designated platform services. Quite the bureaucratic speak. In essence, the mischief it is seeking to address is the imbalance of power as identified by the Australian uh, Competition and um, ACCC, uh, that there is an imbalance of market power between uh, traditional journalism and the distribution through uh, these platforms such as Google and Facebook. In essence, this bill represents a market intervention. Now, I know Senator McKim and his contribution had much to say about uh, Liberals worshipping profit and nothing else, but I think anyone with a cursory glance to the history of the Liberal Party would realise that we hesitate before market intervention. We do not resist from it, but we make sure that the cir circumstances are right for our intervention so that they are not unintended consequences. And in this case, I think the tipping point has been reached, and we have seen that uh, with the behaviours of Facebook, which has been well articulated in this chamber by many speakers. As I said, the purpose of the code is to address the, ba the bargaining power imbalance identified by the ACCC between digital platforms and news media businesses. And the aim of the government by this legislation is to support a diverse and sustainable Australian news media. They must be able to get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Uh, the code creates a framework for commercial arrangements, and that is why I describe it as a market intervention. But in my, in my view, it is a measured response and also with a caveat of a one-year review. And like the previous speaker, Senator Canavan, I draw comfort from the fact that this will be reviewed and it will be an ongoing, I think, legislative reform process as we grapple with the implications of big tech and how they influence our lives and the marketplace. The government uh, has based this legislation, as I've said, on accepting the ACCC's conclusion that there is a need to reform to better protect consumers, improve transparency, recognise power imbalances and ensure that market that substantial market power is not used to lessen competition. I'm reminded of the words of Clive James, who said, the last stage of fitting the product to the market is fitting the market to the product, which seems to have been a mantra of those founding these large tech giants. And I would say to honourable senators that we've been here before. This is not a new situation uh, we face. There have been developments with monopolistic power in the US and even before that. I'd like to thank the Economic Legislation Committee for its work. I found its report enlightening and uh, uh, good reading for the preparation of this speech, which, which, may, which, which, may, which may have an opportunity to, to enlighten you some more uh, shortly, later on this afternoon, if you pay attention, honourable, honourable senators. Because I don't wish to break my chain. My wisdom needs to come out in the one go, not necessarily one minute 
one minute to the act ahead of question time. Uh, I did draw comfort from the public utterances of the minister in relation to this bill and also the fact that we've uh, not uh, uh, this bill hasn't come out of, as the saying goes, out of the head of Zeus, but we have also agreed this morning in our party room further amendments, which will be considered in the committee stage. Well, um, I, I would look forward to you joining the Liberal Party, and then you can come to the party room, and I don't need to articulate to you Order, across, the Senate, across the Senate we chamber. Are, we have hit 2 p.m. You will be in continuation. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Workers at ASC in South Australia have been left to endure two Christmases without any certainty from this minister about the future of their jobs after she broke her promise that a decision on the future location of full-cycle docking work would be ma made by the end of 2019. Why does this minister continue to keep 700 South Australian naval shipbuilders in the dark because of her broken promise? And will she now commit to making a decision this year? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for this question on this most important issue for our nation's security. This government is absolutely committed to keeping Australia and Australians safe. As an island nation, we rely on maritime trade for our security and our prosperity. That means Australia's naval capability is essential to our enduring national interest. The Morrison government is keeping Australia safe with our $183 billion naval shipbuilding plan, which is the largest regeneration of the Navy since World War II. More than 70 vessels will be built right here in Australia using point Australian order. workers. Senator, Senator, and this is order. creating. Senator Reynolds, sorry, Senator, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. This relates to this minister's commitment, this government's commitment, to make a decision by the end of 2019. Workers have been waiting for two Christmases. I am asking about when a decision will be made as to the location of full cycle docking. It's a very specific question. I've allowed you to remind the minister of the specific nature of the question, and I call Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And like so many of these important issues, context is absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical because Order. this government is creating over 15,000 direct jobs in our naval shipbuilding industry. We will make all of these decisions, every single one of them, in relation to the build of more than 70 vessels, the sustainment and maintenance of our current fleet and our future fleet, in the order and at the time they need to be made, which is what this government has done continually. As has been said at estimates and publicly, this is a decision, this, this is a decision uh, that even if we did make a decision to change, it is still five to six years away. In the meantime, what is this government doing? We have fixed, we have fixed that valley of death of jobs Order. you created in South Australia. You commissioned not a single, not a single Order. Australian built vessel in our nation. You commissioned not a single one. You didn't progress a submarine, a future submarine program, and this government has done it. We are creating 15,000 jobs. There is not going to be less jobs in South Australia. There are thousands. There are already thousands more than when you left government. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. This minister has also broken her promise that the strategic partnering agreement for the future submarines would be amended by the end of last year to include a 60 per cent spending commitment for local content. Can the minister tell Australian naval shipbuilding workers and businesses why she has broken yet another promise to them? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I tell you one thing? I will never, ever, ever, in any of our defence procurement contracts, I will never, ever agree to any terms or conditions that goes against Australia's interest in delivering this capability. I am frustrated and I'm very disappointed that Naval Group have yet been able to finalise this contract with Defence. But it will not be done. It will not be done at the expense of Australian jobs and Australian industry. This capability is far too important for our nation to do such. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government has also broken its promise to release an update to the naval shipbuilding plan by the end of 2020, which was to include, and I quote, further detail on the critical role of Australia's shipbuilding industry in delivering this plan. Why has this minister broken yet another promise? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, can I reiterate to everybody here and everybody in Australia, every single cent we spend of the taxpayers' money, every single contract we enter into for our naval shipbuilding plan, over $183 billion worth over the next few decades, every single thing we do is about sovereign capability and about building sovereign defence capability in our nation. You do not have to wait for a piece of paper, Senator Wong, to see this government's commitment. 15,000 jobs, Senator, 70 Senator vessels. Reynolds, Senator Wong, that is our Senator, commitment. Senator Reynolds, please. We have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. The point of order is this minister and this government's own commitment to relieve, release the update to the Naval Shipbuilding Plan. I'm asking why it hasn't been released by the time she said it would be. Senator Birmingham on the point of order. Mr President, Senator Wong um, has repeated part of her question, but she's also used the opportunity to extrapolate. In any event, Senator Reynolds is clearly being directly relevant to issues that relate to the Naval Shipbuilding Plan and is the entire nature of the content that she has had in her answer to date. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer, but I tend to agree with Senator Birmingham um, that the minister's answer thus far, while it could be debated after question time as is appropriate, um, is being directly relevant. She has 26 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I don't know where the opposition have been hiding, but the past 12 months we have been undertaking, the globe has been undertaking a large health-induced, a pandemic-induced economic crisis. This government is working to continue to deliver our naval shipbuilding plan, and we are. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate on the changes to working age payments announced today and how they will benefit 1.95 million Australians who are currently receiving working age payments? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. Um, the pandemic, as we all know, caused a once-in-a-lifetime disruption to our labour market, and we used our comprehensive welfare system uh, to support Australians who found themselves unemployed through the emergency support measures that were put in place last year. Today, we announced that the transition from those temporary measures into a more permanent setting. So we know that the recovery of the Australian economy is now well underway, and so we no longer are relying on those temporary supports, which have sustained us over the last 12 months. So on the 31st of March, the coronavirus supplement and associated measures uh, will uh, come to an end. And in its place, in recognition that the Australian economy has changed as a result of the pandemic that has impacted our country over the last 12 months, uh, we are seeking to increase the working age payments base rate uh, permanently by an amount of $50 per fortnight uh, per, per payment. This is the single largest increase in working age payments or unemployment benefits since 1986. Uh, and that is, it'll be a 9.7 per cent increase year on year from April 2020 to April 21. Uh, but in addition to increasing uh, the, the payment rate, we will also be uh, increasing the income free area to $150. And this means Every Australian on working age payments will be able to keep the first $150 that they earn in a fortnight before their payment is reduced by one cent. What we're seeking to do here is to get the balance right between supporting people as they look for work, but also making sure that we put the right incentives in place for people to take up work. And we also seek to remove the disincentives that are put in place uh, for people to not take a job. This is a $9 billion investment in working age payments, uh, and it is absolutely uh, essential that we continue to support Order. our working Senator age Rustin. payment Senator recipients. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Could the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is incentivising unemployed Australians to seek work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Well, um, the Morrison government's priority is giving people the support they need to get them into work. That is why we've made the decision today uh, to increase 
the, uh, the income-free area uh, to $150 per fortnight. As I said, this means that a recipient can earn $150 without losing a cent of their payment. Um, the income-free area will allow people to work about a day a fortnight at the minimum wage before their payments reduced. During the pandemic, we, uh, we saw temporary settings, including the income-free area that was increased, actually deliver very, very positive results with a significant increase in the number of people who were reporting earnings. And we know, we know that people who report earnings are twice as likely to transition off payment than those that don't report any earnings at all. So we will continue uh, to support, and, uh, and we are confident that we will be able, through this measure, to get people off payment and into work because we know that getting Order. people off Senator welfare Rustin. is important. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what temporary measures will remain in place to continue to support Australians as we recover from the pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, well, in addition to the, uh, the ongoing measures that were announced this morning and the measures that uh, Senator Cash also announced this morning, we are also uh, um, seeking for this parliament over the coming weeks to agree to the temporary extension of the one week, uh, the ordinary waiting period, which is a one week period that people normally have to serve before coming on to payment to make sure that we continue to give access, direct and immediate access to anybody who's coming on to payments because we know that localised outbreaks are still potentially a risk to this country. So we know that also that there are likely to be people who are going to have to uh, isolate because they have contracted coronavirus or are caring for somebody uh, and are required to isolate. So we will also be seeking in this place to extend the provision to enable people under those provisions to continue to be able to uh, get access to payment um, under the, uh, as long as they meet the existing eligibility criteria. But we know 93 per cent of people have got their jobs back, so Order. we look forward. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Is the Minister aware that when asked if she would release the Minister from any privacy concerns and allow her to speak freely, her former staff member, Ms. Higgins, replied, and I quote, of course? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, the answer is, of course, I have. Uh, but as I've said on many occasions in this chamber, Brittany's story is hers and hers alone to tell publicly. Brittany, Brittany has said that tomorrow Order. she is speaking with the AFP, and I believe, I, I believed it last week, and I believe this week, to the bottom of my heart, that. These discussions should be had with the AFP, and of course I stand ready once uh, Ms Higgins has gone to the AFP to discuss these matters with her further. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware that her former staff member Ms Higgins has also said, and I quote, the government has questions to answer for their own conduct? Senator Reynolds. I, look, I thank you very much for that question, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for that question. I think much has been said about this issue publicly and in this place over the last two weeks, and there are many, many issues, and there are many, many issues arising from that commentary. Uh, some of that is rightly the issue is now an issue for the AFP, uh, to, and for Ms. Britain, for Ms. Higgins to pursue that with the AFP. As the, as the Prime Minister has said, there will be uh, an inquiry led um, by the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet into the specifics Order. and the circumstances of this inquiry. And that is absolutely the right place for all of these matters, uh, particularly the procedural matters, to be discussed. I understand that Senator Birmingham, Minister Birmingham, is working with the Labor Party and all parties in this Order. chamber in this parliament Order. on a broader inquiry into the cultural reforms and procedural reforms Order. that Senator clearly that we all agree Order. need to Order. occur. Senator Reynolds' time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Ms Higgins has said in relation to the minister that, and I quote, I don't think she's ever respected my privacy, so her sudden concern for it now, I find it patently false. Given Ms Higgins has made her wishes well known, will the minister stop using Ms Higgins' privacy to hide from her accountability to this place 
and answer questions asked of her. Senator Reynolds. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I respectfully disagree with the senator's assessment of the situation. Senator, Se order, order. I've got Senator Seawitt has the call. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Through order. you. Order. Sorry, I, I need to be able to hear Senator Seawitt. I need. I did not hear anything. There should be no interjections from my right or my left. I did not hear anything from my right. Senator Rennick, Senator Rennick, I was calling the chamber to order. Senator Seawitt, please commence again. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Through you, Minister, can you live on the new payment of job seeker of $44 a day? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Seawitt, for your question. Um, I think I've said on a number of times in, in this place that um, living without a job would be extremely difficult, and that is why this government has been so incredibly focused on um, getting the economy to recover so that jobs can be recreated, so that we have an opportunity to get people who find themselves unemployed, who are on working age payments, uh, back into to work. Uh, and this morning's announcement were very much around making sure that we have a targeted response, a targeted package of measures to ensure that we are giving people the best opportunity, the best Order. incentives and the best support to be able to get them back into work. Uh, so, Senator Seawitt, um, we, were, we were very, um, very uh, concerned about making sure uh, that we uh, got the balance right Senator in McKinn. terms Senator of being McKinn. able uh, to support Senator Australians Betts. who find themselves on working age payments. We need to support people while they're looking to work for work, but we also need to make sure that we are creating the right incentives to encourage them to look for that work and also to remove the disincentives, which is part of the package of, uh, of measures that have been announced by Senator Cash, to try and make sure that we don't disincentivise people from working. But most particularly, we need to make sure that our system, our working age payment system, uh, is fair and it's sustainable. Fair and sustainable for the people who need it and the taxpayers who pay for it. So today what we have done is we have, uh, we have increased the, the base uh, level of payment, um, but equally, as Senator Seawood would well know, our, uh, the Australian uh, working age payment system, our welfare system, is a very comprehensive and targeted system. And so we have an, a range of different supplements and allowances and supports that are in place that recognise the unique situation and conditions that Australians have whether it be that they have children and get family tax benefit, whether they are renters and they are able to get access to the um, Commonwealth rental assistance, um, or whether there are a myriad Rustin, of other— time for the answer has expired. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, through you, Mr President, does the government acknowledge that 1.5 million Australians on the Job Seeker and Youth Allowance payment will be living in poverty from April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, uh, what I can say to um, Senator Seawitt through you, Mr. President, that um, on the 1st of April, as an ongoing measure, um, the Commonwealth Government will be putting in place, over the forward estimates, a $9 billion increase in, uh, in payments to people who find themselves on working age payments. This includes people who are on a job keeper payment, the, uh, the job seeker payment, and also those who are on youth allowance, youth allowance other, uh, students, uh, young people, uh, people, single people um, with, uh, with children. Uh, there are a number. Uh, Every one of the 1.95 million Australians who currently rely on our working age payment system will receive an increase of $50 per fortnight as of 1 April. But as I was saying uh, to you in the previous question, Senator C, as you well know, there are a number of other targeted um, supplements and supports that are available for people that recognise the unique situation Order. that different Senator people Rustin, find themselves time for the in. Senator Rustin, time has expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. How long does, it, does the minister estimate it's going to take the 1.5 million Australians currently condemned by this government to live in poverty to find work, given at the present time the figures that are available there's only 175,000 job vacancies? Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Seward. Well, of course, um, there are there are a number of uh, of measures um, in relation to, uh, to to job availability and job vacancies, as, as Senator Cash would well know, uh, and you only refer to one of them. But what we do know, Mr. President, is that the most important thing that a government can do is to make sure the settings in the economy are right, so businesses can create jobs. Governments don't, in and of themselves, create jobs. What we do is we support our businesses in our economy, our big businesses, our small businesses so that they are encouraged to have uh, to employ people and that is why our hiring credits program has is been put in place because we know young people were more impacted by this pandemic than others that's why we've got the job trainer program in place because we know some of the jobs that were pre-pandemic may not come back post-pandemic but we know there is a great need for other jobs and that's why we are seeking to retrain and to reskill those people that are on payment now so that they can take up the jobs of the future order senator macdonald my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, uh, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on the national rollout of the COVID vaccine, particularly into regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, um, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Macdonald, for the question. This week is a historic week for Australia and all Australians, Mr President. The max vaccine rollout began yesterday in aged care homes and hospital hubs for border quarantine and frontline health workers. I'm also pleased to be able to report that a second shipment of Pfizer vaccine arrived in Australia overnight. This week, health professionals will deliver vaccines to aged care residents across 240 facilities in 190 towns and regional centres across the country. In your home state, Senator Macdonald, Aged care residents in regional centres such as Toowoomba, Kearney Spring, Harristown, Glenvale, Bundaberg, Millbank and Kepnock will receive their vaccines. Under the Australian Government's plan for aged care residents, we're on track to be vaccinated by April. Mr. President. <coughs> we encourage all Australians, when, you, when your turn comes, to take the opportunity <laughs> to live in line with to line up with, to receive the vaccine, Mr. President, that will protect you, will protect your families, and the whole country from major cities to rural communities. As the Prime Minister has said, Mr. President, we are going to make our Australian way back through this pandemic, and the Australian way has proved to be, when you look around the world, one of the most effective there is. People are relying on us to protect their livelihoods, to protect their lives, to maintain the health of the country to make sure we roll out this vaccination program, Mr President, and we will do that. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister please outline the expert process our medical professionals are undertaking in this vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you, Senator Macdonald. Order. We want to give confidence to the Australian people and we're doing that by showing that these vaccines have been through a full and thorough assessment by our medical regulator, the TGA, and that they are safe. As the Prime Minister demonstrated by being vaccinated on Sunday, Mr. President, he's not asking anyone to do anything that he's not prepared to do himself. Mr. President, today we saw the Leader of the Opposition vaccinated. He too is demonstrating his confidence in the vaccine. As more Australians receive it, as we've seen around the world, and it is shown to be safe and effective, that will also raise the confidence across the community and encourage more Australians to get vaccinated. Our key message, Mr. President, is that it's safe, is that it's effective, it will help protect you, but it will also help protect your loved ones. Senator Colbeck, Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister also update the Senate on the Morrison McCormack government's plan? to record who has and hasn't had the vaccine. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I can confirm that the Australian Immunisation Register will be the record for all vaccinations for Australians, and that record will form the basis of the vaccination certificate that all Australians will be able to use, Mr President, including visa holders. Your immunisation history statement, sourced from the Australian Immunisation Re Register, is available right now. You can access it from the Medicare Express Plus 
from MyGov or call or visit Services Australia and get a paper record. Mr. President, doctors, nurses, pharmacists and other health professionals will record vaccines given to you or your child on the Australian Immunisation Register. Once you have had the required doses of a COVID-19 vaccine, a COVID-19 immunisation status will show your immunisation history statement and that can be used as your proof of vaccination. Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy concerns, will the minister now answer the question she was asked yesterday? At any time, did the minister disclose to any other minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If yes, which ministers and when? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And again, as I said yesterday, there are a number of these matters uh, that, after Ms Higgins has gone to the AFP tomorrow, I will, I will discuss with the AFP and I will also discuss with the various other inquiries. As I've already said, I did not at any time disclose Mr. President, I'm happy to answer Order. the question. Order. Order. I, Order on my as left. I've, I, as I have affirmed in this, this place, I did not advise the Prime Minister because it was not my place to do so. I also did not advise Senator, Mac, Senator Cash at any time because, again, it was not my agency to do so. I had, one I had a discussion with the Special Minister of State at the time. Uh, to the best of my recollection, it was not about this matter. It was about my second staff member. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy concerns, will the minister now tell the Senate on what date did the minister first become aware that her chief of staff had sought advice from the Department of Finance about, handling, about the handling of an alleged sexual assault? On, why, on what date did the minister first see the advice and what action did she take? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Ayres for that and, uh, Mr President, through you. Uh, my understanding is that my chief of staff was provided a report of the access to my office uh, either by the Department of Finance or by DPS, and my recollection was it was on Wednesday the 27th. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Well, I don't think that was the question that I asked. Given Ms Higgins has released the minister from any privacy concerns, will the minister now tell the Senate why, when Ms Higgins was asked if she wanted to go to the police at the meeting with the minister and her chief of staff on 1 April 2019, why was she told, and I quote, we need to know now? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, look, thank you very much, uh, Senator Ayres, for that. And as I have said repeatedly in this chamber, uh, Ms Higgins' recollections and her story are hers to tell. It is not my place in this chamber, in this chamber, to, uh, order. to speculate Senator, further Senator on Ayers, that. Senator Reynolds, I, I have Senator Ayres on a, on a point of order. Order is uh, relevance, Mr. President. It's it's not remotely relevant for the minister to explain why she'd prefer not to answer a question. Um, if the minister is addressing the question and providing reasoning for her answer, and I believe that relates to the terms of the question, I don't believe I can rule that out as not being directly relevant. Um, you've, allowed, you, you've reminded the minister of the question, but there, I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. I call the minister to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And as I have said a number of times in this chamber over the last two weeks, uh, those opposite are asking me questions premised on the assertions of facts. This is, not, this is not the place, nor is it the time, for me to discuss or debate the accuracy of some of the assertions of those opposite. The time for me to do that is with the Australian Federal Police and also the other inquiries underway. I still believe I owe Brittany her agency and her privacy. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
In light of today's announcement of the Morrison government's plan to permanently, permanently increase the job seeker rate, how will the government ensure that unemployed Australians remain engaged with the labour market and looking for jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Carr for the question. And as Senator Carr knows, Australia's economic recovery from COVID-19, Mr. President, is well. Order. Sorry. Whilst I admire Senator Carr immensely, uh, it is Senator uh, Senator Scar. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure who, uh, who would be more insulted, Senator Carr. Senator or... Cash, to continue. Mr. Scar, it is my great Western Australian accent that I'm so often Please reminded continue, about in this place. Uh, but, Mr. President, uh, at least one can laugh at oneself. Australia's economic recovery is well underway, Mr. President. And in fact, the recent ABS jobs data shows that employment increased by over 29,000 jobs last month, and this, Mr. President, included a 59,000 increase in full-time jobs. And this, of course, is a direct result of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan, which has provided unprecedented levels of support to Australian households and businesses. As our economic recovery continues, though, it is important that we provide Australians who have lost their job or, alternatively, have had their hours reduced with the support they need to get into fulfilling employment. And that is why today we have made a number of announcements in relation to the strengthening of mutual obligation requirements. Uh, the, government, the Morrison government firmly believes that the best form of welfare is a job, and that is why we will put in place the necessary measures to ensure those uh, that do not have a job at the moment are doing everything that they can to become work ready, or alternatively, if they are offered suitable employment, they are able to take that suitable employment up. We have made a number of changes, Mr President, and that includes the number of job searches that a person needs to undertake. Uh, we are also establishing an employer reporting line so that people who actively say no to suitable work are able to be followed up by job providers or alternatively the department. We are also allowing people to participate uh, in short training courses, for example, something on the job trainer course. It is all about ensuring that we have the right mechanisms in place so that those people who are on welfare are becoming as job ready as we can get them to move Order. into work. Senator Cash, Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Could the minister update the Senate? on why the recovery in the Australian labour market makes it an appropriate time to strengthen mutual obligation requirements for job seekers. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, Mr President, while the unprecedented events of last year they obviously required additional flexibility when it came to mutual obligation. And the government worked with job seekers, and as you know, we lifted those mutual obligation requirements as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But now what we're seeing is the jobs are returning to the economy. Over 800,000 jobs have actually returned. That's about 93 per cent of the jobs lost during COVID-19 have returned to the economy. Hours worked have now recovered by 74.5 million hours since the peak of the pandemic in May. And of course, we've seen job ads reach higher levels uh, than before the pandemic, with SEEK, ANZ and the National Skills Commission continuing to show increases in recruitment activity. And so, Mr President, when you are of the belief that the best form of welfare is a job, everything you do needs to be focused on ensuring people become as job Order. ready Senator as Cash. possible. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Following the changes announced today, why should Australians who are returning to the labour market have confidence, confidence about their ability to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I said in answer to Senator Scar's first question, Australia's economic recovery is well underway. And, uh, we only need to look at the recent labour force figures for January 2021, with the recent ABL's job data showing that employment increased by over 29,000 that month, including a 59,000 increase in full-time jobs. And of course, that is, as I said, a direct result of the Morrison government's economic recovery plan, which has, as we know, provided unprecedented levels of support uh, to Australian households, but of course, Australian businesses. As I said, we've seen over 800,000 jobs. That's around 93 per cent 
of the jobs lost during COVID-19 return to the economy. We're also seeing uh, consumer confidence and business confidence and jobs ads grow to levels higher than before COVID-19. Uh, the best form of welfare is a job, and we will do everything as a government to get people into jobs, Order. because that's Senator where Cash. they belong. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. I've actually got a favour to ask you, Minister. I've got a friend who's looking for a job. He's a lovely bloke. Everyone agrees with that. You'd like him. Could you tell me whether there's any $400,000 a year taxpayer-funded jobs you're looking to fill with an ex-member of parliament? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Um Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, the, uh, the government indeed fills some jobs, and there have been some distinguished former members of parliament who have filled some jobs over a period of time, from all sides of politics at different times as well. I, uh, I note, of course, far more important than the jobs that the Australian government fills are the jobs that are filled by the private sector across Australia, creating sustainable opportunities for Australians, a growing economy. And what we're pleased to have achieved as a government prior to the pandemic was a record level of employment across Australia. During our first six years in office, we saw employment grow by 1.5 million additional jobs. 1.5 million additional jobs, thanks to strong growth across the private sector, thanks to strong growth in Australian businesses who took on more Australians and created more opportunities. And in doing so, what those Australians, what those Australians enjoyed was, of course, the opportunity of work, the opportunity to provide for their family, the opportunity to plan for the future, Order. and the Senator benefit Birmingham that provided, I have, Mr. I have President. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator Lambie, a uh, point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I was just um I'd like to be informed in here, that's wonderful, but I just wanted to know whether there are any $400,000 a year taxpayer-funded jobs that he's looking to fill that may involve being an ex-member of parliament, yes or no? I've allowed you to restate your question, Senator Lambie. Um, I I'm going to take the minister as being relevant due to the nature of the question, um, unless you object further and are demanding a very specific answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. So, so, Mr. President, having addressed those issues at the start of the, uh, the answer, the point Order. is that through having achieved all of that extra jobs growth across the Australian economy, it created the situation, Mr. President, where the welfare dependency among working-age Australians was at its lowest level ever. At its lowest level ever. Order. That we had record numbers of taxpayers across Australia. That we had achieved, indeed, a participation rate at its highest level, and crucially women's workforce participation at its highest level as well. They are the jobs our government is overwhelmingly focused on delivering for order. Australians. I have Senator, Lambie on, I have Senator the... Lambie on a point of order. Senator Lambie on a point of order. Uh, thank you. I just, I just, uh, are they, what you're talking about now, is that taxpayer-funded jobs or you're just going on the loose, or, Minister? Uh, <laughs> Senator Birmingham to continue. I'm pleased to say the vast majority of the jobs our government has seen created under our watch are in the private sector. Yeah, yeah. Businesses growing across Australia, creating more opportunities for more Australians to get ahead, and that's our focus for the Order, economic recovery Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In the interest of full disclosure, because I'm all about full disclosure up here, there's a few things I should let you know. When he was a member of parliament, he lobbied the immigration minister to get the brother of a political donor an Australian visa to avoid jail time for criminal conspiracy, violent crime, drug importation ex and extortion. Should I get him to send in his resume, Minister? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, many people send their resumes, but it doesn't change the fact that our government is focused resolutely on job creation opportunities for all Australians. That was our focus prior to the pandemic. Through the pandemic, our focus has been on saving and securing the jobs, the businesses, the opportunities of Australians to keep them safe in a health context and secure in an economic context. And now, as we emerge Order. through the different stages of Order. recovery from the pandemic, we are focused on that job creation Order. agenda again. Job creation overwhelmingly occurring in the Australian private sector. Job creation that is seeing 
some 93 per cent of those Australians who lost their jobs or reduced to zero hours around this time last year have now got their work back. Australians who have actually back in employment thanks to the good management that has been provided right across the country of an enormous global challenge from which Australia can hold our head high. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Just one more thing, and I'm sure it's only small. My mate took a job as a lobbyist while he was also a member of parliament. He didn't disclose it, but apparently that's OK in here because we have no standards. Also as a lobbyist and a member of parliament, he was lobbying his colleagues to oppose his own government legislation because his client was paying him to do it. Do you think that will be a problem still to put his resume in, Minister? Senator Birmingham. Oh. Mr. President, I, mean, I, I refrain from the point of order that, uh, that hypothetical questions are out of order. Well, because it's the truth. And Mr. President, the focus remains very clear for our government. The focus remains very clear for our government, as I've said, on continuing to build the economic recovery for Australia. And people can want to be distracted by other issues. Our government will not be distracted. We will continue to focus on delivering the vaccine rollout that Senator Colbeck has spoken of each and every day over the last couple of weeks, the crucial steps in economic recovery that will be underpinned by that vaccine rollout, the most complicated logistical exercise undertaken in Australia's probably peacetime history, according to many of the experts, but we're getting on and doing that in cooperation with the states and territories, in cooperation with health authorities. We're getting on with continuing to support Australian businesses, and all of this is about continuing to focus on the things Order, that really Senator, matter, I have which Senator, is keeping I have Australians Senator safe and reset. secure. I have, the clock should have about ten, uh, eight or ten seconds left. Senator Lambie, on a point of order. Uh, yeah, um, with all due respect, Mr. President, President the relevance. Can just answer the question. Just, just let's get some standards in here for once. Senator, Senator Lambie, um, I'm, I'm going to not rule the minister not being directly relevant due, due to the nature of the question, and call on him to continue if he wishes. For I, I'll go to Senator Polly then. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. When asked yesterday about her meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, she said. And I quote, everything that was done was with the knowledge and with her concurrence. Ms Higgins has said, and I quote, I had no idea she was meeting with the AFP about my sexual assault. Will the minister now correct the record? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, look, thank you, Mr President. I stand by what I said in the chamber yesterday. And just to be very clear, um, <clears throat> I met on the 1st of April with uh, the AFP, Brittany and my then Chief of Staff. As I've said uh, in this chamber previously during the course of that meeting, it became apparent to me that the matter was more serious than a security breach to which I had been previously advised. Uh, that same day, I organised for Brittany to meet with the AFP, something which I have been advised did occur, uh, by way of follow-up and clarification. I met briefly with the Australian Federal Police on the 4th of April at their request. Uh, I commenced the meeting alone and I was then joined for a brief period by my Chief of Staff. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. After misleading the Senate yesterday, the Minister had to correct the record and confirm her Chief of Staff had attended her meeting with the AFP Assistant Commissioner. Why did the minister mislead the Senate by saying she had met with the Assistant Commissioner alone? Senator Reynolds. Uh, just to be totally clear, and I'll just say again to show that there's no, uh, no misunderstanding, uh, I did meet with the Australian Federal Police twice. The first one was on the 1st of April with Brittany and my then Chief of Staff. Uh, and as I've said, uh, then it's my understanding that Brittany then met with the AFP uh, out of the office and uh, not in my presence. And by the way of follow-up, uh, at their request, I met briefly with the Australian Federal Police, with the uh, Assistant Commissioner, on the 4th of April. I commenced the meeting alone, and then my Chief of Staff joined me at the very end of the meeting. 
Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. The minister failed to disclose her meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the AFP until the Prime Minister revealed that fact in House Question Time, misled the Senate by saying she met with the Assistant Commissioner alone, and misled the Senate by saying Ms Higgins was aware of the meeting. When will the minister be honest and her conduct in response to the alleged rape of a staff member in her office? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, Mr. President, I've, I've answered that same question twice, and as I've said, for complete clarity, there were two meetings. And my apologies if that was not clear yesterday. But uh, again, I've, I've been very clear. And if you, and if for the order for this order. chamber's benefit, if you would like me to clarify order. that a third time, I would happily do so. But I met on the 1st of April with Brittany and my then chief of staff. Um, I therefore, and at part of that meeting, I organised for Brittany, at her request and her agency, to meet separately with the Australian Federal Police. And then on the 4th of April, by way of follow-up, at the request of the AFP, I met with the Assistant Commissioner alone, and then my Chief of Staff joined that meeting, to the best of my recollection, at the end of that meeting. Senator Mackenzie. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. The Liberal and Nationals government has committed $1.5 billion to the modern manufacturing strategy to assist Australian manufacturers across six national priority areas to scale up, improve competitiveness and build more resilient supply chains. Food and beverage uh, is included as a national manufacturing pro priority, supporting our world-leading agricultural industries, and that's fantastic news. But can the minister advise what the strategy provides for our high-quality, sustainable fibre industries, including forestry, wool and cotton? The minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I thank Senator Mackenzie for the question. Uh, the first pillar of our strategy is getting the economic conditions right for businesses in all manufacturing sectors to succeed. And that's what we want to see happening, and that includes every area of our agricultural sector, because we understand how vital our farmers, fishers and foresters are to our regions and to our nation. Uh, now, when our manufacturing sector grows and we value add here at home, it provides more opportunity for our agricultural sector. Getting the economic conditions right is the first pillar of our modern manufacturing strategy, and that's what's happening across the board. For example, the extension of the instant asset write-off is seeing manufacturers invest in new equipment, upgrade production lines and bring work, bring work home to Australia. Now, the budget also includes a record investment in skills, plans to make energy more affordable and reliable, support to open up trade markets and a fairer, simpler industrial relations framework. Now, these are the building blocks that will assist every sector of manufacturing. And I know the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology met with Wool Producers Australia uh, just, a week, just last week to discuss the contribution wool growers make to our economy uh, and how our broader manufacturing plan will support them, for example, through improved animal health and stock feed production. Now, the government's strategy is a commitment to play to our strengths. If we're going to tur turbocharge job creation and affect meaningful change in manufacturing, then we need to focus on, our investment, on investment in areas where we know we can get the best return. That's why we're focusing on our six national manufacturing priorities—resources, technology and critical mineral processing, food and beverage, medical products, recycling and clean energy, defence and space. Our strategy reflects the fact that we're serious about helping our manufacturers achieve the competitiveness, scale and resilience that will make our nation stronger, not just for the recovery Order, from Senator COVID, Seselja. but Time for generations has to come. Expired. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the opportunities provided by the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund for our food, fibre and beverage industries to plan for their futures and improve their competitiveness and productivity? Senator Seselja. 
Uh, well, yes, I can. I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. The second round of our Manufacturing Modernisation Fund is targeted at small and medium-sized businesses in our priority areas, including food and beverage. Now, these projects will have a particular focus on new technologies, which will make the businesses more competitive and productive, which in turn will create new jobs. Now, there's been huge interest from businesses in our priority sectors, with over 500 applications received from businesses right across Australia. And the Senator and the Senate will be pleased to know there is a very healthy number from regional areas. Now, these are now being assessed, and the successful businesses will receive support of between $100,000 and $1 million. Uh, this is matched funding, uh, where we provide $1 for every $3 that the business does. Now, this government is backing Aussie manufacturers that are prepared to back themselves, which is all part of our plan to create jobs, to grow the economy right across the nation. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline how the strategy will assist all manufacturing industries under each national priority to strengthen our sovereignty and supply chain resilience, particularly for food and fibre harvesting and processing? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, COVID has demonstrated that we must increase the nation's resilience to supply chain disruption, to protect our economy and security into the future. Now, the Liberal National Government uh, is working with industry to identify the goods and services most critical to Australians. Uh, that's why part of the modern manufacturing strategy, uh, as part of it, we are investing over $107 million in the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative to help Australia be better prepared for any future shocks. Uh, we're looking right across the supply chains, from medical products our doctors and nurses need to the chemicals required for packaging and for our farmers to grow their crops, or indeed the equipment to harvest and process our food. From there, we'll look at a range of solutions, whether that's establishing or scaling up domestic manufacturing, ensuring the capacity to pivot to meet, to meet surge demand, or working with other like-minded countries to make sure that Australia is more safe and more secure. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, uh, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I asked you yesterday, yesterday about whether Brittany Higgins's alleged rapist had ongoing access to this building to meet with ministers uh, and ministerial and departmental staff. I'm still waiting on that reply. If he was issued with a lobbyist pass, a member of parliament would have had to have attested that he was of good character to grant him unaccompanied access to the building. Without a pass, he would have needed to have been signed in to the building by a pass holder. Did any member of parliament or ministerial staff member authorise the alleged rapist's access to the building after he left his role in Minister Reynolds's office? And if so, who? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank the Senator for the question. You did, uh, you did ask uh, those questions yesterday. I have been seeking information in relation to. Uh, those questions and some related ones that were asked yesterday. Uh, I apologise that I haven't provided to the chamber um, the particulars of those that you have asked yet, which I received just prior to question time, uh, but, uh, but some of the other matters I'm still securing answers on. In terms of the particulars of the questions that you have asked, uh, I have consulted with the President uh, and the Prime Minister with the Speaker, uh, because access to the building is, uh, as you would appreciate, Senator Waters, managed by the presiding officers, not by, uh, not by the government. Uh, in relation to the question of a sponsored pass or lobbyist pass, uh, I'm advised by the President uh, that the individual did not have access to such a pass, uh, and therefore, obviously, uh, nobody had um, sponsored or uh, or acknowledged the facts that, uh, that you have identified. Uh, in relation to overall access to the building in terms of being signed in, um, the President has advised me uh, that, as you would appreciate uh, from signing people in yourself, they are manual handwritten logs of people who are signed in. Um, obviously, for pass issues, there is an electronic record, uh, but the singular visitation is a manual log uh, that is kept across the building. Um, uh, that would obviously be a very resource and intensive effort for DPS security to go back over those manual logs and try to ascertain uh, the names of any individuals who had uh, entered the building. Um, uh, of course, there are also public areas uh, of the building, Senator Waters, uh, for which um, people are free to come and go and for which no record is kept. So I'm unable to say categorically that he never uh, re-entered the building. 
uh, but I can say categorically that he was not uh, issued with a sponsored pass uh, or gained sponsored access uh, in any knowledge uh, to the building subsequent to his termination. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Th uh, thanks, President. Uh, Minister, what exactly has Mr Gaitchens been tasked with investigating? Is it the information available to and the actions taken by the Prime Minister and his office only? Or is it the broader mishandling of Brittany Higgins's rape allegations? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, the broader issues uh, that, uh, that are being addressed uh, will be addressed by the independent multi party uh, review process that, uh, that I have described in this place uh, and for which I am undertaking consultations with uh, all parties. Uh, and, uh, and with staff from different parties uh, and other experts in the field to ensure that we establish a terms of reference and a review process in which everyone can have confidence. Uh, the work that Mr Gaitchens is doing uh, is in specific relation uh, to the handling uh, of the particular incident. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, uh, President. I asked yesterday whether Mr Gaitchens' report would be made public and didn't get a response. Can you confirm whether it will be made public and whether there's any truth to the suggestion that it will be released this week and is thus the ultimate tick and flick exercise? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I understand the Prime Minister has advised that, uh, that he has not made decisions in relation to the public release of information there, uh, which obviously uh, may have implications for the police investigation that may ensue uh, following the meetings that we understand to be occurring tomorrow afternoon. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, and it relates to some answers given in question time today. Uh, in an earlier answer today, the Minister indicated to the Senate for the first time that, in fact, she met with the AFP twice, first on the 1st of April and the second meeting on the 4th of April. In relation to the meeting of the 1st of April, the minister asserted twice uh, in question time today that that was a meeting in which she commenced alone with the AFP, but then the meeting included both her chief of staff and Ms Higgins. Does the minister stand by that answer? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr President. And what I will do is I will take that question on notice, and I'll come. Uh, Mr President, I will, I will check. I will check what I said yesterday and what I said today against my recollections, and I will come back at the first opportunity, Mr. President, uh, to, Order. to clarify. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Um, I'm advised that Ms. Higgins says she never attended a meeting with the AP with the minister. Can I ask, therefore, why the minister made that assertion on at least two occasions to the Senate today? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr President. As I've said, I will go back and uh, check what I said yesterday, check what I've said today, and I will come back to the chamber in the first opportunity. Um, Mr President, I am, I am uh, rec recalling and making sure that, uh, that I'm recalling uh, to the best of my recollections about the circumstances two years ago. So I will go back and I'll check what I've said, and I'll get back to the chamber. Senator Wong, final supplementary. Minister, I again give you the opportunity. You gave this answer some 10 minutes ago. Do you stand by the answer you gave in question time today that you attended not one but two meetings with the AFP, the first of which included Ms Higgins? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Mr President, look, as I've said, I will go back and I will check uh, my records of my recollections and I'll get back to the, given the, given the importance Order. and the seriousness of the question, I will get back and come back to the chamber at the first possible opportunity to answer that question. Order. Senator Bragg. I thank you, Mr President. My question is Order. for the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the Morrison government is doing to increase Australian research capacity by leveraging supercomputing power? Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Bragg a lot for this question. In fact, I'm extraordinarily grateful for this question because only just this morning, just this morning, 
I had the pleasure of visiting the National Compute, um, Computational Infrastructure Facility at the ANU, and I met somebody called Gaddy, or something called Gaddy. Gaddy is, in fact, the most powerful supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere, and in fact, the 27th most powerful supercomputer in the world. The Morrison government is very proud to have supported this remarkable technology, with $70 million allocated in 2019, Senator Carr, to get this supercomputer up and running, supporting jobs in the Australian research and technology industry. And it's right here. It's right here in Canberra on the ANU, cam on the ANU campus. I met with Associate Director Alan Higgins, Professor Sean Smith and Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt, who told me that it's already been put to work by a large community of researchers from the likes of CSIRO, from the Bureau of Meteorology, from Geoscience Australia and, of course, from ANU itself. Now, Mr President, you may not know this, but GADI actually means to search for in the language of the Ngunnawal people, and that's exactly what GADI does. It allows researchers this to process extraordinary amounts of data in search of answers to some of our most challenging questions. For example, it's been leveraged to, to uh, build complex genomic data set for studies into cancer, into diabetes, into lupus and into heart disease. And in fact, ANU astronomers are using their time with Gaddy to better understand how stars form. A team of chemists have been incorporating the supercomputer into its search for a COVID-19 treatment. Both CSIRO and GI Science Australia will also use the supercomputer to improve their own systems aimed at predicting extreme weather patterns, including fires, earthquakes, tsunamis and cyclones. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Can the minister outline what the government is doing to support world-leading research in complex data-intensive projects right here on Australian soil? Senator Hume. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. It's hard to overstate just the extraordinary utility of a facility like Gaddy. It has 155,000 processor cores. It can transfer data at 200 gigabits per second within the supercomputer super itself. Now, trust me, I know there's a few people in this room that aren't tech heads, but that is incredibly fast. How fast, I hear you ask? A 4K film can be downloaded in well under a second. I heard you ask how fast. In 2019-20, Gaddy supported over 1,125 1, research projects, with over 6,000 units across Australia allocating 756 million hours of computing time. Mr President, that is an extraordinary amount of number crunching to support world-leading and potentially life-changing research right here in Australia. Yeah. 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 Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Yeah, thank you very much. Can the minister explain what the Gaddy supercomputer is researching that will benefit Australians now and into the future? Order, Senator Ayres. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as Lucy Guest at the NCI told me today, pick a field of science and that's where you'll find a benefit. For example, the NCI's partnership with the Bureau of Meteorology enables increasingly accurate weather predictions, knowing where and how rain will fall, Order. where frost will set Order in, enables left. our agricultural sector. Order on my left. I can't quite enables hear the Enables our agricultural sector to, and our farmers to make far better choices, to optimise yield, to minimise cost and minimise waste. I understand that Senator Watt believes that supercomputing is something that involves wearing your underpants on the outside and watching funny cat videos, but that's not what we're doing here. In fact, Gaddy is helping build more accurate models of fire movement, helping to predict bushfire behaviour and save lives and save livelihoods. With researchers leveraging Gaddy to help the model of the next generation personalise genomic medicine, Australians are indeed people around the world can look forward to improved treatments for rare diseases Order. like cancers Senator and Hume, more. Time the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Hume for giving Senator Watt the sort of fashion sense of former Senator Conroy uh, in her answer there and ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Uh, just a moment, Senator Patrick. I don't think there's any sound. Let's just start again. I'll call you again, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, 
Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 164, I'm uh, seeking an explanation as, uh, from uh, the Minister for Defence as to why she has not responded to the Senate's order of the 11th of November 2020 to provide documents to the Senate Economics Committee. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister? Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Patrick for raising this issue with me earlier. Uh, in relation to this, I can confirm that we actually have complied uh, with that oh, order. Okay. However, oh. I did receive uh, further correspondence from Senator Gallagher in response to my letter in relation to access to these documents. Yes, yes. I received that uh, correspondence from Senator Gallagher on the 19th of November, and I am in the process of responding to that. Sorry, 19th of February. And thank you. you. Senator Patrick. I, I rise to take note of the minister's explanation. The status of these documents at the moment, just so, the, so that the chamber is very clear, the, the chamber has asked for documents to be uh, returned to the Senate Economics Committee, and that's very important because uh, rather than coming back to the Senate table, uh, where they are public, uh, responsibly the committee has asked for these documents to be sent to the committee itself, thereby. Uh, uh, they can be managed in terms of their confidentiality. Unfortunately, all that has been provided to the committee is a series of redacted documents that do not let the committee go to its fundamental uh, task um, required of it by the Senate, by, by the Senate to examine Australia's naval, uh, sovereign naval shipbuilding capability. So, uh, we end up uh, with a problem, and, and I'll just lay out what the problem is. And this is a really important uh, issue, not just for uh, the, the inquiry into naval shipbuilding, but for the Senate more generally. The proposition that has been put forward by Defence in advancing a public interest immunity is that they have signed a contract with Naval Group and, uh, and, and other uh, providers, so that would be uh, BAE, uh, Lurson and so forth, and that those contracts have confidentiality conditions. And because uh, we have uh, confidentiality conditions in these contracts, uh, th they are of the view that they cannot provide them to the Senate on the basis that, uh, if they do so, it may uh, uh, undermine the future provision of information. Unfortunately, uh, what the department hasn't uh, told you is that they correctly, when they signed these contracts, included clauses uh, are related to confidentiality that include, included words like this, that, you, that they cannot disclose uh, information except as otherwise required by law. Now, just because defence enters into a contract and it's, uh, that involves confidentiality, and I know that uh, that's important. You need to have confidentiality in these projects so that defence takes care of information, doesn't it hand it over to uh, entities that have no business in seeing it. They take care of it properly. They put it in, in, in safes. They also uh, you know, reciprocate. They require Naval Group to make sure they look after our information as well. And that is proper. But you cannot have a clause in a contract oust the jurisdiction of the Senate in its oversight role, just as it would be preposterous if uh, defence were to claim that a court couldn't get access to, to documents, that a court couldn't subpoena documents because there was something written in a statute. The Senate's powers to obtain documents to carry out its oversight role come from section 49 of our constitution, backed up in the Parliamentary Privileges Act. There can be no question that the Senate has power at law to obtain documents. And it is not possible for the Department of Defence to sign a contract with, a, with an, uh, a commercial party to oust that jurisdiction. Simply cannot happen. And unfortunately, that's the proposition that has been presented to the Senate. Now, this time around, it's, it's uh, about a shipbuilding contract. But the next time around, it could be something that other senators are inquiring into and have a department turn around and say, well, we can't give it to the Senate. There's a confidentiality clause in the, in the contract. People can clearly appreciate that that would affect us in the execution 
of our role, our responsibility, one of which is, of course, to review, examine, pass, modify legislation. The other very important role is to scrutinise the executive. And again, it's written into the contracts. Uh, if I look at the Department of Finance's advice in relation to confidentiality of contracts, they make it very aware that officials need to be mindful of things like uh, FOI. Because, uh, you know, uh, and I know I'm in the AAT in relation to this matter now. Uh, again, if a contract says something is confidential, uh, that is uh, quite legitimate. But to the extent that a statute, something that the parliament commands, grants a citizen a, a right to access, then the contract is void to the, to the extent that it interferes with that statute right. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you just come in and ask for documents under FOI and, you'll be given, and they'll be given to you. Of course, um, that's not the case because the FOI Act provides pr uh, certain protections in relation to confidentiality, but it doesn't rely on the contract. Right now, we can't do our job in the uh, Senate Economics Committee looking into shipbuilding. We can't do our job. And it's a really important job. If I just look at one of the programs that we are examining, one of them is the submarine project. And we know that uh, the history of this is back in 2009, uh, it was identified in something called the Defence Capability Plan uh, and the Defence White Paper that we needed to build 12 new submarines. That was a very rough estimate of, bus of budget. Then between 2009 and 2015, a period that, expand, that, uh, that uh, expanded across two governments, the, Gillard, the Rudd Gillard Rudd uh, government, but also uh, the, um, the, the, the Abbott and Rudd government, sorry, Abbott and uh, Turnbull government. $214 million was allocated to the Department of Defence to examine the future submarine project, to look at it, work out what might ought to be in, what ought to be out of it and you know, to presumably build up some reasonable costs. And they came to the conclusion around about 2015, and they gave evidence to uh, a, a Senate Estimates Committee that that project would cost $50 billion outturned, and that would, include just, uh, that would include acquisition and sustainment. We then went through a CEP process, a competitive evaluation process, and out of that process, we selected Naval Group as the partner to build our future submarines. But in there, somehow, somehow, the cost of the submarine went from an estimate of 50 billion outturned for sustainment and for um, acquisition to 89 billion dollars outturned. Now I'm going to ask officials about this when we're back uh, at the next estimates. How do you go from uh, a, a proposition that something is, is $50 billion outturned to $89 billion outturned and no one even raises a question? No one even says, how did that happen across the, the CEP? How did we get it so wrong? We spent $214 million was allocated in the lead up to the CEP to try and work out exactly what the, uh, the landscape was. And unfortunately, we, uh, uh, you know, th there was this huge error. Huge error. So now we see a $39,000 million increase in the price of the future submarine. Okay, so defence will argue it's not a blowout because it was approved by government. What they've done is said, it's your fault. It's your fault on the other side of the chamber. Somehow something went up $39,000 million and no one bothered to raise a question and say, Is that, can, can that be right? Can we have a submarine uh, fleet suddenly go up $39,000 million? That increase is $2.8 million per day for 38 years. That's how much that increase was. I would have thought someone would have said, hey, what happened? How did we get such a big increase? But no, we just signed off on it. The government just signed off on that project, caught up in a pre-election uh, you know, frenzy, wanting to do, uh, you know, to do good, but in actual fact, it looks like they've, uh, they've done harm. 
And since that time, we know that the projects had problems. And this is one of the things that the, the Economics Committee is examining, is the, um, uh, you know, how much Australian industry involvement is, in, is, is uh, taking place. How are we building our, our sovereign naval shipbuilding capability in relation to this particular contract? Now, under FOI, again, Defence resisted a, uh, uh, an OPD, but under FOI I got, I got access to the plans of Naval Group as they went forward, as they made their tender to the Australian government about, uh, uh, about what it is that they thought they could do with Australian industry. It include th included things like partnering with ASC, setting up uh, uh, programs in schools, uh, setting up uh, capability centres, all, so all manner of things. And this committee has started to examine exactly what was offered versus what was contracted. They're the exact documents we're looking to obtain. What did the, the companies that won the job offer to do here in Australia and what has and that way we can look at what has been done, what has been contracted? Very important issues. We heard the minister today, very unusually, the minister stood up at question time in answer to the first question and said, I'm very frustrated with Naval Group because we are not getting what we should out of that contract. We have a committee of the Senate looking into this and the Department of Defence is refusing to hand over documents. Now, again, to be fair to the minister, the minister uh, as she alluded to, uh, uh, has in some way sought to try and work out a way to grant access to those, uh, to those documents. But this has been going on for almost a year. If this Senate is to do its job properly, it has to be properly informed and they have to be able to receive information in a timely fashion. Otherwise, we can pack up and go home. Otherwise, we can operate remotely and simply press a button on our office walls whenever there's a vote. If we can't do the oversight role properly, we ought not to be here. We ought not be here. <coughs> so, it's a very serious issue that I'm talking about. It's not just about naval shipbuilding. It's about the Senate's capacity to do the job that it is required to do under the Australian Constitution. We were granted powers to do those jobs for very good reason. And you know, I, I said this at a Senate committee that was examining uh, certain elements of the D department's refusal to provide the Senate with information. I think we're very close to a privileges res resolution. I think we're very, very close because I can't see how any one of us could watch a committee stand still for six months, for six months waiting for the executive to respond favourably to provide it with the information it needs to do its inquiry. If that's not fettering the ability of a committee to do its work, then I don't know what is. And you know, Minister Birmingham, I know he's, he's weighed into this issue, but it's very important. You know, one day, people on uh, the, the government side of the chamber will be in opposition, and they'll be wanting to do their job properly. I did a, a speech, uh, a couple of, uh, I think it, was, it might have been in 2019, that the Senate has lost its mojo. The Senate has lost its mojo. It, it disheartens me to say that. I watched, uh, I watched the, the House of Commons in seeking to get access to documents from Facebook arrest someone in a hotel, bring them back to the Commons and say to them, you can't leave. If you don't hand over the documents, we're putting you in the cell. That's mojo. That's mojo. We in this place simply, uh, on, on a repetitive basis, ask for, the, for, the, for documents to be provided and simply ignore the executive when they fail to deliver. Now, I, for one, am not going to let that happen because I take my role as a senator very, very seriously. 
We are put here by the people of our respective states to do a proper job, and that job involves keeping an eye on the, on the executive, scrutinising the executive. Now, I know scrutiny is to the Prime Minister as kryptonite is to Superman. I know he doesn't like it very much, but that is our job, and we are empowered to do it, and we should do it. And we should not accept a claim by the executive that we cannot have access to information to do our job. We are tasked to do that, and we should do it, and we need the, the, uh, the Department of Defence to comply in this particular instance, and uh, the minister needs to direct them to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pat Patrick. Um, minister. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise only very briefly uh, on this matter, but I do wish to, uh, to make a contribution to it. Uh, the scrutiny functions that the parliament undertakes, and in particular uh, that this Senate, as a House of Review, uh, undertakes in this parliament, are of crucial importance and something that I hold in very high regard and of great uh, import to the functioning of the parliament, uh, the government uh, and, indeed, uh, to our entire system uh, of government. And I acknowledge uh, the important role that uh, individual senators play in this place uh, in driving uh, levels of scrutiny uh, over government decisions and particularly important policy decisions uh, such as those that relate uh, to the procurement uh, of our future defence assets. Uh, I do note that, uh, that um, there are also uh, few things uh, that are perhaps more sensitive in terms of their content uh, than um, documents that relate to the type of assets our defence forces are procuring for the future. Those sorts of, uh, of assets are obviously of high degrees of sensitivity um, and, uh, and do need careful consideration in the approaches that are taken to their scrutiny. Um, I have been pleased to, uh, to uh, try to work with Senator Patrick uh, since, uh, since my appointment as Leader of the Government in the Senate in relation to some of his concerns that he has expressed about access to some of the defence procurement documents. I acknowledge uh, that he is genuinely seeking to scrutinise uh, some of the information uh, within those documents. Uh, I do think that a significant breakthrough was made shortly prior to uh, this fortnight of parliamentary sittings uh, when uh, the Minister for Defence, uh, following uh, further work with her department, uh, offered the members of the Senate Economics Committee um, access to those documents that had been previously redacted for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, and I think it, uh, it um, is notable that a very significant breakthrough occurred and it was a very significant step by defence to provide for access to those tender and procurement related documents for significant uh, defence assets and naval infrastructure uh, and to do so in an unredacted format and to be available to be uh, questioned in confidence uh, about uh, those uh, those uh, documents. I do encourage members of the Senate Economics Committee to, in good faith, engage with defence uh, through the process that defence has offered in that regard. To at least do so in good faith initially, if there are dissatisfactions following that engagement, will then, by all means, bring those concerns back to the government. Uh, but Defence, I think, has made a very significant step in transparency and in engagement with this chamber and, in particular, with senators on the Senate Economics Committee. Uh, and I would encourage them uh, to take that up and to use the opportunity that has been provided. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to take note of the response of Senator Reynolds. And, and I do in, uh, you know, endorse the comments made by Senator Birmingham. I think he has been a circuit breaker in what's been an extremely unusual and vexed uh, uh, inquiry. And look, I've done a couple of inquiries since I've been here. As I've languished on the back bench, I've learned all about Senate standing orders, procedures and inquiries. But I've never run into this level of intransigence. And I honestly it had no political perspective in the pursuit of this inquiry. To me, it looks straight up and down, scrutinised expenditure, plans, 
and, um, and progress in an extremely important area of defence policy. And I had the opportunity of opening up a, uh, a hearing quite recently, and I said to the Secretary of uh, Defence, I'll start for a few moments. I'm not looking at this from any particular perspective, perspective other than the Senate gave the committee a reference. You'd be very familiar with the terms of reference. And amongst the terms of reference is the ongoing examination of contracts, scrutiny of expenditure, the department's performance when we have requested this information has been nothing short of abysmal. You have redacted publicly available information and sent it to us. It is almost like you have a giant forefinger up to the operation of this committee. It has now been to the Senate to get orders. I accept that you have a case on commercial and confidential uh, matters and all of the rest of the things. But in the ordinary course of this committee's activity, I as chair personally feel, and I'm sure there are other members of the committee who feel the same way, that defence has been absolutely obtuse, arrogant, dismissive and contemptuous of the work of a Senate committee duly given a reference by the Senate. So, it's a pretty strong opening line for a, uh, to a departmental secretary, but I don't resolve from it because the people who are resourcing uh, the Senate committee, the good people of the secretariat, were becoming absolutely flabbergasted at the, the information that was given to us. The way it was presented to us uh, was almost um, unseen before. And I have done a little bit of work with defence. You know, I did chair the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, and we went through some exceedingly uh, contentious um, private issues, and we dealt with an enormous amount of stuff that may need to be visible in camera. And it appears, though, that all of those sort of protocols and procedures have been forgotten. Uh, by defence. So in the Veterans Affairs uh, area where we had a, a whole stack of in-camera documents made available to senators, and I say senators, not voting senators as they tried to prescribe here recently, to senators, um, over a period of time you'd sign in, you'd be able to access the information, you couldn't copy it or take it away, but you could view it, you could form your opinion and you could come back and um, you know, make your contribution. And I well remember Senator Force had been exceedingly diligent in that area. Personally, I only have to read one tale of distress. I don't need to read a hundred, but there were other senators like Senator Lambie, Senator Fawcett, who went in camera and they went through the whole lot. And the end result was, this is the really interesting thing, the end result was we produced a report which had 26 recommendations. The government accepted every one of them. And the Department of Veterans Affairs actually put money behind some of the initiatives that were suggested. So good work can come out of difficult areas. Good work can come out of difficult areas. But not providing the information to people is absolutely not conducive to a great outcome. Now, Senator Reynolds left the chamber, and basically that's why I need to uh, put on the record, that she had written to me, setting out a pathway forward, and that I had written back to her and she was responding to that. Well, the problem with the Senator Birmingham and uh, Senator Reynolds' response basically was that this has been an order for production by the Senate twice. Senator Patrick is quite entitled to look for a privileges outcome here. I foreshadowed that this type of activity could occur every sitting day until we get resolution to the Department of Defence, and clearly, obviously, as a public hearing to the minister. Now, what the, um, the minister has sought to do was to senators will be able to view the documents at a secure location in Canberra. This will be available to voting members of the committee only. Now, clearly. That condition 
um, is a breach of standing orders. And, and that's what's been sent ex uh, straight back to her. Is you, all members of the Senate are participating members, members of all committees and therefore can go and participate in all inquiries. And to say it's voting members only uh, is wrong. It's against standing orders. And that has been uh, uh, clearly pointed out. The rec this request contravened Standing Orders 25-7C, which state that participating members may participate in hearings of evidence and the deliberations of the committee, have all the rights of the committee, but may not vote. So they can get all the information, they just can't vote on the outcome of it. So <coughs> we're uh, not quite as close as Senator Birmingham uh, um, alleges, but I do say that he has intervened to good measure a couple of times. But it, the nut of it all is this. I said to our committee secretary, can you reach out to the Department of Defence and say, we are not unique. This is a reference. You can see the terms of reference. These are requests. You know the standing orders. Can we get somewhere closer? Can we get somewhere closer? Is there an area where we can start seeing a regular flow of information to allow the committee to do its work. To allow the committee to do its work. And if you need to argue <coughs> commercial incompetence, you'll either win or lose that. And you're losing it. Senator Patrick has come to the committee, put on the table freedom of information outcomes which clearly say the defence was wrong in hiding the stuff from the committee. There's just no, there's no there's no ifs and buts about it. The freedom of information stuff that he's got, some of it actually states that they should be able to be made available to the committee. So we've been <coughs> passing the parcel in a very difficult area. I don't know whether it's in the ministerial office that this intransigence and reluctance to cooperate with the Senate committee is, or whether it's in defence. I fired a shot over to Secretary Moriarty's bow and said, I reckon you were given us a giant forefinger. Tell us why you're not and improve your performance. Because this doesn't stop in a reference. All it does is transfer to estimates. And then you have another you know, whole heap of departmental officers you know, uh, working away on questions on notice and the like. Why can't we have what the Constitution says? There's a, you know, there's a parliament and there's an executive. And this Senate gave us a job of scrutinising performance uh, capability and money. Well, what, where's the big issue here? And every time they raise an issue, Senator Patrick, Senator Patrick actually trumps them with, well, by the way, under freedom of information, I got that, and it says here it shouldn't have been classified in the first place. So, look, I won't take up any more of the Senate's time, but I think it is really important that we allow our Senate committees to do what they do best, scrutinise expenditure. I mean, the audit office will come down eventually and say, God almighty, what happened here? But in the meantime, we might be able to point someone on the pathway to good outcomes. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Um, Senator Polly. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Reynolds to questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher, Eyre and myself. Now, what we've seen in this chamber day after day from the Minister for Defence is somebody who cannot remember, doesn't understand the processes, has done nothing to protect the privacy of Ms Higgins, but yet she comes into this place and she hides behind her words saying that she, she wants Ms Higgins to be able to give her recollections herself and that she's trying to uh, pay uh, respect to Ms Higgins' privacy. Well, Ms Higgins' response to those statements that have been given in this place and elsewhere is, I don't think she has ever been concerned about my privacy. She wasn't concerned about my privacy when she met with the Assistant, Minister of, uh, Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police behind my back. What has been so disappointing 
about this whole sordid affair is that Ms Higgins, who has made a very serious allegation of rape in the office of the Minister for Defence, is that every time this minister comes into the chamber and refuses to give a full and frank account of what she did in terms of supporting Ms Higgins, referring the matter to the AFP, informing the Prime Minister of this country, we have seen nothing but failure on behalf of this minister. And so Ms Higgins, who now in this chamber, during question time, the minister all but called her a liar. That's what she did. So the effect that this is having— um, Senator Polly, please resume your seat. Madam Deputy Senator Chair, Brock. under 1933, this is getting very, very close, if not over the line, of a direct imputation against a member of this place. And I would ask you to listen carefully to what is being said. I certainly will. I think, uh, as you pointed out, I think the senator came close, but uh, not quite all the way there. Well, I'll be guided by the clerk if he thinks otherwise. Um, yes, I think uh, the senator has come close, Senator Brockman, and I'll continue to pay close attention. And uh, I'd invite Senator Polly, if she thinks there was an imputation she wishes to withdraw, to take that opportunity to do so. But please continue. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The minister today in this chamber said that Ms Higgins had her recollections, and she has a right to tell that story. But I believe there's Ms Higgins has a right to be heard, to be listened to and to be supported and to be respected. Now, this is a terrible message that we're sending out to young women and, to, in fact, to young men who work in this place, that they cannot be assured that they're going to have the support of their minister or their senator or their member when something that is unacceptable, that is in, uh, contrary to Australian law, that they won't first have their back by their boss, that they won't refer the issue straight away to the Australian Federal Police. It is just extraordinary. And so what we had today is a minister who comes in here and says, well, I had a, yes, I did have a, uh, a meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the AFP only after the Prime Minister already made that public in the other place. And she said she had that meeting, and yesterday she couldn't tell us whether anyone else attended that meeting, but today she said, well, I did have a meeting. In fact, I had two meetings, and on the 1st of April, I, um, my chief of staff came and joined me. And then she came back later, and what she said is, to further question from Senator Wong is, oh, I don't know. I will have to take that on notice. I will have to take it on notice. Now, this is a serious issue, and I have no doubt that the minister has put herself under immense pressure with this situation. But she should have been fully briefed, fully prepared to know whether or not she had meetings with the assistant commissioner, whether her chief of staff was there or not, when Ms Higgins was there. But now she's got to go and check those facts. This does nothing to assure the Australian people or anyone else that listens in to parliament, and with the amount of phone calls that I know myself and my colleagues are receiving in our offices, they have little faith in this minister. They have little faith that this has not been covered up. And in fact, some would assert that the cover-up goes right from the top from the Prime Minister, who remarkably says that he only found out on Monday that there was a, an alleged rape in the minister's office. Well, for anyone who's been in this place for even a short period of time, you know that there's nothing that goes on in this place without this gossip and innuendo about what's been happening. So it's extraordinary 
absolutely extraordinary effort on this minister to cover up a oh, real beg your pardon. crime. Sorry, um, your time has expired, uh, Senator Polly. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Sensitive issues like this deserve to be treated with respect. It's got to be considered that the, these matters are fraught with exceptional difficulty. And whilst I'm sure Senator Polly has huge qualities as a senator and is multi-skilled, I would suggest to her that it is highly inappropriate for her or indeed any other senator to come into this place and pretend to be so multi-skilled that you can be the investigator, the prosecutor, the judge and the jury all in one matter, especially one as sensitive as this. And now, in a former life, Deputy President, uh, I defended people who were accused of heinous offences and indeed represented victims who were the subject of heinous offences. Indeed, uh, one of the privileges I had before entering Parliament was being a uh, founding executive member and honorary legal adviser to a women's shelter where issues of this nature often arose. You've got to be sensitive. You've got to treat uh, people that come with their stories with respect. We also have in Australia, thankfully, in the concept of innocent until proven guilty. You've got to treat these cases exceptionally, exceptionally carefully. And uh, what I would invite all senators to do is to leave this matter to the independent body that uh, it has now been uh, established, uh, where the Minister for Finance is seeking to ensure that this matter is dealt with in a manner that takes it out of the political realm. Sure, some people think that you can get some tawdry political advantage by going on a personal demolition derby against the minister, but the minister herself has been consistent throughout this matter in her responses, seeking to protect the person making the allegations. That is an appropriate course of action, a proper course of action, an honourable course of action, especially in circumstances when political opponents are seeking to apply a blowtorch to her. It might be very easy for her to say, well, here it all is. Instead, she has retained her dignity. She has retained the exact same approach that she has from day one, and I think that is indicative of character, discernment and judgment. And so for the Labor Party to try to run this tawdry exercise against the minister on a personal basis really does, I think, the Labor Party a great disservice, and one assumes also the lady making the complaint also a great disservice. We are not here to determine what the facts of the circumstances or the case may be. On the face of it, I've got to say it looks pretty ugly, pretty horrific, and uh, clearly it is an exceptionally, exceptionally serious matter. So should it be bounced around this chamber and in the other place and people trying to make uh, uh, some political uh, point scoring exercise out of it? I think not. What we need, Madam Deputy President, is uh, genuine sincerity, a careful treatment of this matter to ensure that everybody's rights are protected and, what is more, when the particular circumstances, or sorry, not when, whilst the particular circumstances of this case are being fully investigated and determined as to whether, for example, a prosecution should or should not take place, that should be independently considered first by the Federal Police and then the Director of Public Prosecutions. And whilst that's occurring, let us all work together to ensure that anybody that has a complaint of this nature has a proper pathway to go forward to ensure that there is a clear mechanism. And surely that should have been part and parcel and the thrust of Senator Polly 
and the Labor Party contribution today? Sadly not. It was all cheap, tawdry personal attacks against the minister. I, for one, the Prime Minister and the whole coalition look forward to seeing a pathway being developed for the protection of all the staff you, that work Senator in this Abetz, place. Your time has expired. Uh, I've got two people standing. Uh, thank you. Senator Gallagher. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to take note of answers uh, to questions, and in particular Senator Wong's question to Senator Reynolds. But before I, uh, um, I go to that matter, I'd, I'd just like to, well, in, in a sense, congratulate Senator Abetz on his contribution there. But there was one great, big, glaring hole in all of that contribution. On the night that this happened, no one rang the police. And I will shake my head forever why a security guard, a ministerial advisor, a DPS staffer or Senator Reynolds never thought to ring the police about what was clearly a serious crime that had been committed in this parliament. So the business that I wanted to refer to at the moment is Senator Reynolds' non-answer, once again falling on a track record of non-answers to the uh, Naval Committee uh, to the Naval Shipbuilding Inquiry and the Economics Committee, she did it again today. When asked why have you not made a decision, which you said you'd do in 2019, she referred to our term of government and her, her government's investment in shipbuilding and submarines and the like. Where is the difficulty with this minister coming to grips with a decision which she'd foreshadowed? Why is it such an ongoing uh, black cloud over, over South Australia as to where this is? Why are there 750 workers wondering whether they've got a job or not? In an area where we should be looking at confirming their position, in recruiting more boilermakers, recruiting more engineers, recruiting more shipbuilding workers, there appears to be a continual hiatus in that office, a continual procrastination, a continual lack of decision making, and you know, if you were to look at the debacle that's played itself out in the in the Parliament for the last week or so, uh, there's a, there clearly doesn't appear to be any strong ministerial leadership, any strong uh, capability within the office. It seems to meander along from one disaster to the next. And when we in the uh, naval uh, shipbuilding inquiry and the like uh, try to seek information about what capability plans are uh, available, what expenditure is happening, where are the we get stonewalled. We get literally told, commercial in confidence, can't see it, can't do it. So it's quite extraordinary. And I, I well remember asking questions of David Johnson, the former sen uh, senator from West Australia, who was the, uh, the Minister of Defence. And he'd give you a response. You may not like the response. And as a matter of fact, the one famous day in this chamber, he gave us a response that no one liked. I wouldn't trust you to build a canoe, is what he said about South Australian workers. I wouldn't trust ASC to build a canoe. Shortly after that, he uh, changed his uh, career projection and went and probably on to bigger and better things than the defence minister. But he was never short of expertise and intelligent answers. But this minister appears to be bereft of expertise in her office and refuses to answer almost everything. There is, there is literally almost not a question which we can craft that this minister will not find a way of avoiding. And we're not playing trumps here. Defence is not an overtly political area. Outside of decisions about where things are made, outside of uh, where things are produced or where money is spent, once those decisions are made, people like to just go on and examine how progress is. And dare I say this? A government will never fall in Australia because defence is overspent. It's almost inclined to overspend on everything it does. 
It often has three or four projects of concern requiring the attention of the Treasurer, <coughs> the Finance Minister <coughs> and the Defence Minister to try and get them back on track. So to have a minister who just blatantly refuses to provide information to properly constituted committees of the Senate and then in question time won't provide answers to questions she knows. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This has been an incredibly difficult period for, for a lot of women, certainly for Ms Higgins, but there's been a lot of women, and I know across the aisle uh, they would understand this, um, lots of women have experienced abuse, assault, sexual harassment, uh, rape. Uh, and for a multitude of reasons, a lot of these women determine that they want to keep it private. And it's not just one reason why they keep it private, it's for a whole lot of reasons. But there are experiences that occur not just in Parliament House, experiences that have occurred not just through our own political parties, uh, but through a variety of experiences in different times of their life. And I find it absolutely and utterly shameful, this politicisation of Ms Higgins' experiences. The lack of sympathy for her, of understanding of her, the fact that it has been a number of years since this occurred and things change for people over time. Lots changes for lots of people at different times. And Ms Higgins at the time decided not to pursue uh, a police investigation that was offered to her. And as this week has unfolded, at one stage Senator Reynolds was being criticised for <coughs> not respecting her privacy. Uh, but now, but as it unfolds, that Ms Senator Reynolds actually was respectful of her privacy by maintaining uh, a very dignified silence and is continuing to do so around Ms Higgins' situation, uh, that somehow now those opposite are claiming that sh those wishes should have been disrespected, those wishes should have been ignored, that somehow they know best as what was happening at that specific time and that Senator Reynolds should have just ignored the wishes of Ms Higgins. The wishes that Senator Reynolds respected, that she listened to, and she supported Ms Higgins throughout this and offered at every opportunity that she could her support to go with Ms Higgins, to support her both in a physical sense and being present and in whatever way that she wanted. Uh, this was also obviously followed up by Senator Cash also offering to go with her to make a police report. This is actual support. By trying to take down one woman whilst alleging to support another, you should be ashamed of yourselves absolutely and utterly ashamed of yourselves. And I guess one of the things that also upsets me, and I think upsets and confounds a lot of people, is your willingness to attack Senator Reynolds, your willingness, like Senator Gallagher just did, absolutely outrageously claiming Senator Reynolds should have called the police on the night the incident occurred. If you want to be angry with the security guards for not doing it, sure, fair enough. Senator Reynolds didn't know about it on the night that it occurred. In fact, she didn't learn about it for a couple of days when she was told about a security breach, is my understanding, not about an incident that occurred. So you can't just rewrite history because it suits your disgraceful narrative. During the last election campaign, another woman made some allegations, and a lot on the other side of the chamber were pretty quick to dismiss those, pretty quick to diminish that woman pretty quick to race to the defence of their then leader. I hope you've all had a good hard look at yourself with this faux outrage and this absolutely pathetic effort that you're trying to do against Minister Reynolds. I hope you are reaching out to Ms Sheriff and offering support to her An absolutely abhorrent behaviour, trying to tear down one woman with a rewriting of history who did absolutely everything by the book as required. The minister in charge of defence industry, the minister who was told of a security breach, not of an incident, 
and now we're rewriting history to suit an absolutely disgraceful agenda. But I am wondering at what time the Labor Party or anyone else in this chamber might actually find a little outrage for the alleged perpetrator. Perhaps even Ms Wilkinson, who left it to the 29th minute of that interview to even mention him. Perhaps at some stage you might realise that there was someone else that actually inflicted this alleged attack on Ms Higgins. But yet we have silence, total silence of anger or empathy or you know, any feelings towards alleged perpetrators and what he, he allegedly contributed Thank to, you, to Ms Higgins. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Madam Deputy President, what's missing here is leadership. What's missing here is the inability of a minister to provide a timeline of duty of care, of responsibility, of questions by senators to the Senate. What's missing here is the inability of a minister to talk straight, to talk honestly, consistently. Every minister in this cabinet has a responsibility to this parliament. Every minister. So when they are questioned, whether in the Senate or in the House, they have a responsibility to be able to respond to the questions. There is no disagreement around the need to have absolute empathy, sincere concern for a young woman whose story has been shown right across this country. We're not fighting over who feels more disgusted in what occurred here. What we demand to know in this Senate, Madam Deputy President, is the duty of care and responsibility of those in power of those who are responsible for others, of those who are responsible for the duty of care of their staff. That is a question that we will continue to ask, Madam Deputy President. That is a question we must ask. To not do so would be an abrogation of our responsibility. Because right now, Madam Deputy President, the one who is abrogating that responsibility is the minister herself, is the prime minister himself, because these questions must be asked and they must be answered. Because we have hundreds of staffers in this building. We have hundreds of workers in this building. And the rest of the country wants to know that we are able to reach to the highest of levels above all political persuasion to make this place a safe place. When the minister comes in here with one response to a question by a senator and then changes that response to a next question by a next senator, then we deserve the right to pursue this minister to hear the truth. What is your truth-telling here, Minister? Do the right thing. Speak your truth. Because all we hear is hidden messages, ducking and weaving. You are a leader in this government. You are supposed to be a leader in this Senate. You have a responsibility and duty of care, not only to those around you, but to our country as the Defence Minister. If you cannot, Minister, speak straight and honest in here, in the Senate, where you must be held accountable, then how can any Australian expect you to be doing that out there? How can our Defence Forces expect you to be doing that out there? When we ask you questions about the AFP, about your role in your meetings with them, you need to be clear. In one response today, 
you said one thing about the AFP. Ten minutes later, you couldn't remember what you'd said about the AFP. It is our duty as senators in this Senate to ask these questions. There is no challenge to who feels more disgusted and angered by the events of these past fortnight and, in fact, the past couple of years. Only Miss Higgins holds that. But we as senators have to pursue what we believe is the right thing to do, and that is to understand, Minister, the honesty and the truth-telling that is yet to come from you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motions are moved by Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Seawitt, and I just quickly remind you of the 4 p.m. hard marker. Uh, yes, okay, sorry. Um, I rise to take note of the answer by the Minister for Social Services to my questions on the increase in the job seeker payment. This is an outrageous act by this government. $25 a week. What century are they living in? I'll tell you, the last century, because the Prime Minister admitted it when he referred back to the days of John Howard when he was talking about this increase. The Minister could not answer my question as to whether she could survive on $44 a day, because that's because she couldn't and she knows it. It is outrageous. This government knows you can't live on $44 a day. They knew you couldn't live on $40 a day, which is why they've introduced the coronavirus supplement during the pandemic. The Prime Minister has broken the hearts of every job seeker across this country because they have been condemned, deliberately condemned, to live in poverty, which is outrageous in a country as wealthy as Australia. He had a duty to support job seekers, and what he's done is condemned them to poverty. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. The question is: The motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, what have we got now? Ah, pursuant to order, I shall now call a disallowance motion. Sorry, and call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one. Standing in the name of Senator Griff, relating to the disallowance of the Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court Amendment Fees Regulations 2020. Senator Griff. Move the motion. This disallowance is to right a wrong where, yet again, this government is doing whatever it takes to make it hard for refugees and immigrants and migrants. How else can this be explained when this regulation imposes a five-fold increase in Federal Circuit fees for migration litigants? taking the fee from $690 to $3,330. $3,330. If this regulation stands, this is what migration litigants will have to pay in order to challenge a decision made by the Minister for Immigration, the Immigration Assessment Authority and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And that cost will increase this July and every July thereafter. Even those who have demonstrated severe financial difficulty will still be required to pay half the new fee, or $1,665. For a refugee on a bridging visa or a migrant in Australia who may well be earning the minimum wage, assuming they even have work rights, the new fee is the equivalent of over a month's pay. Over a month's pay. This fee hike doesn't just affect refugees and protection visa applicants. About half of the court's migration caseload deals with student visas and skilled work visa refusals and cancellations, as well as applications relating to partner visas, business visa applications and visitor and other short-stay visas. The government argues that the Federal Circuit Court's migration caseload has almost doubled in recent years and higher fees will enable more investment in judges and other resources. Now, let's just work through that rationale. The government says that fees are necessary to provide the courts with additional resourcing. Now, this only makes sense if you think that a court should be operating on a cost recovery basis. Cost recovery is entirely appropriate for some areas of policy, but justice is not one of them. Justice 
is a public good. It is also worth recognising that in family law cases, not migration cases, which make up the majority of the Federal Circuit Court's caseload. In fact, there were 13 times the number of family law applications in the Federal Circuit Court last financial year than were migration applications. It is also worth noting that a similar attempt to increase fees for family law litigants was disallowed in 2015. This is no different. If the courts are overworked, and I absolutely believe they are, the solution is not to increase application fees, but for the government to provide adequate resourcing. The next government justification is that the fee hike will simply bring these fees into line with other courts. The Law Council of Australia and others have shown this claim to be totally false. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal charges no fees for some cases and less than $1,000 for others, certainly not $3,330. It charges no application fees for a number of immigration matters, including applications to review protection visa decisions. So why should the government take a different stance for applications to the FCC? There is no justification for the Federal Circuit Court charging such distorted fees for migration cases. My motion will disallow these regulations because they are unnecessary and absolutely unfair. In December, the Senate agreed to an order for the production of documents seeking the rationale for the fee hike. These OPD documents showed a little more of the real story. They showed that the regulations were rushed, with the AAT and the Federal Court provided with a copy of the draft amendments barely a week, barely a week before the budget, and they were only given one day to respond. One day. The documents also betray the ideology and bias behind the funding increase. One of the documents focuses exclusively on protection visas and the need to reel in the number of review applications. Protection visas have been targeted even though they represent under half of the migration cases dealt with by the FCC. So when the government talks about better resourcing and making caseloads more manageable, what it is really hoping is that the fee hike will push migration law applicants away, out of the system. The real improvement in caseloads will come from refugees and temporary migrants not needing to pursue their cases. People should be free to lodge an application when they believe they have a case. The cost of making the initial application should not be the deciding factor. Now, we know the fee hike is expected to raise just $14 million to offset the $35.7 million the government set aside in the budget for additional family law judges and registrars. But it appears from the documents the government wants these fees to also help cover existing registrars it has funded through appropriations for a program it has not even legislated which is the controversial parenting management hearing measure announced in the 2017-18 budget, which will now no longer proceed. So, having decided to scrap the unpopular measure, it has decided to squeeze migration litigants for the extra cash. It's a cheap game of smoke and mirrors, and vulnerable litigants are the ones who will pay at the price. Our legal system is based on the premise that every person has the right to justice. Justice should be accessible for all. It should be affordable for all. Justice should be about fair and equal treatment for all. This regulation undermines the very principles of justice and well and truly deserves to be thrown out. Migrants should not be treated as cash cows and a political weapon. If you share my concerns, I ask that you support this disallowance and send a clear signal to government that it's time to stop demonising, persecuting, isolating and punishing refugees and migrants. Senator Dunham, then I'll come to Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, um, Mr President. Uh, just on behalf of the government, I'd like to indicate, of course, that the government will not be supporting the disallowance of uh, these uh, matters. Uh, if I could just put on record um, 
on behalf of the government uh, that as part of the 2020-21 budget, the government is providing $36 million for additional FCC resourcing, including three additional general division judges along with an additional family law judge and five additional family law judicial registrars. This will allow the court to resolve more matters every year, including an estimated 1,000 additional migration cases, uh, which responds to the increase in FCC uh, migration filings from 3,544 uh, in the year 2014-15 to 6,555 in 2019-20. Uh, this resourcing will be offset by an increase to the migration application fee to which this regulation gives effect, uh, with all revenue reinvested in the court. Currently, the FCC fee for migration matters is significantly lower than that of the AAT fee, and the new rate is set halfway between the AAT and federal court fee. Applicants will continue to have access to the court through the full fee exemption, and new partial fee exemption mechanisms. Senator Watt. Oh, sorry. I'm going to, I indicated I'd call Senator Watt next. I'll try to go around the chamber. Senator, I'll call you next, Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, De uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court Amendment Fees Regulations 2020 would increase the application fee for migration litigants in the Federal Circuit Court from $690 to $3,330. Beyond a very vague explanatory statement issued by the Attorney-General, the dramatic increase to the application fee for migration litigants has not been explained or justified. In the Attorney-General's statement, the increase is justified in the following terms. The amended fees only apply to migration litigants and bring the Federal Circuit Court application fees in line with the Federal Circuit Court's placement in Australia's court hierarchy relative to the application fees for the, for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the application fees for the Federal, Circuit, uh, Federal Court of Australia. The regulations specify the Federal Circuit Court application fee for migration litigants has increased from $690 to $3,330, uh, as I say, bringing the Federal Circuit Court application fees in line with the Federal Circuit Court's placement in Australia's court hierarchy. The comparison is then made by the Attorney-General to the application fees for the AAT, which are currently $1,826, and for the Federal Court of Australia, which is currently $4,840. This statement from the Attorney-General is a nonsense. For starters, it suggests the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is a court and so forms part of Australia's court hierarchy. The Attorney-General, the first law officer of the Commonwealth, appears to think that the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is a court. The clue is in the title, Attorney-General. It's called the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, not the Administrative Appeals Court. The same Attorney-General, who thinks he knows better than the entire family law sector when it comes to restructuring the family court and the federal circuit court, apparently doesn't even know the difference between a law court and a merits review tribunal. Or maybe he does know the difference, and his explanatory statement in, re in relation to these regulations cannot be attributed to ignorance, but can instead be attributed to malevolence. Because the upshot of these regulations is that it will cost some of the most vulnerable people in Australia more than twice as much to make an application to the Federal Circuit Court than it costs companies like Amazon or Microsoft or Facebook. And that's because this fee increase will apply only to migration litigants. So who are these migration litigants? In 2019-20, there were 6,555 migration matters filed in the Federal Circuit Court. 49 per cent of those matters related to judicial review of protection visa decisions. As the Federal Circuit Court notes in its 2019-20 annual report, a protection visa is the means by which Australia recognises and protects foreign nationals in Australia claiming to fear certain kinds of harm in their countries of origin. When a foreign national who is seeking Australia's protection has his or her visa application refused, that person will often seek review in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That's the merits review tribunal that the Liberals, and the current Attorney-General in particular, have stacked with over 70 former Liberal Party political failed uh, Liberal candidates, uh, Liberal Party politicians, failed Liberal candidates, Liberal donors and former Liberal staffers. The application fee for the Migration and Refugee Division of the AAT is $1,826. So you have to pay a lot of money as an asylum seeker to have your matter heard by a mate of the minister who made the decision you're complaining about. If a member of the AAT 
including any one of those 70 former Liberal Party politicians, failed Liberal candidates, Liberal donors and former Liberal staffers, decides to uphold the government's decision to refuse an application for a protection visa, the affected individual can then apply to the Federal Circuit Court to review the legality of the tribunal's decision. Or at least the individual can theoretically apply, because how many people who are asylum seekers and are seeking Australia's protection will be able to avoid the application fee if these regulations are not disallowed and the fee goes up by almost 400 per cent to $3,330. These regulations are an attack on access to justice. These regulations are designed to make it harder for people to challenge the legality of decisions made by ministers so that it is easier for ministers to make unlawful decisions with impunity. We all have an interest in ensuring that ministers and departments are acting within the law. And the only way we can ensure that ministers and departments are acting within the law is to ensure that, both in theory and in practice, they are subject to the law. These regulations are taking us on a very dangerous path toward a user-paid justice system, where the only people who have access to justice are those who have the money to pay for it. That certainly seems to be the Morrison government's view of the justice system. When the Assistant Minister to the Attorney-General stood up in this place and defended those fee increases last week, she said, there is a fiscal responsibility in the way that we operate the, fa the Federal Circuit Court, and that means that the fees associated with, for instance, filings for migration cases will be applied to cover costs associated with dealing with migration cases, such as the costs associated with those judges. What the Assistant Minister to the Attorney-General is describing there is a user-pays justice system. And her comments and the Morrison government's attitude to the legal system should concern all Australians. While courts do charge fees, the Commonwealth has traditionally funded the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court out of consolidated revenue with a view to enabling individuals, regardless of their financial circumstances, to access justice and vindicate their rights. That is as it should be, because courts are a public good. As the Law Council said in relation to these regulations, the rule of law and human rights of all people are core tenets of our uh, modern democracy, and having access to justice is an important part of protecting those rights. Justice is not a commodity, and our justice system should not be reduced to a user-pays model. One fundamentally important and publicly beneficial role that courts play is upholding the rule of law and ensuring that governments act within the law. To take a recent example. Vulnerable Australians who suffered under this government's robo-debt debacle know a bit about the role that courts can play in holding a particularly reckless and an especially arrogant government to account. Because it was the federal court that held that the robo-debt scheme, which was designed and boasted about by the current Prime Minister and Attorney-General, was illegal. Let us never forget that under that illegal scheme, this callous and malicious government demanded that tens of thousands of Australians pay debts that they did not owe, and when people didn't or couldn't, this government called in the debt collectors. And that scheme would, full, would still be in full swing today if it were not for the federal court and if it were not for the fact that one of the individuals who was targeted by the government Order. under the Prime Order. Minister's— Senator, Hanson. Oh, sorry, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, my point of order is that I would ask the senator to return to the nature of the motion, please. Um, I think, respectfully, we've traditionally applied a wide range of relevance when speaking to motions in the Senate, so I haven't detected anything out of order. Senator Watt. Um, thank you, Mr President. And unfortunately, uh, Senator Henderson's point of order just demonstrates, if there was any doubt, that this government doesn't understand the rule of law. And exactly the same issues are happening uh, in relation to these, these regulations as occurred in relation to robo-debt. What it's about is about Australians, whether they be Australian se uh, asylum seekers, whether they be people receiving payments from the federal government uh, that were incorrectly and illegally sought to be returned under robo-debt, or whether it be wealthier people in our community like you and me, Senator Henderson, uh, have the ability to go to the courts. And, and you are, in, in, through you, Mr President, the government, in, in increasing the fees through this regulation, uh, is simply denying access to justice uh, for more Australians. So thank you, Senator Henderson, for uh, inviting me to make my speech even longer than it was going to be. Um, this is a government that hates scrutiny, detests accountability and thumbs its nose at fundamental democratic principles and institutions, including access to justice. Labor has always fought for access to justice. This dramatic, unjustified and unjustifiable increase to filing fees in the Federal Circuit Court is inconsistent with that principle, and Labor calls for them to be disallowed. Senator, I'll call you next. You weren't seeking the call, Senator McKim, earlier. I did indicate to Senator Henderson I would. I will call you next. I'm sorry you didn't indicate earlier. I'll come to you next. 
Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I have to say I am uh, disappointed with the disallowance motion which has been brought forward by Senator Griff today, uh, principally because Senator Griff has not explained in full uh, this particular regulation and what it means. And I want to refer senators to the fact that the proposed regulation that Senator Griff is seeking to disallow uh, allows the registrar or an authorised officer to determine that an individual may pay the reduced fee as specified. Now, Senator Griff did reference that, but he did not reference, and nor did Senator Watt, reference the fact that it is also open to applicants to seek an exemption from paying the fee, a full waiver of the fee. And I read out the relevant provision of the regulation. If, in the opinion of the registrar or the authorised officer at that time, the payment of the reduced fee would also cause financial hardship to the individual, the individual is exempt from paying both the full fee and the reduced fee. And I can hear the heckling from the other side of the chamber, but it is a very serious omission. And it's a very important um, point to make, because it goes to the very point of access to justice. It goes to the very point of access to justice. And I do also want to reference that in considering whether payment of a fee would cause financial hardship to an individual, the registrar or an authorised officer must consider the individual's income, day-to-day -day living expenses, liability, liabilities and assets. So it is open to any applicant to make an application for a full waiver of the fee. And Senator Watt made some outrageous and abhorrent suggestions in relation to breaches of the rule of law and human rights, and what absolute rubbish from Senator Watt. And I want to refer him and other senators to the Human Rights Parliamentary Joint Committee finding in relation to these regulations and the bipartisan position that was taken in relation to assessing the human rights implications of this regulation. And I want to read this out for all senators' benefits. And the committee found, including Labor members of the committee, uh, it noted the Attorney General's advice that the funds generated by the increased application fee for migration matters will be used to offset the cost of increasing the capacity of the Federal Circuit Court in both migration and family law matters, including enabling the court to finalise an estimated additional 1,000 migration matters each year. The report went on to say, and this is report number one of 2021, in addition, the committee notes that court personnel will have the discretion to consider an applicant's full, unique personal circumstances, including their liquid assets, income and other, any other relevant factors, in determining whether they will be in that some classes of applicants, oh, sorry, in determining whether they will be in financial hardship if required to pay the application fee. The committee also notes that some classes of applicants, such as minors and people in detention, are exempt from payment of the application fee based on their status. The committee considers, therefore, that there are, in, that there are sufficient safeguards such that these amendments may not result in a limitation on the right of access to justice in practice. And I'm quoting from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, which I chair, and that was the bipartisan position taken of all members of that committee. So, as I say, I am very disappointed that Senators Griff and Senator Watt have not referenced the very important point that I've made. A full exemption is available, and it's determined independently by the registrar or an authorised officer who would be able to look at all of the circumstances of that applicant's financial situation. And that's a really important point when we are talking about access to justice. The other really important point to make, and which is why I'm seeking that senators do not seek to disallow this regulation, is that all of the revenue from this measure is being reinvested in the court. The revenue is supporting $35.7 million over the Ford estimates in additional funding for the Federal Circuit Court 
to assist with the timely resolution of both migration and family law matters. So this additional resourcing will provide the Federal Circuit Court with three additional general federal law judges, a very significant investment, accompanied by two additional registrars and other support staff to support the migration workload of the court. It will also support one additional family law judge, accompanied by five additional registrars and other support staff, to support the family law workload of the court. And it will also help to, fund base fund, help to increase base funding to support the court's current and ongoing operations. The number of migration matters filed in the Federal Circuit Court has grown substantially from 3,544 in 2014-15 to some 6,500-2019-20. ,5 so these resources are incredibly important in terms of addressing that workload. While the Federal Circuit Court continues to increase the number of migration matters that it finalises each year, it has been unable to finalise as many matters as there are filing. So these resources are desperately needed and incredibly important. The increase to the Federal Circuit Court migration fee will bring the Federal Circuit Court into line with the Federal Circuit Court's placement in Australia's court hierarchy. So I think the criticism that Senator Watt made in that respect is, is really quite pathetic. Uh, the Federal Circuit Court fee for migration litigants is two and a half times lower than the fee for migration applicants to the AAT. It's lower, Senator Watt. It's lower than the AAT's uh, fee of $1,826. So it is a proportionate and reasonable increase. And as I say, bearing in mind that those who are the most disadvantaged, who have significant financial hardship, are able to make an application for this fee to be completely waived. Of the 25,809 migration lodgements in the Migration and Refugee Division of the AAT, there were some 930 applications for a fee reduction and 490 fee reductions were in fact granted. And it is important to note that in 2014, the Productivity Commission also noted that court fees in Australia are relatively low and recommended increasing the level of cost recovery in most courts. So it's important to recognise that the government has put in place measures to ensure that this change will not prevent access to justice for migration litigants. And I also think it's very important to note, and I do particularly take issue with Senator Watt's characterisation of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia bill, which was passed by the Senate last week. This is incredibly important legislation to provide greater justice, to provide one point of entry, to provide more resources to the unified court and to end the days when we have two courts dealing with family court, family court matters. So I do take particular issue with Senator Watt's comments in that regard. Uh, as I say, uh, I strongly say to senators today to please not support this disallowance motion for the reasons that I've put forward and for the reasons that have been put forward by the government, by um, Senator Dunning on behalf of the government. Thank you. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Griff for tabling this disallowance, which will be supported by the Australian Greens. What the government is proposing to do and what this motion seeks to disallow is to massively increase filing fees for people who wish to litigate, litigate migration matters in the federal circuit court. And when I say massive, I mean an increase of over 400 per cent. Actually, it's an increase of nearly 500 per cent. So maybe exorbitant would be a better description than massive to describe an increase in one case from $690, the current fee, to $3,300, the proposed fee. Now, the Greens hold dear the concept of access to justice, 
and access to justice should not be determined by the depth of somebody's pockets or the thickness of their bankroll. Far too many people are already priced out of Australia's justice system, and the regulations which this motion seeks to disallow would just make things worse, and it will decrease access to justice for the, some of the people in our country who need access to justice most people seeking asylum, refugees <coughs> and holders of temporary visas. Now, these matters are high stakes. They are potentially life-changing matters. I mean, we've got a politicised Home Affairs Department that makes decisions that are massively impactful on people's lives in order to please its political masters. There are countless examples of home affairs decisions made on things like applications for asylum that are overturned in the courts. It happens ultra-regularly in this country, and yet this government wants to make it more expensive for people to seek justice. More expensive. 500 per cent more expensive. And remember, many of these people are people who the government has uh, banned from having work rights in our country and people whom the government has cut off income support from. So basically the government said, you can't work and we're not going to pay to keep you alive. So the burden goes on to those fantastic organisations around the country who support as people seeking asylum and refugees in Australia. These people often have limited English language skills, they're unfamiliar with our judicial system and with our culture. I mean, this is a neoliberal user pays move by the government. The proposal to lift fees is unjust, it is bad law, it has a racist underpinning, it should be disallowed. I thank Senator Green, uh, Senator Griff, for bringing this motion to the chamber, which will be supported. By the Australian Greens. Time for the debate has expired, so the question is that the disallowance motion moved by Senator Griff be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that this allowance motion moved by Senator Griff be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 30. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Firavanti Wells, I understand you'd like to deal with a matter you gave notice of yesterday. You can do it from there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to notice given yesterday, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in my name for today, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Corporation's litigation funding schemes instrument 2020-787. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? It is. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McAllister for today, Tuesday, the 23rd of February 2021, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. I call the clerk. Postpone a postponement notification has been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion number 1025, standing in the name of Senator Antic, from today to 24 February. Are there any other matters? There aren't. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll try and deal with it in the most convenient way. I'll commence with Business of the Senate number three in the name of Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask that Business of the Senate notice of motion number three proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitution Affairs References Committee be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Carr. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we go to 1020 in the name of Senator Billick and others? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1020 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Oh, there is. I'll then come to matter number 1021 in the name of Senator Polly. Senator Urquhart. Apologies. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1021 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. I will come to 1026 in the name of Senator Griff. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1026 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Griff. I move the motion. The question is, oh, Senator Dunham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The government is committed to improving transparency for patients in clinical and financial consent. The 2020-25 National Health Reform Agreement, which took effect from 1 July 2020, includes a commitment to national actions that will further improve transparency of health performance, such as uh, establish a Commonwealth state patient level primary and community health care data sets, um, develop and implement a consistent approach to the collection and use of patient reported measures, build national level evidence and improve care across the health system, and develop and implement enhanced performance uh, reporting across the whole care pathway, including health outcomes and the interface between health and other sectors, such as the disability and aged care sectors. The question is motion number 1026 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to matter number 1027, the name of Senator Fioravanti Wells. Senator Fioravanti Wells. Notice that motion number 1027 relating to requests by the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Firavanti will. I move the motion standing in my name and that of the Deputy Chair, Senator Carr. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to matter 1023 in the name of Senators Steele, John and Faruqi? Senator Steele, John. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1023 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Uh, so there we'll go to matter number 1024. Sorry. Notice I move that so much of standing okay. orders, ironically named, be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Steele, John, to suspend standing orders to allow this motion to be attended to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So, Senator Steele, John, I'll ask you just to move your motion now. I move the motion. The question is motion number 1023 be agreed to. Senator Pratt. I think to make a short statement. Lead is granted for one minute. Labor wants every Australian to be able to get a great affordable education, no matter where they live or their background. The government's Job Ready Graduates package will make it harder and more expensive for thousands of students to go to uni. When Labor was last in government, we uncapped university places and introduced demand-driven funding so that every Australian who worked hard and got good grades could go to uni. Labor calls on the federal government to make, every, uh, to make university affordable for every student. However, we won't be supporting this motion because there are better, more targeted ways to make sure tertiary education is in reach for all Australians. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. Our Job Ready Graduates Package is creating up to 30,000 additional university places in 2021, up to 100,000 places by 2030, and bringing down the cost of degrees in key areas. The cost of agriculture and maths degrees are down 59 per cent, and the cost of nursing and teaching degrees are down 42 per cent. Our intent was to encourage more students into courses where there was the best chance of getting a job. Pleasingly, this is now happening with applications for courses such as agriculture up 16 per cent and applications in health up 15.5 per cent. Our universities are in strong financial positions, declaring a $2.3 billion surplus in 2019. Universities Australia own figures show less than 5 per cent operating loss, uh, 5 op operating loss in 2020, with some universities, like Monash University, recently declaring a surplus of $259 million. The question is that motion number 1023 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1023 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell off the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 41. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators Thorpe and Waters, could I come to matter number 1024, please? The general business notice of motion number 1024 about fracking the Beedaloo Basin be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. I'll ask her to move it and then I'll come to you, Senator McMahon. Thanks, Press. I move the motion. I think uh, our friend was distracted. Sen Senator McMahon. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. As part of the gas-fired recovery, the government provided $13.7 million to extend the CSIRO's Gas Industry Social and Environmental Research Alliance, including in the NT. Stygofauna are small Senator animals Thorpe. found in groundwater systems. Jazeera's research confirms the presence of the same species at widely separated sites across the Cambrian limestone aquifer in the NT. There is nothing to suggest that unconventional gas development will impact on these animals. With industry having world's best practice technologies above the recommend that recommended by the independent scientific inquiry into hydraulic fracturing. The gas industry is vital for the economic development of the NT. The Greens Senator will seize Thorpe. on every opportunity to spread misinformation and fear. Order. The question is that motion number 1024 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is motion number 1024 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell if the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 40. The matter is resolved in the negative. The last matter on the notice paper, Senators, is in the name of Senator Hanson Young, 1022. Mr. President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1022 relating to the arts and entertainment industry be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The JobKeeper uh, package was announced as a temporary measure intended to end uh, in March of 2021. The government's $250 million Creative Economy JobMaker package will continue rolling out through the $75 million Rise Fund. We've announced $60 million of, su of successful Batch 1 recipients and will start seeing the projects commence from this month. The outcome of the second batch of Rise applicants is expected to be announced in late March 2021. Over the next year, government-supported productions, festivals and concerts will fill our stages and our theatres. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. Can I put that again? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <coughs>
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1022 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell if the ayes. Senator Smith, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Pratt, I believe you have a procedural motion to move. I seek leave to move motions 1020 and 1021 and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. So much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motions 1020 and 1021 and that they be determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell if the ayes. Senator Patrick, tell if the noes. And note this motion needs an absolute majority to carry. I'll ask senators to take a seat as much as possible. And I'll call Senator Smith as a teller.
The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Pratt, I'll ask you to move that motion. I move the motions 1020 and 1021. Senator Dunningham. Oh, I, I table statements from the government relating to 1020 and 1021. Senator Roberts. Table a short statement on, on uh, motion 1020. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to table a statement on motion 1020. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I will then put the motion. Those in support of or, uh, people require me to put them separately or together, okay? Together is okay without an objection. Question is the motions number 1020 and 1021 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senators, I thank you. That concludes the discovery of formal business. We will move to the MPI, so I'll let people move around the chamber <coughs> and take their seats. There you go, mate. Thank you. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal will be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Walsh. The Morrison government's failure to address failing wage growth, growing insecurity of work and increasing incidents of wage theft. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask this, the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, first of all, can I congratulate Senator Jess, Jess Walsh uh, for advancing this matter of public importance, because it is indeed a great matter of importance to people right across this country that this government, in its third term, having worn through three prime ministers, has presided over a period in Australian economic history that is absolutely characterised by wage stagnation, by jo growing job insecurity, and what we've come to accept in our parlance is the description of a practice of too many businesses that was until recent times called underpayment. On the watch of this government, the scale of underpayment has been so extensive that it's now known as wage theft in the Australian community. So I really sincerely congratulate Senator Walsh for bringing this matter forward because Australians are feeling this pain. They are feeling it intimately every time they try to balance their budget, every time they try to get ahead. People in insecure work reporting to Senate committees that they have no chance of getting a loan for a car, let alone a house, when their work is constantly described as insecure. This government is presiding over a period of separation between hard-working Australians who want to work, who want to work more hours, who just can't get it, and a government that's looking after people whose wealth is rising by the day as the Australian Stock Exchange rises. And, and this was part of the evidence that we received uh, from per capita. Uh, in the inquiry that is currently underway that deals with critical matters with regard to industrial relations. And this is what per capita said in their opening statement. Despite a strong recovery in asset prices and a falling headline unemployment rate towards the end of 2020, the reality is that Australia's economic recovery from the impact of COVID-19 threatens to take the shape of a K rather than a V. 
That is, some people will do very well having retained their jobs and saved money during the lockdown last year, while others will fall deeper into insecurity and poverty. That's what this government is provide, presiding over, a period of time where it, there is a profound decline in the capacity of Australians to have secure employment, have the benefit of sharing in the economic benefit of Australia as a, a very wealthy nation. And I have to say, I was profoundly impacted by the evidence that we received at our hearing just last Friday. A wonderful AIM working in aged care who talked about the struggle of actually trying to make ends meet, not being able to spend anything in the local business economy, but having to go to big uh, suppliers of foods. She couldn't support her small businesses because she needs to buy materials in bulk or buy no brand or home brand goods, the very cheapest all of the time, because her work is so reduced and so insecure. She also spoke about the ramifications of this job insecurity in terms of her capacity to do her work ethically. She's a carer, a carer by nature and a carer in her paid work, and her care for the elderly in aged care is critical to their health and well-being. And she described a situation where her work is now so precarious, based on arguments that no doubt you'll hear from the others on the other side, that allow efficiency for some businesses. That's what it's described as: efficiency measures, flexibility measures. Every time someone from the LNP says, we need to give businesses flexibility, workers love flexibility, it belies the reality of what they're delivering. Genuine flexibility in the workplace with small businesses absolutely happens. There are great small business employers, but there are also some pretty dodgy ones out there. And what this government has presided over and is attempting to introduce in, in, in their IR bill is more of an attack on job security. We need job security and flexibility. We can't trade one off against the other. Flexibility can't always be loaded up as an advantage to the powerful and used as a tool of abuse of those who are in insecure work. Yet that's what we're seeing. The matter we're discussing today is a matter of public importance because good businesses that need money to move around in their local economy, good business owners who employ their staff, who know the names of their staff, who know the families of their staff, who genuinely provide flexible, great, secure work, they know that their businesses are hanging on a precipice come the end of March with the withdrawal of JobKeeper. More insecurity, stagnation in wages, and for the worst type of employers, a, such a sense of entitlement to take and make profit for themselves that they take the wages of the people they dare to call their employees. They should be more truthful. When you steal someone's wages and they work for nothing for you or work for too little for you, work for wages that are illegal, that is a form of servitude. It's a form of modern-day slavery. And if the government gets its way, we will have worse conditions for Australians. The government's economic agenda reveals their total unwillingness to get wages growing for Australians, their desire to cut working conditions for Australians, and their refusal to legislate to protect Australians from increasing instances of wage theft. Wages in Australia have stagnated under this government. Corporate profits have continued to grow, and the average Australian worker, and that's most of us, they're not getting ahead. They're feeling the pressure. They're feeling the pain. 
and they're expressing concern. And it's manifesting itself in the data around mental health, or better put, mental ill health, anxiety, worry, concern, that they can't see a pathway forward to look after themselves and their family under this Liberal National Party government. Inequality in Australia has grown ever larger, and it's come as a result of the design of this government. In the new monstrous IR bill, which I think is aptly called Work Choices 2.0, we've been taking evidence about what that will do. Let me be clear. It's a massive bill called an omnibus bill. It's got loads and loads and loads of um, schedules in it and proposals for change from this government. And buried deep down in the bottom are a couple of half-decent ideas, but even they are not legislative drawn, legislatively drawn in a way that will improve the lot of Australian workers. I've heard no evidence in the three hearings that we have been allowed to have, because the government only allowed three hearings, and Deputy President, you would know the pace at which those hearings have had to advance, with half-hour slots, with people coming forward to want to give testimony not allowed to speak because it's so contained by the government. Not one of those hearings, not one bit of evidence that we've heard, gives me any hope that there will be wage growth under this government. In fact, this bill, if passed, looks like it will put downward pressure on wages. One of the key issues that prevents wage theft is proper legislation that acts as a dis disincentive for people to steal the wages from the people into who, uh, with whom they enter into a relationship of, of an employer to an employee. We've seen wage theft at a remarkable scale across this country. Very, very sadly, this government, if it passes this legislation, will reduce the protections that are currently in place for Queensland and Victorian workers. This is a matter of importance to the nation, and the truth should be told. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Abetz. Usually in matters of public importance, I'm able to compliment the ALP, at least for rhetoric, if not on facts. But I must say, on this occasion, I can't even compliment the Labor Party on their rhetoric. And clearly, if uh, the honourable senator opposite thinks that the, her contribution just then will assist her in her pre-selection battle with her deputy leader in this place, uh, I'm not sure it's going to cut the mustard. But look, let's have a look at what this uh, motion actually says. And there are three parts to it. The Morrison government's failure, let's be correct, alleged failure, to address falling wage growth. First of all, who determines the wages in this country? It is the Labor Party's beloved Fair Work Commission. It is the one that sets the minimum wages in this country. And so if there is a failure in relation to wages and wages growth, it is the system that the Labor Party itself set up in the first place. This is the Labor Party's creation. So what they're basically saying, if they were honest to the Australian people, is that that which they set up has been an abject failure for the workers of Australia. But let's be clear. Good, sound economic management allows for wages growth whilst inflation is kept at bay. And that is exactly what the Howard government was able to achieve in its period of office. There was real wages growth. But for that, you need good, sound economic management over a lengthy period of time. And it would be fair to say that after the ambush of the economy by Labor, after uh, the Howard government was defeated, it took some time to try to get the economy back on track. And we were achieving that when COVID-19 hit. And so what the Labor Party is trying to suggest to the Australian people, and they're smarter than that, they won't accept that sort of empty rhetoric. They know that there are circumstances which mitigate against the Fair Work Commission increasing wages because 
there has to be that balance between wages and jobs and job creation. The second part of the uh, motion talks about the government's alleged failure in relation to job security. Well, let's be clear. There was a huge spike in unemployment for one reason. We all know it. COVID-19. So let's not try to get cheap political points on the back of a national pandemic. The unemployment rate, thankfully, is coming down, coming down steadily. And what is more, with permanent jobs, with full-time jobs, and that surely should be celebrated. But no, the exact figures to back up that which Labor is asserting in this motion were not presented by the Labor Party in moving this motion. Why? Because there aren't those sort of figures to support the assertion. Indeed, so desperate was the Australian Labor Party in this debate that they had to rely on per capita as somehow providing some credibility to this motion. And then the third limb of the motion talks about increasing incidence of wage theft. Well, excuse me, where was the evidence for that assertion? Completely and utterly absent in the presentation that was made uh, to us. But uh, let's be very clear. Uh, I recall myself saying that underpayment, if it is deliberate, is wages theft. And uh, that is why we as a government have said on numerous occasions that we have zero tolerance when it comes to wage theft. If a business can't run itself without underpaying workers, they should not be in business. But Senator O'Neill, in her contribution, referred us to dodgy businesses that would seek to underpay. Well, I wonder what dodgy businesses might spring to mind who did so in cooperation with a trade union and a trade union leader who now sits in the other place. A trade union leader who used to be in charge of the Australian Workers' Union, Senator Small. Underpaid mushroom uh, workers, cleaners, builders, and we will rem see what happens from the um, Registered Organisations Commission investigation in relation to the union itself. But talk about dodgy, I would have thought that would be one area that the Australian Labor Party would not seek to traverse. But the reason, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Labor Party refused to present figures to us is that if figures were to be presented, they would be telling us that the Fair Work Ombudsman is taking strong action on behalf of workers. So in 2019-20, over 100, or exactly $123 million was recovered, a record of amount of money for underpaid workers, which is more than five times the money recovered by the agency during Labor's last full year in office. Because we as a government resource the Fair Work Ombudsman to be able to pursue this matter and get wage justice for the workers of Australia. And this momentum is continuing in the first six months of 2020-21. The Fair Work Ombudsman recovered almost $80 million for over 31,000 employees, filed 37 litigations and entered into 12 enforceable undertakings. These are the facts. These are indicators that we, as a coalition government, are concerned to ensure that a worker who is entitled to appropriate wages receives those appropriate wages. No, that none of this funny money dealing that uh, Mr Shorten from the other place engaged in whilst he was a, a secretary of the Australian Workers' Union. And look, if the majority of the Australian workforce were actually to believe the mantra of the Labor Party, one suspects we would not be in office on this side. But they take a balanced, sensible approach, recognising, one, there is an independent arbiter for our wages in this country, namely the Fair Work Commission, and it does its job. Sometimes workers get 
more than bosses want. Sometimes workers get less than the workers want. And that is the role of an umpire, to try to make a decision which is fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. Because we all know that if wages are set too high, it will cost jobs. And therefore, there is that important balance that is required. That is something which the Fair Work Commission seeks to do to the very best of its ability. And that is why we have so many people uh, in employment gainfully employed and being able to uh, sustain themselves in, in work. But the Australian Labor Party, in their submission before us, not a single alternative what Labor would do other than to oppose the bill that is currently before us. And what does that bill seek to do for the first time ever deal with the issue of, you've guessed it, wages theft, to actually criminalise it. In the years of Labor, under Bob Hawke and Paul, uh, Ms. Mrs Hawke and Keating, and then under Rudd, Gillard Rudd, did the Labor Party ever see it necessary to try to ensure that it could be criminalised in a manner that would dissuade bosses from doing so? No, they didn't do anything. Who's it been left up to? Yet again, the coalition to get a fair and balanced workplace. The Australian people have voted previously, and I can reassure them that this is a government committed to fair, balanced workplace relations, ensuring that they have the dignity, the self-esteem, the mental and physical health benefits of employment. They are the things that we want to see. We, on this side, see employment not only as an economic good but an overwhelming social good as well. And that is why you have to have that balance, that sensible balance, and that is where we on this side are very comfortable in looking after both the worker and the employer. Without an employer, there'd be no employees. We need the balance, and that is what we as a government are providing. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Walsh for bringing this matter of public importance to the Senate. Over the last 40 years, Australia has gone from being one of the most egalitarian countries in the Western capitalist world to one of the most severely unequal and one dominated by business interests. Key to the growth of inequality and precarity in Australia has been decades of neoliberal industrial relations policy designed to smash the power of organised labour and reorient workplace organisation in favour of maximising gains from, for employers and giving them more flexibility to hire and fire workers. It's not so much that the Morrison government is trying and failing to address stagnant wages the dominance of insecure work and the scourge of wage theft. They simply choose not to. They have no intention of winding back the systems that entrench poverty, inequality and precarity for workers to the benefit of corporations and billionaires. In fact, they're doing the opposite. 1.2 million people are locked out of work and then there are others who are locked in poverty on job, seeker, on job keeper. This government's core constituency is big business, they're big donors, and things are going pretty well for them. Before the pandemic, wage growth was stagnant, jobs were increasingly insecure, and wage theft was at epidemic levels. Since COVID reared its head, things have gone even worse. The labor share of national income has fallen from 50% for the first time since 1959, and corporate profits have soared. Wage growth has fallen to record lows and wages have declined in real terms. And as lockdowns have ended and businesses have begun to reopen, the proportion of insecure jobs has exploded. This government has shown no interest um, in genuinely tackling wage theft. The most important and effective wage theft deterrence, such as making sure that wage thieves know they may be caught out and increasing the powers and resourcing of regulators um, to investigate claims and enforce the law don't seem to be on the agenda at all. 
40 years of marketization, deregulation, privatization, government outsourcing, and good old-fashioned union busting have created an economy designed to funnel wealth upwards and leave workers with the scraps. Suppressed wage growth, the expansion of insecure work, and pernicious increasing, increasing wage theft are symptoms of a business-oriented system working precisely for the big end of town. Until this government either undergoes a fundamental shift in its political orientation or is kicked out, nothing will change. They need to be given the boot. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And then I too thank Senator Walsh for putting forward this MPI because I think it does go to the fundamental failure of this government and it does sum up their terrible record over seven years. And that record is a failure to address wage growth. It is a failure to address the growing insecurity of work and it is a fail failure to deal with the increasing incidence of wage theft. Uh, and indeed, when you look at their record, it is a sad record after seven years of this LNP government. And I wanted to consider that in detail because I think there is a lot of detail to understand when we're looking at the record of this government over the last seven years when it comes to these issues. But when it comes to wages growth, according to the OECD, uh, and I know Western Australian Liberal Senators have a lot of faith in the OECD at the moment. Since elected in 2013, real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. So that's their record after seven years in government. For wage growth in 2019, so this was before the pandemic hit, Australia ranked third last out of 35 countries for wage growth. So even in the year before the pandemic hit, the record of this government was still a terrible one. So it has been a miserable seven years for Australian workers and their families, and particularly for those looking to get ahead and build a better future for themselves. And sadly, their record in insecure work is no better. The LNP's record, even pre the pandemic, has seen insecure work skyrocket. And the, the travels I do, which is particularly through regional Queensland, you come across so many people who have been impacted by the use of labour hire in their industry. Uh, it is absolutely rampant at the moment. Uh, and you talk, to, you talk to people who are working side by side, doing the same work, but one worker is earning 30 to 40 per cent less than their permanent counterparts next door. And we exposed some of this during the Senate hearings uh, into the bill put forward by the government as well. So ultimately, the use of labour hire that I've observed through regional Queensland, it is actually being used to also drive down the wages and conditions of all workers. That's the ultimate game of those who want to bring it in. They want to drive down the wages and conditions of all workers. And when it comes to wage theft, we have a federal government that has done nothing for seven years. Uh, Senator Abetz tried to say they have zero tolerance. Uh, what he fails to talk about is what they've done for seven years. They've been in power for seven years. He highlighted some of the recovery they've made. Well, instead of trying to recover money, why don't you try and stop it? That's actually the power of the government. You have the ability to do things to stop this from happening, yet they add none of that and have no record they can point to after seven years, despite so many examples that have come before us. 7-11, uh, uh, which was just an outrageous attack on the workers uh, that were in the employ of that company. And now as Australians want to look forward uh, and emerge from the pandemic in a stronger position, something to be optimistic about the future, the government offer up more of the same. Their IR, IR changes will undermine the paying conditions of workers. It does little to address the rampant use of labour hire uh, that we've seen that is so prevalent through so many parts of Australia, but particularly through my experiences in regional Queensland. It does nothing to create secure jobs with decent pay. Uh, what could be more important for Australian families at the moment? Uh, to rebuild after being impacted by a pandemic, to have a secure job with decent pay, uh, something that they can actually plan for the future on, yet this government continues to offer more insecure work uh, and, more, and no changes that are going to lead to a better pay for those Australians. And it dry, contain, consigns more Australians to more years of the same with more casualisation and insecure work. And their proposals on wage theft are weak. 
when you compare to what some of the state Labor governments have been doing to outlaw uh, wage theft. They have been slow to move, despite all the evidence that is being presented, and when they do, it is still weak. So a government with a shocking record, a shocking record when it comes to wage growth, a shocking record when it comes to insecure work, and a shocking record when it comes to wage theft. And after seven years, they are offering no solutions to actually fix up these problems. The best they can do is more of the same. And there's no doubt that the Australian people are looking for an alternative, and they deserve so much better on these issues than what their federal government has put up so far. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I'm here on behalf of a government that has taken proactive and decisive measures to help Australians. We're focused on helping the economy grow jobs, and having delivered one and a half million new jobs prior to the onset of the pandemic, under our responsible economic management, 93 per cent of those jobs are already back. We've sought to boost wages for Australians through tax cuts delivered to more than one, uh, sorry, one million businesses in Australia and 11 million hard-working Australians already seeing more money in their pocket as a result of the initiatives that this government has led. We have sought to enhance productivity uh, through measures like the tax carryback and instant asset write-off. But we aren't done yet, Mr Acting Deputy President, because we have got before this chamber a suite of sensible, measured and incremental reforms that will seek to provide people with certainty, enable casual workers to convert to full-time employment, uh, we have sought to articulate uh, the, the work that the government is doing with respect to wage theft and enhancing the protections that vulnerable Australians uh, would be protected by. Instead, rather than those reforms already putting more money into the pockets of Australians and rather than those additional protections already being in place, we are being held back by the Labor Party who sit opposite. Our approach to this has been informed by extensive collaboration with both industry employers and unions, but instead we've seen the Labor Party seek to turn workplaces into political backgrounds whilst the Leader of the Opposition is focused only on his tenuous grasp on his job rather than the jobs of those out in the community. The government's already demonstrated that we're willing to work with this chamber and work with the crossbench by removing the Section 189 amendment. We've done this because we see five key areas of reform that will assist Australians. But by attempting to block this, Labor is actually standing between Australians and wage growth, Australians and wage theft protection, and Australians and increased, increased job security through a more prosperous economy. Labor's industrial policies were overwhelmingly rejected at the last election under the then leader Bill Shorten. And we're simply seeing this recycled now by the current Leader of the Opposition. Labor's proposed industry laws reveal who really calls the shots on that side of the chamber, and the only job they seem focused on is that of the Leader of the Opposition. This government has made it clear that we have zero tolerance for employees being underpaid and makes no exception for any employer who seeks to exploit vulnerable Australians. The government has committed to decisive action with $160 million to the Fair Work Ombudsman, as Senator Abetz clearly articulated, and has increased the penalties for employers by an up to tenfold increase. So the only thing stopping a tenfold increase in the penalties for employers that do the wrong thing is those opposite. Undertaking reforms to enforce our current and compliance and enforcement regime with the current Act is also part of this contemplated reform. But Labor clearly doesn't believe that those, wages, sorry, those workers who are underpaid need and deserve better, better wage protection, because they have seen them as a necessary sacrifice, throwing them under the bus by, by blocking this bill. They made this blatantly obvious in the past as well, when they advocated to scrap uh, the Australian Building and Construction Commission. They have also uh, uh, carefully ignored the fact that the ABCC has already returned millions of dollars to employees since it was reintroduced by the coalition government in 2016. The Fair Work Ombudsman continues to take decisive action on behalf of workers despite the unprecedented effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. $123 million re-delivered into the, into the pockets of workers, five times more money 
than that same agency was able to recover under the previous Labor government. The Fair Work Ombudsman has delivered 952 compliance notices, a 250 per cent increase on the same number of compliance notices issued in 2018-19, filed more than double the number of court cases against employers who have done the wrong thing, secured 163 per cent more court ordered Court ordered penalties, issued 603 infringement notices, and, and finally, $56.8 million in back payments for workers. But we are not done yet, Mr Acting Deputy President, but we are being held back by the intransigence of those opposite, who clearly, from their track record of opposing the ABCC and indeed the Registered Organisations Commission, oppose not only the rule of law, but also shredding. Uh, the, the absolute iron grip that the union movement has uh, over, over labour relations from their perspective. What proposals have we heard from those opposite in this chamber tonight that would seek to improve worker uh, entitlements and protections? We've heard nothing, Mr Acting Deputy President. In fact, all we've heard from those opposite is a proposal to take $153 a week from the pockets of casual workers across this country, a tax on businesses uh, and, and, and nothing else. Nothing else. In opposing these changes, the Labor Party have further signalled that they do not have any intention to streamline wage recovery. We have seen them uh, with reports suggesting that underpaid employees are merely collateral damage to a broader approach that seeks to em em emphasise uh, that the, the, the Leader of the Opposition uh, holds his job. They have also stood between uh, workers in Australia and a quicker enterprise agreement approval process, where we know that enterprise agreements in this country deliver up to 40 per cent more than award wages into the pockets of Australians. 40 per cent more into the pockets of Australians. And now the Labor Party still oppose that. If that's not wage growth, Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't know what is. But let's talk a little around flexibility that those opposite say is this terrible, terrible premise. The reforms that this government has proposed would allow 30 per cent of the part-time employees in the retail sector and 40 per cent of part-time employees in the accommodation and food services sector to work more hours, work more hours but with the protections of being permanent employees and with the leave entitlements associated. But no, the Labor Party would rather that those hours go to workers under more flexible arrangements, such as casual employment. So it's the Labor Party that stands between part-time permanent employees being able to work more hours with more protection and, indeed, entrenching casual employment at the heart of the Australian economy. As something that's very close to my heart as the Western Australian representative, we've also sought to create job opportunities with uh, project certainty for mega uh, projects on greenfield sites, allowing eight year or up to eight year uh, agreements to be struck. No, the Labor Party stand between more investment dollars generating more jobs for Western Australians and Australians more broadly, whereas this government, this government is about getting more jobs for more Australians. Stronger conversion rights for casuals is central to the reforms that this government has offered before this chamber. But Labor is saying that I would rather have more casuals remain uh, even if they would prefer permanent employment. The mechanisms that this bill articulates provide a clear and consistent pathway for any casual worker, having served the requisite notice, uh, so the requisite time period, to, to convert that employment to permanent employment. It is a right that this bill confers. So what holds that back? opposition from the Labor Party. So the only side, it seems to me, Mr Acting Deputy President, who is proposing to cut wages, to cut uh, job security and to cost jobs in the Australian economy is, in fact, the Labor Party. In true Labor fashion, their solution to all problems is simply to raise taxes. And we saw this going into the last election with $387 billion worth of new taxes proposed. We've seen it recently with this $20 billion hit to business uh, or, or a pay cut for casual workers of $153 a week. So, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, 
If we're serious in this place about putting more money into the pockets of Australian workers, if we're serious about affording Australians the improved job security that comes with a healthy economy, if we're serious about tackling wage theft and getting uh, wage underpayments into the pockets of Australians in a more efficient and streamlined process, then honourable senators in this place will get behind these important reforms and get the job done. That's what the people who's of Australia who sent us here sent us here to do. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. This motion is one of the least self-aware that I've seen out of the Labor Party. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the median wage has not increased in real terms over the last 30 years, after adjusting for dramatic increases in the cost of housing, health care and education. And yet Australia's gross domestic product per capita has increased over that period from $13,600 to $65,400 in real terms, as are all my figures today. Gross domestic product is up by a factor of five, and the wages of everyday Australians have not increased. Where's the money gone? Average wages for Australians at the upper end of the scale have seen an increase of 50 per cent, and at the very top end, the increase is over 100 per cent. A graph of our median and average wages over time is untroubled by changes in government. Liberal, National, Labor, Greens, it makes no difference. Workers just keep going backwards. Wages as a share of GDP, gross domestic product, have fallen from $116 billion to $94 billion over 30 years. The share of our gross domestic, gross domestic product being paid to Australian workers is at an all-time low. Yet corporate profits have grown from $20 billion to $120 billion, six times. Globalist economics has crushed the wages of everyday Australians and deposited the spoils from an expanding economy into the pockets of the big end of town in salaries, bonuses and dividends. Globalist free trade agreements have seen more than one million high-paid, skilled manufacturing and heavy industry jobs moved overseas. Labor is a big fan of globalism, voting in favour of every one of these free trade agreements. Recently, the Senate voted for a UN funding bill to direct money into funding economic development in countries with which we have a free trade agreement. This facilitates increases in their productive capacity to take yet more Australian jobs. One nation were the only party to oppose the funding bill. The Labor Party voted in favour, in favour of losing yet more jobs overseas. Now, COVID restrictions have had a role to play as well. The government's COVID restrictions measures have moved consumer spending away from small businesses who employ everyday Australians and moved those jobs to corporate retailers who pay minimum wage. Online growth has gone to Amazon, owned by the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos. Social media are calling the COVID restrictions on businesses a war on capitalism. It's no such thing. Corporate Australia, the biggest crony capitalists, have record sales, record profits and have paid higher dividends and bonuses. As a result, of government COVID restrict coronavirus restrictions and measures, the world's 400 richest people have increased their wealth by $1 trillion. Much of this new wealth is money that was once spent in local communities, in local hardware stores, community supermarkets, butchers and grocers. This was money that held up real wages paid by local businesses to their loyal staff. Now those businesses have been forced to close or to sack workers. So the real outcome from coronavirus measures has been the largest transference of wealth from small business to foreign-owned or, or controlled corporations in Australian history. We expect this sort of thing from the globalist Liberal Party and their sell-out sidekicks and nationals. Yet this has been brought to you by Labor in Queensland, Labor in Western Australia and Labor in Victoria. Almost every government measure during the COVID period has been waved through the Senate by the Labor Party, working in conjunction with the Liberals and Nationals. Labor don't get to complain now. They should have seen this coming. The only thing that was not in this profligate spending was a permanent increase in job seeker. The constant pressure from one nation in this place and directly with the government across many years has today had a result. One nation will continue to stand up for everyday Australians. 
The destruction of wages and entitlements of Australian workers has many other causes. At the heart of the problem is supply and demand for workers. At the same time that Australia is sending jobs overseas, we're importing workers. Over the last 30 years, Australia has added 10 million new Australians. While many of these do not go into the productive economy, the bottom line is simple. We're importing workers for jobs that have already been exported to lower cost destinations, especially China. There are more workers than jobs, and that can only have the effect of reducing wages. Labor defend Australia's high immigration rate and suggest one nation are racist for wanting a reduction in the rate of arrivals. The use of the word racist means they have no argument to counter us. All one nation are doing is to stand up for everyday Australians who will never get a decent pay rise as long as the government keeps bringing in more new arrivals than there are jobs. The Rudd Labor government and the Gillard Rudd Labor Greens government increased permanent migration from 160,000 in 2007 to 205,000 in 2013. Labor cannot pretend to care about workers when it was Labor that initiated the largest spike in arrivals in the last 30 years. The other issue around the stagnation on, on real wages is foreign temporary workers. The Senate inquiry into temporary work visas found temporary migrant workers experienced widespread wage theft and gross violations of Australian minimum work standards, including failure to pay even minimum wages, long work hours and lack of health and safety training, leading to workplace injuries. Temporary work visas holders are being exploited to drive down wages and conditions. Indeed, Bill Shorten, as minister, set the record for temporary work visas in this country, a record that Labor still holds. And I don't hear Labor complaining about this. This may be because their beloved free trade agreement facilitate foreign workers. The Indonesian free trade agreement, section 12.9, removes labour market testing and allows additional contract workers across 400 skilled occupations. It allows for 4,000 temporary working holiday maker visas per year who are highly exploited because they're, they're deported if they lose their job. Wage theft is not entirely restricted to vulnerable foreign workers, although it does account for most of the cases. The problem of falling real wages, job insecurity and wages theft that Senator Walsh talk, mentions in this motion results from Labor Party policies. One Nation is accused of wanting to wind the clock back. Well, on this issue, we do want to wind the clock back, back to when workers got a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. We need to, put, need to start putting Australia and Australians first, back to when workers settled here, became Australian Senator citizens Roberts, and contributed to the future of our marvellous country. expired. Senator Sheldon. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it used to be said that in life there was only two constants, death and taxes. But under the Morrison government, the Australian worker must deal with three constraints and three constants, falling wages, insecure work and wage theft. These three crises of the Australian labour market are not just holding Australian workers, they're also holding the Australian economy back. Wage growth has reached its slowest pace since the Depression of the 1930s. The most recent September quarter, wages grew as little as 0.1 per cent. Things have become so desperate that the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Philip Lowe, has begun calling it a crisis in wage growth, calling on workers to start demanding pay rises from their employers. Even before the pandemic, the pace of insecure work in Australia has been rising, and since COVID-19, the pace of insecure work has accelerated rapidly. For example, 60 per cent of all new wage jobs created since May last year were casual jobs. This is the biggest increase in casual employment in Australia's history. Three quarters of all new jobs were part-time in nature, and insecure work such as our own account contracts and gig work, dominated the growth in jobs considered self-employed. And then we come to wage theft. PwC estimates that $1.35 billion in wages are stolen or unpaid every year. And Australian Industry Super Australia estimates that as much as $6 billion in superannuation is not paid, affecting one in three Australian workers. Under the inaction of the Morrison government, Australian workers must deal with insecure work, with falling wages and wage theft. Behind these facts and figures are human stories and real workers that have been affected. 
workers like Diego. Since coming from Brazil three years ago, Diego has been working for a food delivery, delivery company called Deliveroo, and he was often paid below the minimum wage. Working almost every day of the week, delivering food to people's doorstops, to support his wife and 11-month-old daughter, Diego has become the face of the heartless way these companies try to employ their workers. In the midst of the global pandemic, at a time of an unprecedented increase in demand for food delivery, delivery sacked Diego with practically no warning, all because he was 10 minutes late with an order. In the midst of a pandemic, with a wife and daughter to support, interviewed in the a on the ABC, Diego spoke of his sacking, and I quote, it was frustrating, as I'd been with them for years and they just didn't care what I had to say. I mentioned all of my personal problems, my loss of income, my, my wife and 11-month-old daughter, who I had to take care of, but they just don't care. And backed by his union, the Transport Workers' Union, Diego has taken Deliveroo to the court over his unfair dismissal. His challenge is a major test case for the gig economy in Australia. Not one this government's funding. When they fund cases against casual workers that get rights in the mining industry and back big labour hire companies and they back big miners, of course they intervene in those cases, but they don't intervene in the cases for real people that are really struggling, that deserve to have rights in this economy. Of course, I eagerly await the case. And I certainly won't be holding my breath waiting for the government to act. Because the workers in food delivery need outcomes now. A recent survey of riders and drivers by the TWU and the Drivers' Riders Alliance revealed the distressing nature of the industry. An average hourly rate of little more than $10 an hour. Almost two-thirds felt they'd been unfairly treated by a company without a chance to defend themselves. More than a third have been injured on the job, with almost 80 per cent of those injured received no support of any kind from their company. And we know this is dangerous work, and we know that we've had five people that have been killed in a matter of only a few months, and all of them leave behind friends and family. Loved ones who deserve better than to lose their father, their brother, son or a friend to an industry that pays critically low rates of pay and incentivises people to work, to drive and ride dangerously just to be able to put food on the table. And of course, when you, we're just you know, having this debate about what should happen with the media and what sort of arrangements we should have. You know, some are calling it the Murdoch, uh, you know, the Murdoch uh, tax. But what others are calling it also is the fact that they're prepared to take up this government a case for Murdoch against Facebook, the gig economy, tech companies, but they're not prepared to take cases up for hard-working people in this country that are literally dying at the hands of these companies, that are being ripped off by these companies. Now, rather than just handing money over to firms in the hope that they'll keep journalism going and taking on the big tech companies, which you know people pounding their chest in the last few days. How about you pound your chest for Didi Frede, Zhen Xiu Chen, Xiao Qi Xin, Bijou Paul, Paul, and Ike Wong, all of which died because they did not have the protections against those same monoliths and the same type of corporations that you failed to take to account. And hearing the uh, Minister Porter in the House yesterday and seeing the responses to questions asked about Deliveroo and saying to give these workers minimum wage, to give them rights to collectively bargain, that those things are just too complicated. This is, this is the Attorney General has responsibility for workplace relations and he says someone getting paid half the minimum wage is too complicated for him and government to work out? Well, it says it all. It's not too complicated. It's just that they've simply taken the side of those Bing monoliths 
and made a decision, my, my uh, card is always going to be in their card is always going to be in my pocket. It's quite clear that when these companies are supported in these sorts of actions, in lack of action to protect these workers, that people pay the price. And these companies are literally killing people in the food delivery industry. These companies are literally maiming people in the food delivery industry. There has been report after report about what occurs when you incentivise payments for companies and for workers in the way that this, these companies are, when you do not give them a minimum wage, an appropriate wage to be able to sustain their families, that they drive like hell and they put themselves at risk, because it's a choice between doing that or not eating, doing that or not providing for your daughter or your partner or your family. Now, we clearly need a government that turns around and says that all workers are important, the economy is important, that people have the capacity to spend, that business doing the right thing is more important than business doing the wrong thing. The companies that operate in competition with the gig economy, who operate and pay decent wages, who actually have enterprise bargaining agreements, and it might be surprising to some on the other side that the enterprise bargaining agreements that are with unions are at better rates of pay, at better conditions. People have more of a voice. There's more consultation in negotiations for agreements. But that's, too in, that's, that's inconvenient for those on the opposite side to actually recognise that, because that's been the strength of enterprise bargaining agreements. What the weakness is is the fact that there's laws in here that does not allow proper negotiation to take place. And it means the laws that have been proposed by this government will further exasperate the imbalance of bargaining right through the middle of a pandemic. Now, if you wanted any more starker example of where this country uh, is getting it wrong and this government's got it so wrong, and that is when we say to gig workers that they don't count, when we say to their loved ones that they don't count, when we say to those that have lost those in their families that they don't count. When we say that you can be paid less than minimum wage, it's too complicated to fix. You know, I deal with a lot of employers in my previous life, and I tell you what, they don't think that it doesn't count. They think it does count for something, and you should think that way too. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we'll start by, uh, by recognising um, uh, the, the, the merit in Senator Sheldon bringing those complaints to the chamber and the need for those to, to be properly uh, investigated. Uh, 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 people, mis if they are mistreated by, by large companies or small companies, uh, deserve justice. And, and uh, 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 I would note that, that there's been significant change in uh, employment markets or, I suppose, work arrangements with the rise of companies like Deliveroo and Uber and the like. And it's probably not unusual that, therefore, our, our laws might be lagging some of those developments. We should look at those things, and that's why we've got a, an inquiry on at the moment to, to investigate. I'm not so sure that Senator Sheldon himself has the solutions just yet. I know he only had a brief contribution, but I'm not sure he necessarily heard those. It's one thing to say it's simple, and, uh, and it's not as complicated as the minister says, but, but uh, I've been speaking to, to a few uh, Uber drivers, and, uh, and all the main ones we interact with. Don't really, we don't have Deliveroo in Rockhampton. I don't really get that. But uh, um, and, and you know, there is actually some of them really do like the flexibility they get. So I'm not so sure they want to go to a regulated, centralised, unionised environment just yet. So I, I will very much, through that inquiry, make sure that the workers are front and centre of what this parliament should do. Um, but returning to the actual uh, matter of uh, public interest before us here today, um, uh, um, I, I think it's quite an achievement from the Labor Party. I, I believe they've uh, got a motion here of about 19 words. I had it at, and they criticised the Morrison government for falling wage growth, uh, for lack of action on on wage theft, and uh, and also for. Uh, increasing the amount of insecure work. And it's quite an achievement that in just 20-odd words the Labor Party have able to squeeze in three 
misleading statements and sometimes flat out wrong statements. So, in, in, in the uh, case that the first one of falling wages growth, well, uh, that's just not true. It's just not true. Wages have not been falling. In fact, over the time of the coalition government, uh, our real wages, that is after inflation, uh, nominal wages have gone up even more, but that's not a fair comparison. Real wages, when you take out the effects of inflation, have gone up 0.7 per cent a year uh, during the coalition government, and that's actually just, just slightly above the 20-year average of 0.6 per cent a year. So uh, there's definitely not a falling wages. Now, of course, we'd like those wages to be growing higher and, and, and better than they have been. Um, we do have an issue with productivity growth as a nation. That is something that must be focused on, and that's why we want to lower taxes, which have been opposed by the Labor Party. It's why we want, we're, we're, we're providing more tax incentives for capital accumulation uh, through the instant asset write-off changes. They've been very successful. And it's, of course, why we're reforming the overall industrial relations scheme too. This motion also accuses the coalition government of not acting on wage theft. Now, I don't have time. I'm trying to spend a minute, basically, uh, on each of the Labor Party's misleading, three misleading statements. So I don't have time to go through all of the action that the Commonwealth government has taken, but I believe we put aside $160 million uh, towards increased uh, compliance uh, of uh, uh, people engaging in wage theft. We are going to create a new criminal offence for dishonest and systematic underpayments of one or more employees with a maximum penalty of four years. We'll also be increasing civil penalties as well and, and prohibiting employers from advertising jobs with pay rates below the minimum wage. We have seen some shocking examples of underpayments of effectively wage theft in recent times, and in response to those, the Commonwealth Government has and will continue uh, to take action. And finally, um, on the idea that uh, insecure work is increasing, uh, I think Senator Sheldon was quoting that last year somewhere, somewhere around 60 per cent of the jobs are part time. Well, Maybe news to Senator Sheldon, we were in a global pandemic. There was a global pandemic going on. And, and it makes sense that in the time of that uncertainty, the global uncertainty, that perhaps there were going to be a lot of companies, a lot of businesses not offering full-time jobs. Uh, because obviously when you offer a full-time job, you're making a commitment over a number of years and you'd want a fairly certain economic environment to make such a commitment. So it's not at all unusual that in times of global uncertainty that of the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years, at least in terms of this health issue of a pandemic, there would be an increase in the proportion of jobs going to part-time. But in good news, the recent Labor false figures, which I don't think Senator Sheldon concentrated on, 60,000 full-time jobs were created in the last month's employment data. 60,000 full-time jobs. That is a massive amount and, and gives us hope for the future. Thank you, Senator Canavan. So the time for this discussion has expired. Um, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Those are listed on page four of today's order of business. We'll start with documents presented by the president, one and two. No one seeking. Senator Seward. No, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. On both those documents, Senator Seward? On both of them, yes, please. Thank you. And we now move to government documents, three, four and five. Senator Brown? No. No, Senator Seward. So, do you want to go? Senator McCarthy. Uh, um, Madam Deputy President, I'd just like to note um, documents three, four, and five, and ask that my comments be continue. Thank you. Continue Thank you. Remarks. Thank leave you. Granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. We, okay. So that concludes the documents. Um, I'll now move to <coughs> tabling and consideration of committee reports. Um, Senator McGrath. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's first report of 2021 concerning the Australian War Memorial Development Project. Thank you. And I note Senator Steeljohn wishes to speak. Senator Steeljohn. I, I take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McGrath. I don't have anything else. No. I believe there's an NDIS minister. I do. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I present the government's response to the final report of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme on its inquiry into the NDIS planning and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. 
Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Now I know Senator Stilljohn wants the call and Senator Brown. Yep, so we'll go to Senator Brown and then Senator Stilljohn. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President and Senator Stilljohn. I rise to take note of the government response to the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS final report of the committee's inquiry into planning. When the committee released its final report, we made 42 recommendations, all of which were aimed at improving the planning process from a participant's perspective. The committee conducted this inquiry in response to years of advocacy from participants, carers, supporters, advocates and groups in the sector who were calling for reform. Of those recommendations, the government has chosen to support nine in principle, uh, 17 in support and then note 16 remaining recommendations. In this inquiry, the committee published 157 submissions and conducted 14 public hearings. As every NDIS participant knows, NDIS planning, along with access, is the primary point at which participants interact with the scheme. So it goes without saying that a good planning process can change life for the better. And it's pleasing to note that the government's recognition of the importance of providing participants to information about their plans prior to their planning meeting. Now, during the inquiry, Madam Deputy President, the committee received extensive evidence about the many inconsistencies in the planning process and plan funding. Some plans did not include funded supports because, in the view of the planner or agency, the participants had access to informal supports, and, and informal supports essentially means carers supporting the participant, because um, that is essentially what the NDIS were falling back on, that, that a participant <coughs> was going to be assisted by members of their family. The committee also heard of discrepancies in funding and support between siblings with the same disability type. It is heartening that the government acknowledges the important role the NDIA has in, in assisting families and carers of people with disability in the planning process. And this is an issue that has uh, been ongoing for a very, very long time. However, the committee's recommendation that caregivers be provided with written information about the types of support that the NDIS uh, can fund remains very, very important. Participants and their advocates have long advocated for specialist planners for participants who are hospitalised to assist with a smooth transition. The government's support of this recommendation is welcome. These transitions and other similar experiences can create un uncertainty and gaps in support for people with disability. It is, it is essential that various levels of governments and their agencies work together to support some of our most vulnerable citizens. The appointment of 24 health liaison officers nationally is a good first step towards achieving this. Many participants in the NDIS have complex needs and need to access the complex sports needs pathway. The committee recommended that the NDIA publish more information about this pathway, including the information on who is eligible and how the NDIA defines the term complex sport support needs. I note that the NDIA is currently undertaking a review of the pathway, but would remind government and the agency the more information provided to participants and, support and supporters and advocates, the better. Clear advice and information are central to the planning uh, process succeeding, and this was um, throughout the inquiry and one of the central messages that we received uh, around information and clear advice. And it's very, and it's very clear that that advice that uh, participants and um, their families are receiving is not clear and not consistent. So work towards ensuring that, that, that it is clear and consistent is welcomed. Another key element is ensuring that 
there is trust in the decision making of the agency in the resourcing and transparency of the appeals process. The need for many of these appeals arise because participants never meet with the NDI delegate who makes the decision on their plan. For too long, the NDIA was slow to respond to appeals lodged with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Recent improvements are welcome, but the priority of resourcing this task must be maintained. Leaving NDIS participants living with the uncertainty is not good enough and must be addressed by the agency. During our inquiry, we also heard about the impact that planning errors had on participants. Initial plans and review have often been undertaken by a planner without any knowledge of the participant's disability. And this is an ongoing issue. And the stories of planners relying on search engines while conducting meetings with particip participants are legend. In responding to the many of the recommendations in this review, the government notes recent announcements or reviews. But as we all know, an announcement does not mean that the issue has been resolved. Announcements do not provide us with hope and provide us with an acknowledgement that the government has recognised the need to address the issue. One of the announcements that the government is relying on in its response to this report is their recent commitment to the introduction of independent assessments. The government's determination to now rely on these assessments has already caused a great deal of alarm and concern in the disability community. This supposed reform was announced without adequate consultation and consideration of the needs of NDIS participants. That is why the Joint Standing Committee on NDIS is already conducting a separate inquiry into independent assessments. There are roughly 440,000 people with disability on the NDIS. The rollout of independent assessment is a radical plan. You can't help but wonder if the sole aim of this radical plan is cost-cutting. They have, all, they have all have to prove that they have a disability and they have been assessed as being eligible to participate in the scheme. What the government is now proposing is that these 440,000 participants that effectively have to re-qualify for the scheme. In the words of the Shadow Minister for the NDIS, people with disability are effectively being asked to re-audition for the same money they are already getting to a complete stranger, not to the, speci the medical specialist that they have been um, used to over, over, over the years or already received um, medical um, reports from, but from a panel of, people, of medical people that they need to select from. Now, we know they've had to convince a range of medical. They've already had to convince a range of medical and allied health professionals and, and, and NDIS officials that they're eligible for the NDIS. The rollout of in, independent assessment is a radical plan, and you have to wonder because I can tell you right now, advocates and participants are wondering whether this is not just a way of uh, cost cutting cutting people's plans. The reality is this reform is based on shaky evidence and doesn't necessarily promise a fix for the problems with consistency and fairness in planning that's outlined in this report. They say, sorry, the government says that the, there's a new approach for planning which will be underpinned by the introduction of independent assessments later in 2021. Well, advocates and participants are really very unsure about, um, at best, very unsure about how this process is going to work. At worst, at worst, believe that this is a way to cut their support, and but also add stress to the um, planning process. It is stressful, and you can imagine, if you had to go through it, how stressful it would be to be able to to talk to somebody, and at the moment perhaps talk to somebody that doesn't even understand anything about your disability, doesn't understand anything about your disability or the supports that you need. And here we have the government 
introducing inter independent assessments and lauding it as some sort of uh, reform that's going to fix the issue around having fully costed detailed draft plans. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because they don't talk to participants or advocates Thank or you, family Senator members. Brown. Your time has expired. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Oh, yes, I am. I've, I've, yes. Yes. yes, please. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, I think that now takes us Senator Thorpe, sorry. Uh, Deputy President, uh, I was wondering if we could go back to 14 of uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. We're still there, Senator Thorpe. Uh, okay. Uh, could I seek leave to make a statement? Uh, which document were you seeking to speak on? The War Memorial. Yes, you don't need leave because we're in this part, so yeah. Far away. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, first report of 2021 on the Australian War Memorial Development Project. My great-great-grandfather fought and died for this country. He uh, was awarded a military medal in World War I. Uh, and he was never to return. He's still buried overseas. Uh, he not only uh, was oppressed in his own country, he then went to fight for the, for the same country that oppressed him uh, and sent him and our family uh, onto a mission reserve where we couldn't speak our language, uh, we weren't re uh, free to roam, we weren't allowed to work, uh, and, and the list goes on. The Australian War Memorial is a shrine, a museum and an archive whose main purpose is to commemorate the sacrifice of those who have died in a war as well as creating an understanding of this country's wartime experience. This memorial is being given a half a billion dollars for refurbishment and this report recommends that it go ahead. I note that this proposal has been slammed as wasteful by others, particularly as it would involve the demolition of Anzac Hall. I will let others speak to what the proposal to redevelop the memorial includes, but I'm here to talk about what it doesn't include. It does not include anything of significance about the frontier wars. The Medical Association for the Prevention of War made a submission to this committee's inquiry where they said, and I quote, a proposed huge development, redevelopment of the Australian War Memorial, which continues to pay marginal attention to the frontier wars, the conflicts that, are, that have had a profound and lasting impact on the descendants of this land, of this land's original inhabitants, simply magnifies a deep stain of colonial dispossession on our national story." End quote. The Frontier Wars refers to the conflicts between our people and the colonial settlers during the British invasion of this continent. Beginning not long after the landing of the First Fleet in 1788, with the latest clashes happening as late as 1934. It is estimated that at least 40,000 40, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men, women, boys, girls and babies were killed. They were murdered. The very foundation of this country was paid for by our blood. Thousands of schoolchildren visit the War Memorial every year. There are also thousands of overseas visitors who go to the War Memorial to learn about our history as a country, and each and every single one of them will leave the memorial none the wiser of what happened here. The Hawkesbury, Bathurst and Nepean Wars 
and not explored. The wars on the Liverpool Plains are not commemorated. The Tasmanian Black War is not explained. None of the massacres are properly listed nor commemorated. How can the war memorial tell the story of this country without starting from the very beginning? How can we live in peace and expect peace when we can't even tell the truth? Many of the people watching or listening to this debate today are not aware of the brutality of colonisation and the wars fought right here on these shores. On the dawn service Invasion Day, January 26, we commemorated the Convincing Ground Massacre, a massacre of approximately 200 Gunditjmara people, my people, who were brutally massacred by British whalers. The Convincing Ground is prob probably the first recorded massacre site in Victoria, one of sadly hundreds. The site of the massacre was in Portland Bay in Western Victoria. The dispute arose over a beached whale. Our people asserted their right to the whale as traditional food, as we have done for thousands of years. On our country, except British whalers, wanted the whale for themselves. So they opened fire on our people, killing all but two of us. The Convincing Ground Massacre was part of the wider Umarala Wars between British colonisers and Gunditjmara people. Up to 6,500 Gunditjmara people were killed in the Umarala Wars. That's over 10 times the number of Australian lives that were tragically lost in the American War in Vietnam. Where's our memorial? What, don't we matter? Really? Where in this redevelopment are our people honoured? Our sacrifices talked about and our history shared, which is your history too. I feel sorry for every visitor to the memorial because they will leave there none the wiser as to the truth of what happened. This government continues to perpetrate the lie which, let's be honest, this country's very foundation was based on a lie, terra nullius. It's not like this issue didn't come up at the committee inquiry. It's just that for so many people in this place, from the Prime Minister all the way down, they would rather see us as a monument and not for who we are, a proud people who are still here a people who were killed in a bloody conflict right here under our feet. There is no more evident, this is no more evident than when any visitor who wants to learn about our history just walks into the memorial courtyard. In that beautiful courtyard there they will see 26 sandstone gargoyles, a kookaburra, a wombat, an emu, a frog, a carpet snake, and a gargoyle of an Aboriginal man, an Aboriginal woman? Really? The war memorial of this place is happy to have gargoyles for our people in the memorial courtyard with dirty rainwater pouring out of our mouth. But they will not commemorate and tell the truth about the frontier wars in the galleries inside. These gargoyles were part of the original building in 1941, and they're still there. Despite spending half a billion dollars on redeveloping the memorial, the gargoyles will stay. I can't believe I'm saying this. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? We are the world's oldest living culture. The world's oldest living culture. We're not just from this country, 
but we are of this country. The way the memorial treats us is indicative of how you view us. The Aboriginal gargoyles are products of the frontier wars. They are the only representation visitors will see of the wars that happened here and of a violent history of colonisation, of stolen lands, lives and children and identities. The War Memorial is happy to have us silent, set in stone, in our place, but will not recognise how many of us died here, at the end of a British gun or bayonet. A Senate committee in 2015 heard that the gargoyles would be refurbished. They would be refurbished and that the project would cost $1.6 million. Those gargoyles are still there. The government spent $1.6 million redoing them. It's shameful that I have to come here to the Senate to tell everyone that we are not monuments, that our culture are not set in stone, but we are here and we ain't going anywhere. And it's time to tell the truth in this country. Thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. Are you seeking to take note of the document? Yes, please. Uh, is leave granted to take note of the document? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Sorry, uh, De um, Deputy President. Uh, I'd also like to seek leave to continue my remarks. Yes. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, that concludes uh, the tabling and consideration of committee reports. I'm going to move to ministerial statements. I believe there's one minister. Uh, thank you. I table uh, responses to questions taken on notice as follows. Asked by Senator Wong on 17 February 2021. Asked by Senator uh, Gallagher on 20. 2 February 2021 relating to the job maker hiring credit scheme and asked by Senator Wong today relating to the meetings with the AFP and I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. Um, committee memberships. I believe there's one response. Yes? No? That was my mistake. <clears throat> so uh, we're dealing with messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received the message from the House of Representatives agreeing to the Senate resolution extending the time for the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System to report. And call the clerk. Government business orders of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2021, resumption of the second reading debate and the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to continue my remarks on the Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill. And before I had to give way to question time, I was reflecting that uh, this bill hasn't become to us, as I was suggesting, fully formed from the head of Zeus, but after almost three years of public consultation, following extensive analysis of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC. And what gives me comfort about the extent of the market intervention it, particularly the paragraph in, as expressed by the minister responsible for the bill in the other place, that the code creates a framework for the parties to reach commercial agreements so that news media business are fairly remunerated for the content they generate, which the digital platforms benefit from. And that's the essence or the driver for the creation of, of this bill and does, in essence, is the guiding light for the extent to which the market has been, we are seeking to, or the government is seeking to intervene. And intervention is always has carries some risk of unintended consequences, and that is why a review has been implemented. And I think I finished uh, my comments with um, a quote from Clive James, and I'll, I'll say it again: the last stage of fitting the product to the market is fitting the market to the product, and it's very much an apt description, although I don't think he was saying it in this context, of the large-scale tech companies. And we have been here before. Monopolistic practices have been around since ancient Rome, and indeed uh, things like salt were traded under imperial mandates. 
And the benefit of the, of the monopoly was infrastructure was built extremely fast at a, at a low cost. The problem is eventually you kill off innovation because there is no competition. And some historians suggest that it was effectively the fall of ancient Rome and the Reformation that brought uh, to the European economy uh, both competition and innovation. And similarly in the United States, particularly before and then after the American Revolution, there are a number of large corporations that had to, be, had to be granted exclusive contracts because they were in need for uh, large scale public works. So the benefit of the monopolies they created was infrastructure was created at a reasonable pace. But of course, eventually they had a large scale debate about, uh, across the country on whether they would break up the monopolies. And this debate continues to this day because we have before us a debate around the world about whether you regulate large tech, uh, you market you intervene in the market or, you, in fact, you have more extreme intervention with the breaking up of those companies. And I don't uh, intend to express a view on that today. It's outside the scope of the bill. But we are joined by an international community of legislators who are grappling with the problem. We are rightly endeavouring to keep the pricing of journalism appropriate in our economy from, from organisations that have global reach and to some extent have developed the practice of being too big to care or, of, or an attitude of being too big to care. They provide extremely valuable services, as we've seen with the decision of Facebook, which I understand has been, re been reversed, which has prevented Australians from seeking information regarding essential services. But we need to reflect that they set the rules and they also determine how their infrastructure is being used. And I think that we need to start to think about the internet and these large platforms as infrastructure. We spend much of the time in, the, in, in this place discussing banks and their interaction with ordinary members of the community. And I think a, a similar attitude needs to be taken by this parliament about uh, the services that are provided and that who sets the rules and, the, and particularly the, the rules of access and uh, how, not only how they're accessed, but how the infrastructure is, is being used. This, of course, has been alluded to by many other speakers in this debate, particularly with the potential threats to uh, new business creation, but also uh, the democracy at large. Philosophically, I often reflect that large tech tends to compete for a whole market to effectively be the market as opposed to competing within the market. And our legislative, our legislative view of big tech needs to take into account that we cannot allow that sort of practice to drive ongoing behaviours that winners take all. We are elected here to care and show concern and compassion for our community and to make sure they're looked after. The executives of the large uh, big tech are not elected to care. The hope of the government, and I hope I think the hope of every individual in the uh, senator in this honourable senator in this chamber, would be that they would exercise social responsibility. Obviously, that is still in question, and thus we need to act. I'd like to think this is the last market intervention, but I doubt it. I think we're on a road of continuous review and reform, and we will often be guided by what happens overseas. I'm very interested in the French model, which has taken the approach of copyright. I'm hopeful, maybe aspirational, that this intervention shows the seriousness of this parliament, the serious view that the parliament takes, and that it will not avert its glaze, gaze going in, in the future regarding the operations of these platforms. We all know how much the community relies on particularly com the communication of uh, particularly in bushfires, comes to mind, and they use social media. Our youth are brought up on it. Not of my generation had to learn it as, they, as we went through. I suppose this debate, very much at its essence, is about social licence. How much social licence are we expecting from these companies? How much social licence do they wish to take on board? And where they fall short, the extent to which we're going to have to intervene. They have incredible power, and it does cause me great concern. 
But I come back to the surety I have in the one-year review, also the rigour of the ACCC's analysis and also of our own internal parliamentary processes. I'd like to think in a year's time we can celebrate no further regulation, but I think the next big issue facing us, as has been alluded to again by other members, is the amount of the tax they pay, but also the privacy of the individual. An individual should be free uh, to interact with these organisations and not uh, and do so in an open and transparent way and not be a unwitting provider of, of corporate um, surveillism, I suppose, which drives their profits. So on that note, I can bend the bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy uh, President. I, uh, I also rise to commend <coughs> this bill to the House. And I just want to talk very briefly about um, some parts of the bill that have not necessarily garnished as much focus as, as other parts. I mean, we have heard a lot about the Facebook news ban and the fact that people couldn't find information for the Bureau of Meteorology uh, and several other sites that are, one would argue are certainly not news sites, but also the larger sites that were wiped in that um, unilateral move by Facebook uh, in their attempt to have us reject this bill. And I am very pleased that we have not uh, flinched and we have not stood down from our resolve to actually implement regulations to ensure that journalists, essentially that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, this is not about big tech paying big media. This is about big tech paying media, news organisations, so they can pay their journalists. It is only fair that people are paid for their work. And uh, these news sites are populated by articles written by journalists, written by individuals who deserve a salary. They deserve due recognition for uh, the work that they do. But we've heard that Google has entered agreements with some of the larger uh, media organisations, such as News Corp and The Guardian, and I commend Google for taking that proactive approach before the regulation has uh, been brought into place. Um, but importantly, this is very important, this bill also addresses and enables smaller media organisations, small news organisations, to also be able to be remunerated for their content. This code provides for digital platforms to publish what will be known as standard offers. That will go on their websites and a registered news organisation, a small independent news organisation who registers through the Australian Communications and Media Authority can then seek to uh, participate in that standard offer. That will save them a fortune in both time and money to go through the negotiation, mediation and potentially arbitration um, if they wanted to negotiate individual uh, agreements with the uh, big tech companies. But some of these smaller organisations, they're also members of larger groups. So you might have several newspapers operating in semi-independent uh, structures that belong to a single group, like uh, the McPherson Media Group, based out of Shepparton in regional Victoria, but also the owner of several uh, semi-independent newspapers under that banner. They can come together and effectively um, collectively negotiate their own agreement under this code, which is a really important uh, factor for the code. Um, there is also Country Press Australia, an organisation which brings together 81 members and 160 regional newspapers, and they represent the rights of those regional 
rural newspapers that service small communities like mine and provide an absolute foundation for those communities. Uh, Country Press Australia can come together on behalf of all of their members under this code and negotiate an agreement with the big tech firms that can then apply to all of their members. And that is a really important factor that I don't think has had enough attention um, in today's debate. Because this is not just about big business. As I said at the outset, it is about journalists getting uh, remuneration through this code, but it's also about communities being able to access their choice of news through these digital platforms. And for that reason, I commend this bill to the chamber. Thank you, uh, Senator Davey, Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. I'm sorry, Madam Deputy President. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank those senators that have contributed to this debate. This bill establishes a world first mandatory code to address the bargaining power imbalance that exists between digital platforms and Australian news media businesses. Consumers are now obtaining more and more news online, while at the same time, digital platforms are thriving with their advertising revenues growing in leaps and bounds. In these circumstances, it is unacceptable that digital platforms continue to earn revenue from news content created by Australian news media businesses without fairly remunerating them. The ACCC found that this situation arises because of an imbalance of bargaining power between digital platforms and local news businesses. The code addresses this problem in a fair and flexible way. It is, key, it is a key part of the government's strategy to ensure that Australians continue to enjoy the benefits of digital technology, while at the same time protecting key elements of the Australian society, such as a strong and sustainable and independent Australian news media. The code will be reviewed by Treasury one year after its operation to ensure that it is delivering on its outcomes and that, they are, that the outcomes are consistent with the government's policy intent. I thank the Senate Economics Legislation Committee for its consideration of this bill and welcome the finding that it will help safeguard public interest journalism in Australia. I note the additional comments from Labor senators and, in particular, their view that the government's work on the code has improved the responsiveness of digital platforms to the news media businesses. I also want to address the additional comments from the Australian Greens in the Senate Economics <coughs> Committee report and the additional recommendations that they put forward. The government does not support the Greens' recommendations. The Morrison government is a strong supporter of public interest news and in June 2020 announced 107 regional publishers and broadcasters would receive a share of, uh, of uh, $50 million in funding as part of the Public Interest News Gathering Program, the PING. Of the 107 eligible applicants, 92 are regional publishers, 13 are regional radio broadcasters, and five are regional television broadcasters, the majority of which operate as small to medium businesses. I can further advise the Senate, and this goes directly to Senator Pratt's amendment to the second reading motion, which the government will also be opposing. In September 2020, the Minister for Communications announced that $5 million of funding would be provided to AAP Newswire to enable them to continue to offer their services to more than 250 regional mastheads that are serving local communities. Senator McKim's amendment goes to the collection of data. I note that on 12 December 2019, the Attorney General announced that the government would conduct a review of the Privacy Act of 1988 to ensure that privacy settings empower consumers, protect their data and best serve the Australian economy. The review was announced as part of the government's response to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's digital platforms inquiry. The issues raised by Senator McKim should, um, should be addressed in context of that review rather than this legislation. 
Similarly, the Senate is currently conducting an inquiry into the concentration of news media in Australia, the subject of Senator Waters' amendment. The government does not support the contention in Senator Waters' amendment, and those issues should be addressed in the committee context rather than in the context of this bill's second reading debate. With regards to Senator Hanson Young's amendment to the motion on the ABC, the government does not support that amendment, and I note that the ABC has more funding certainty than any other media company in Australia. And that is because taxpayers provide the ABC with over $1 billion in funding every year. I also note that the government has been very clear that any proceeds that the ABC receives from Google or from Facebook under the News Media Bargaining Code are not going to be debited from or lead to a reduction in the funding that the government is otherwise providing to the ABC. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. So there are a number of um, second reading amendments. So we start with um, the amendment standing in the name of Senator Pratt. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Senator Pratt, I've just moved your I've just moved your amendment and I've called it defeated. I've put the question, Senator Pratt, and the question is that your amendment be agreed to and the Senator's just voted it down. Okay, so division required? Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator McGrath, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. We have several second reading amendments to go. And I will ask Senator Waters, McKim or Hanson Young to move one of their second reading amendments. Senator Hanson Young. Move the, I move the amendment. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Noes, noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator Davey, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. We have two more amendments to deal with. Could I ask for Senator McKim or Waters? Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, President. I move the second reading amendment standing in my name. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to? So the question is, yeah, the question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters, sorry, um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question before the chair is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters, number one two on sheet one two one three. Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters on sheet 1213 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt to tell of the ayes and Senator McCarthy to tell of the noes.
result of the division is ayes 10, noes 54. The matter is resolved in the negative. And I just note for the record that's uh, sheet number 1213. We'll now move to sheet number 1211 and a second reading amendment. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I uh, move second reading amendment uh, standing in my name on sheet 1211. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell up the ayes. Senator Davey, tell up the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 30, nose 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, the question now is that the motion for the second reading on this bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Is the contrary no? The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 in relation to digital platforms and for related purposes. Uh, given the hour, Senators, I'll give Senators a moment to either exit the chamber or resume their seats as we will imminently commence the adjournment debate. Uh, I'll call the minister in the meantime. Uh, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thank you, Senator Hume. I'll just wait a moment while senators clear the chamber. And it being 7.20, uh, the Senate um, is now adjourned. Senator Bragg. Mr Acting Deputy President, well, I rise to speak tonight about the ABC, and I uh, put again on the public record that I'm a big supporter of the ABC. I think it does an outstanding job for the most part, and it's very important that the ABC maintain its very high standards. Uh, and, of course, uh, the ABC, like its uh, brother or sister organisation in the UK, the BBC, um, has over the course of the years had some issues with impartiality. Now, um, one of the good things that the BBC has done under their uh, Director General Tim Davey has been to put in place an edict so that BBC employees are forced to maintain impartiality in their dealings. Very important to maintain confidence in public broadcasting. Now, Tim Davey has said, impartiality is the foundation on which we deliver insightful, exciting and groundbreaking stories. These guidelines are intended to help us continue to deliver this and to build audience trust. That's what Mr Davey has said. Now, I raised these very good guidelines with Mr David Anderson, the managing director of the ABC, at estimates last year on multiple occasions. And uh, the ABC has now followed suit, and they have put out a code of conduct which deals with the personal use of social media. And I think this is very, very welcome. Now, this, of course, follows some unfortunate tweets last year by ABC staff, uh, where they referred to ideological bastardry and hoping people were feeling smug, which I think was very unfortunate. Now, the ABC, under Mr Anderson, has now said that the guidelines for personal use of social media uh, will be dealt with in accordance with relevant ABC employment agreements and may lead to disciplinary action, including possible termination of employment if they are contravened. And one of the key standards—there are four—is to not mix the professional and the personal in ways that are likely to bring the ABC into disrepute. Now, this is good stuff by the ABC and by David Anderson, incremental but very important changes which will ensure the integrity and the impartiality of our public broadcaster. Now, this has been a week in which we can reflect on the great value of the ABC, because when Facebook, in the dispute which I believe we are about to win uh, with the big tech publishers, decided to switch off news. Australians could access news through the ABC, through The Guardian, through news.com.au, through Sky News, but they could always know in their hearts that they can get ABC's news on their apps, on their website, 
because we spend $1 billion each year of taxpayers' funds to ensure that good news is available to all Australians. So that has been, I think, a very important week for us to reflect upon the value of the ABC. Now, I am concerned that the ABC is in business with people it should not be in business with. Uh, it has emerged from estimates and from my correspondence with Mr Anderson that the ABC is in business with an organisation called The New Daily, which is owned by a bunch of lobbyists, uh, which are owned by the uh, industry super fund people. Now, this, I think, is a grave error by the ABC because in getting into business with a hyper-partisan lobbyist, uh, they are putting at risk the veneer of independence, which I think they are on the cusp of um, crossing a new Rubicon on. I mean, I do think that these statements from David Anderson are very welcome. They're very welcome because it shows the organisation's commitment to impartiality. But how can you be impartial if you're doing deals with the Superfund lobbyists, whose only mission in life is, is to distort the public record in relation to this huge experiment of superannuation? Uh, I mean, these are the most cashed-up lobbyists on earth. Who can imagine an organisation that is so rich that it can run its own newspaper called The New Daily and then have an agreement with the national broadcaster? So I think it's important that the ABC terminate this agreement. Um, I'm going to write to David Anderson and ask him to terminate that agreement. And if it's not terminated, I will seek to uh, introduce legislation to terminate all future agreements. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you. I rise tonight to speak on a very important economic issue impacting uh, North Queensland and uh, far North Queensland particularly. I have spoken on many occasions about the North Queensland insurance crisis in this place, and that is because insurance in North Queensland continues to go up and this government continues to do nothing to fix it. The Morrison government has already failed to deliver on its promise to drive down insurance premiums and improve the availability for residents in Northern Australia. The Assistant Treasurer said that this was an issue of such importance that the government was going to respond to the ACCC's findings before the ACCC handed down their final report. This did not happen. For the last seven years, members of this government, including the member for Leichhardt, the member for Dawson and now the member for Herbert, have promised to fix this crisis, and yet they have failed to deliver one single recommendation from the ACCC reports. We know that they've been describing this as a crisis for a long time, even back far back as 2015, and yet nothing has been done. The government is not taking mitigation funding seriously. One of the big recommendations from the port, one of the things that insurers say will bring down prices in Northern Australia, out of $4 billion announced in the government's emergency response fund, not one single dollar of that fund has been spent. And currently, only 3 per cent of nat natural disaster funding is being spent on mitigation. Now, the members in far North Queensland and North Queensland, particularly the member for Dawson, but now the member for Herbert has jumped on this as well, have spent a lot of time holding forums and talk fests, talking about what they're going to do to fix this problem. And yet, when the ACCC handed down the 18th of December report, 18th of December, 15 recommendations from that report. Not one has been implemented. A year later, 20th of December, 28 recommendations from that report. Not one single recommendation has been implemented. And most recently, on the 20th of January, um, 2021, the ACCC handed down its final report after three years of investigating this incredibly important issue. Not one single one of those recommendations has been implemented by this government. In fact, what has happened is that the local members in far North Queensland and North Queensland have decided that they don't like the ACCC report because it's not giving them the answers that they want. They've decided that the ACCC report, after all that hard work and cost to produce that report, isn't something that they're interested in doing. They are out there talking about a mitigation, uh, sorry, a reinsurance pool. But we know the ACCC 
recommended strongly against this course of action. They said, one, it probably won't work, and if it does, uh, if it is implemented, it will cost a lot of money. That's not what the member for Herbert or the member for Dawson is out there telling people. They're saying this is going to be the magic bullet. Forget about the ACCC recommendations, all 38 of them. We don't need to implement those. What we need to do is find this other solution to talk to you about that takes the blame off us, that takes the uh, impotence off us to do something about this. The ACCC has made recommendations around consumer behaviour, around mitigation, around banning broker commissions, uh, introducing a comparison website, regulatory changes, and not one single recommendation has even been implemented by this government. They haven't even said if they're planning on implementing these recommendations. What people in Far North Queensland and North Queensland are getting pretty sick and tired of is hearing members of this government say that this is a huge problem, that this is a crisis, that it needs to be fixed, but we don't have the answers to fix it. Roll up your sleeves, do the hard work, listen to the recommendations that have been handed down and find some solutions because our economic recovery in North Queensland depends on getting this right. This isn't mudslinging from the opposition. This is just asking you to do your job. Do your job and fix the insurance crisis now. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to speak on mutual obligations and employment providers. Today, the government announced, um, as part of that dreadful announcement on the job uh, seeker payment, uh, they announced a reporting line so employers can dob in people in to the government if people are in an employment program and, in the government's words, refuse to take a job. But we hear absolute crickets from the government on the employment programs and providers who are being paid a lot of money to find these magical jobs when we have 1.5 million people on JobSeeker and Youth Allowance and 175,000 jobs available. They just don't, those figures just don't match. This is all part of the sick obsession of this government that, uh, with their uh, picking on and blaming people for the fact that they can't find a job in the light of those figures. It's hardly surprising, and that's during a pandemic and a recession. For many years, my office has been contacted by people who have been bullied, harassed, ignored or treated very poorly by their employment service providers. I asked people in the community how they are going with their providers so I could share some of these accounts with the Senate. To date, and I only asked over the weekend, I've had 700 responses, so I'll only be able to share a handful with you now. And I'm quoting the messages that I got. My absolute low point was when I was turned down for a job washing dishes because the employer believed I was overqualified. I was diagnosed with a degenerative muscular disease and need ongoing physio. Due to the loss of muscle tone, I have to drag my right leg upstairs and often can't climb them at all. My job network provider thought it would be a really great idea to enrol me in a forklift course. Problem is that there are steep, narrow steps to get on the forklift. Imagine my embarrassment when I couldn't climb on the forklift with everyone in the class watching. I was then told I couldn't um, complete the course. In response, my JSP accused me of not trying hard enough and threatened to have my payments suspended. Pre-COVID, I was told my by my employment consultant that I wasn't trying hard enough to find work. They made me come in every day under his supervision to look for work, as my, quote, my methods obviously aren't working. I am in my 50s with a partial capacity to work. I really didn't appreciate his attitude or approach. I do not feel supported at all. I am legally blind and also have a chronic health condition that is so life-threatening that I have a medical alarm at home. Then another person. One time I had to change my meeting time to, to earlier in the day to accommodate a job interview. I con contacted my JSP and was told it was all okay. Half an hour after the job interview finished, I received a message saying I had missed my JSP meeting and would have my payment temporarily suspended. I've been in a payment for, un for just under a year. In that time, my provider has spoken to me only twice. 
I was actively trying to get assistance from them even when there was no mutual obligations, but, there were, but they were nowhere to be found. I've applied for more than 70 jobs uh, just this year, this is in 2021, with absolutely no support whatsoever, not from writing applications, finding jobs to apply for or interview. My job provider repeatedly ignored my emails and never called me back. The only time they contacted me was when they wanted copies of my payslips when I started working. I found out later that they wanted my payslips because they got bonuses for getting me a job, so I refused to send them. I missed an appointment over the phone that fell outside the time I was told to expect the call. In the time it took me to call for, them to, for me to call back, less than five minutes, they had already put my payment on hold. I couldn't get through to my consultant to figure out what had happened. Then this one. My son has been suicidal for a few years and was finally well enough to return to university study, studies last, last semester doing one unit. He recently got a call from his JSP informing him that as he is no longer su suicidal, he needs to either get a job or study full time. And I should have issued a trigger warning when I read that out. These are the experiences, the lived experiences of people trying to get appointments and help from their job service provider. They're the very people, and I've got 700 of these, and I'm sure I'll have more soon. These are the very people of government saying, oh, it's okay, you can do ring, ring, a, ring a job in a job seeker line. It's appalling. Senator Seward, your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. There is something exciting taking place in South Australia, another initiative that cements my state as the leader in medical research. It will also be of interest to my friends from the Northern Territory. The Freemason Centre for Male Health and Wellbeing is a research alliance involving the Masonic Charities, the University of Adelaide and SAMRI in South Australia. The South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, SAMRI, as it's better known, is South Australia's first independent health and medical research institute and home to more than 700 medical researchers. On Monday, the 8th of February, I attended the official launch of this alliance, which was gracefully conducted by His Excellency the Honourable Hugh Van Ley, the Governor of South Australia. The centre has two divisions, one in South Australia and the other in the Northern Territory. The centre is the evolution of the Freemasons Foundation Centre for Men's Health, which was established in 2007 and maintained through a $7.2 million partnership between the Freemasons Foundation and the University of Adelaide. Going forward, the centre will continue to be supported by Masonic Charities, the new charitable arm of the Freemasons in South Australia and Northern Territory, cha capably chaired by Mr John Bahanna, which has, and the organisation has committed to donating a minimum of $1.8 million over three years to the centre funds that will be matched collectively by the Research Alliance partners. The centre brings together a multidisciplinary team of clinicians and researchers undertaking research as well as delivering programs aimed at preventing and treating conditions that continue to contribute to the ill health and premature death in males. Conditions that include prostate cancer and preconception health, as well as other particular conditions affecting men such as obesity, diabetes, depression and sexual health. The three partners are seeking to work together to tackle the biggest health challenges in society today. The ent entities have a natural alignment of values which come together in the centre's mission statement. In summary, the mission statement says, through benevolence, leadership and partnership, the centre will enable and undertake outstanding male health and wellbeing research. These include generating significant new knowledge, embracing innovation, advances in health and wellbeing education and seeking to have an enduring impact on individuals, families and communities. Two speeches delivered at the opening particularly resonated with me. The chairman of the board, Dr Neil Jensen, spoke of the importance of benevolence to Freemasons. He said Freemasons are taught to be ever alert to the needs of others and to promote happiness. He saw the centre as an iteration of the desire for a better tomorrow. I quote him, he said, Through the work of this centre we see our great Masonic family providing tangible help 
for our fellow citizens, men, women and children. Professor Gary Whitted, a director of the centre, acknowledged the now 13-year history of the centre and the major investment of the University of Adelaide and Freemasons of South Australia and Northern Territory through the Freemasons Foundation and now Masonic Charities. He emphasised their incredible support and commitment that has led to the success and growth of the centre from, a, from originally a handful of researchers to now more than 50 researchers. All the speeches embraced the theme of the importance in life to seek knowledge to better the lives of others. Along with my Northern Territory friends, we are proud that Australia's only multidisciplinary male health research centre called South Australia and Northern Territory Home. I congratulate all those that have brought the Freemason Centre for Men Male Health and Wellbeing to life. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, for over a century, International Women's Day has been an opportunity for women to take stock, re-energise and organise. This year's theme is Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. So on March 8th, we will acknowledge the immense contribution Australian women have made during the pandemic. Women have shouldered an enormous burden during COVID-19 as frontline workers, as parents and as carers. Women in caring professions have put their health and safety on the line for others. And too many of these women are in low paid and insecure jobs. Cleaners, aged care, childcare and health and community services workers, to name just a few. And we know that during the pandemic, women have disproportionately taken on additional caring responsibilities at home, including homeschooling. But even though we all spent much more time at home, women were still five times more likely to take on primary caring roles during the pandemic. We also know that during last year, women bore the brunt of the economic downturn. Women lost jobs at a greater rate than men, and women lost more hours of work than men. International Women's Day marks more than just one day each year. It actually represents an international movement that every day of every year continues to demand equality for women. In the Labor Party, we know that greater equality is not inevitable. We know that it must be fought for. And Labor will always fight for the women of Australia. We will always fight for good, secure jobs for the women of Australia, for equal pay, for the respect women deserve but still don't have to be listened uh, and to be heard. And what do the women of Australia see when they look to the leader of this country? They see a person who is sending a message to every girl and every woman that they just don't matter. Prime Minister Morrison is not standing up for the women in his own party. He is not standing up for the women who work in this parliament. And the women of Australia know that they can't count on him to stand up for them. As Senator Wong said in this chamber this week, Mr Morrison is arguably the most powerful person in the land. He sets standards that form cultural expectations. His actions and inactions shape the culture. So what does it say when the standards he sets in legislation currently before the House would hurt Australian women by cutting their wages and making their jobs less secure? We are 12 months into this pandemic and into the economic crisis that it created, and the Prime Minister has offered absolutely nothing for the working women of Australia in the recovery. The Prime Minister has instead used the pandemic as cover to give businesses more power to cut the pay of Australian workers. He's abandoned women who are essential workers to wallow in insecure and casual work. And he's robbed women of a comfortable retirement by making them raid their own superannuation savings to get by. The Prime Minister is making things worse for hard-working Australian women. He has set too many Australian women on the path to poverty, 
and he won't stand up for the women of this country. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I wish to further discuss the corruption that continues in Queensland local government. This corruption is ripping off hundreds of millions of dollars of Commonwealth and state taxpayers' money. These monies are being redirected, not spent on their intended purposes, or not spent at all, or corruptly provided to persons in exchange for overvalued materials and services. Emergency Management Australia EMA, administers the National Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements the NDRRA, and the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements DRFA, funding on behalf of the Australian Government. 75 per cent of the funds are from the Australian Government and the remainder reimbursed from the Queensland State Government. The Queensland Reconstruction Authority QRA, and Emergency Management Queensland EMQ, coordinate disaster funding in Queensland. Queensland councils received $5.4 billion in NDRRA funds from 2011 to 2019. This may be a billion dollar scandal. Recent royal commissions into aged care, institutional abuse and banking practices only came about after much opposition. Look how much evidence surfaced when people were able to come forward to tell their stories. This inquiry is urgently needed. The councils and the local government association of Queensland facilitate a system where contractors made huge profits on road building by fraudulently claiming payments and stripping 40 to 60 per cent out of NDRRA fund project funding as private profits. And these practices are widespread across Queensland. At the heart of this local government corruption has been the Local Government Association of Queensland, the LGAQ, a private company that has a special relationship with the Queensland Government and is not obliged to go to tender when contracting with councils. This lack of transparency breeds corruption. What makes the LGAQ unique are the special statutory provisions that make the LGAQ virtually unaccountable for their actions. Under Rule 234 of the Local Government Regulations 2012, a council is exempt from calling contracts or, tender, or to tender or calling quotes if the contract is entered into under an LGA arrangement. Can you imagine that? This includes a contract made with the LGAQ. Every contract the LGAQ enters involves a substantial fee being paid to the LGAQ. I'll say that again. Every contract the LGAQ enters involves a substantial fee being paid to the LGAQ. It is the classic cartel arrangement, prohibited in any other state except Queensland, where it's le le legalised by Rule 234. Some of this information has been disclosed in the Queensland State Parliament and directly to the Triple C, which inexplicably declined to investigate. Many complaints to the Triple C about a council are simply sent back to the council to investigate itself. Actual Triple C investigation is rare. A research paper prepared by Professor Timothy Prenzler into the complaints sent to the Triple C found that less than 2 per cent of complaints were investigated and the other 98 per cent largely disappeared. Why? Since I alerted the Senate that I wish to put a motion to support a select Senate inquiry into this corruption, the LGAQ sent representatives to Canberra to try to stop the inquiry. Some mayors contacted local government minister Colton's office objecting to the inquiry. What are they afraid of? What do these mayors all have to hide? What do they think an inquiry will reveal? Is this an admission of guilt? A council with nothing to hide would welcome an opportunity to show how well it uses public monies. Yet when the motion was put to the vote, the government, Labor and the Greens voted against this anti-corruption motion. This was quite stunning when the government wishes to introduce an integrity bill, yet voted against an anti-integrity motion. The Greens believed that lies that complaints brought to the Triple C had already been investigated and were found without substance. This is false, as key witnesses were never contacted, let alone questioned. Key locations were never inspected or visited. How could the Greens think this constituted an investigation? Crossbench Senators Jackie Lambie and Rex Patrick know that I am right and supported my motion. I thank these senators for their integrity. The mechanics of the corrupt practices are known and have been brought to the attention of the authorities. I call on the Senate to do the right thing. I will continue exposing this corruption and continue to, to seek a Senate select inquiry to protect taxpayers' money 
and to restore integrity. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Today uh, is another sad day for regional tourism. At a time when regional tourism operators are you know, really hoping that they can start to recover some of the money lost and some of the business lost um, last year throughout the pandemic, and as a result of border closures and restricted travel um, for now, we're, we, we're coming into well over 12 months for our regional tourism businesses, and they wake to read that Rex Airlines is cutting uh, some of its regional routes. Um, they say due to predatory behaviour by Qantas. However, uh, the routes that they're cutting are routes that only wreck services. Um, it is a very sad day. I understand uh, that regional aviation is an expensive business to be in, and I also understand that businesses uh, need to, uh, at, at the very least, break even. Uh, at the same time, Qantas has announced that it will um, develop some new routes into regional areas, including Adelaide to Mount Gambia, uh, Griffith in New South Wales to Sydney, and Melbourne to Marimula, for example. However, these routes are routes that are already serviced, whereas the routes that Rex has cut in order to be able to continue to compete against Qantas on these new routes are routes that aren't serviced by anyone else. They were only serviced by Rex. For example, Bathurst to Sydney or Cooma to Sydney. The community of Cooma had advocated for years to get an airline service back to their community so people could travel to Sydney for business, for medical appointments or for recreation. And we are now going to see that service closed down again. It must be heartbreaking for the community of Cooma. And they're also cutting the Adelaide to King Island route, uh, where there is no alternative, no easy alternative to get from Adelaide to King Island. So I can understand the communities in regional Australia that had come to depend upon these aviation routes must be feeling absolutely devastated, particularly you know, the small businesses and tourism operators that really relied on people being able to get to their communities easily and efficiently. And for those people living in the communities who relied on these airlines to get to things like med medical appointments. But importantly, this move has longer term impacts on the communities in rural and regional Australia. We know competition is a mechanism that helps drive efficiencies and potentially cut prices. But where the competition actually leads to a business uh, undermining its own sustainability, it's not healthy competition at all. And competition that is a race to the bottom is a race that is lost to all. So, um, I just want to let these regional communities know that I stand with them and I will be advocating on their behalf to all airlines to have a look at these regional routes and reassess. And instead of looking at paths where they see an easy uh, competitive uh, mechanism, maybe look for where the gaps are and maybe look how you can get people into regional Australia to help revive our regions, to help your business and to help other uh, regional businesses across Australia. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, on Friday this week, the Royal Commission into Aged Care will hand down its final report. After more than two years and dozens of hearings, 20 research papers and millions of words of evidence, the Royal Commission will provide an authoritative perspective on aged care in Australia, as well as guidance on the path forward. Before then, however, the Royal Commission verdict on this government's performance in this space has been unambiguous. They have left older Australians down. Our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents and aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers and, of course, our community. 
The Royal Commission Interim Report, released in 2019, explained the government's approach to aged care right in the title, neglect. This damning report card was delivered before the COVID-19 pandemic hit and laid bare for all to see what underfunding of staff and the neglect of patient needs and infection protocols meant. And before 678 residents of aged care facilities had died. As a duty senator for the central western New South Wales seat of Clare, I'm compelled to bring the heartbreaking example of Lithgow Aged Care Centre to the attention of this chamber. Like many regional centres, Lithgow's local aged care centres have been struggling with inadequate funding and struggling to maintain care. Lithgow Aged Care Centre received its first official sanction from the Aged Care Quality and Standards Commission in 2019. On February 15 this year, the centre was ordered by the Commission and received a notice that the centre's accreditation would be re revoked within eight weeks, which will require, of course, the centre to close. Now, if the centre closes, 75 frail and vulnerable residents will be forcibly relocated further away from their families. There are simply no beds in town, so the Department of Health is attempting to find places for them as far away as Western Sydney. A great inconvenience for those, those in the community and, of course, for those patients and those residents. While there are appeal avenues available to the centre without a decisive intervention from the federal government, April 15 will be the day that more than 120 staff will be made redundant and all the residents will be made homeless. Lithgow already struggles with chronic unemployment. So over 120 staff will find it difficult to find work. Meanwhile, the income from these jobs will be ripped out of the local economy. Now, aged care is the responsibility of the federal government. And for eight years, the coalition has slashed funding and further enabled the plunder of this vital public institution by rich listers who become multimillionaires and billionaires on the backs of vulnerable people and underpaid care workers. All on the Government, often on the government dime. Since Scott Morrison was Treasurer and then Prime Minister, $1.7 billion has been ripped out of the aged care budget. Even the government's own former aged care minister delivered a scathing assessment of what the Liberal Party has done to aged care in this country and the revolving door of ministers who have failed older Australians. Distracting Deputy President, the people of Lithgow and New South Wales can now speak to what their underfunding, the neglect, looks like. When the centre board ran into difficulties in running the centre, it was abandoned by this government. On his Facebook page, the member for Clare, Andrew G, has a range of posts announcing funding for this centre. But like the rest of the government, he is there for the photo op and gone for the follow up. The ABC reported the story of Bill Burns, a local whose mother died three weeks prior to the meeting. He said the standard of care delivered at the home amounted to broken promises. Another resident, Bronwyn Thompson, said she had observed, and I quote, systematic failures at the home. Her father is a resident there, while her mother died there last year. Ms Thompson said the staff are great but there's just not enough of them. If this centre is to close in April, I'm extremely concerned about the impact this will have on residents and staff in the local community. I'm calling upon the government to come up with a plan to provide content continuity of care to these residents and the centre that they are currently in. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. A couple of weeks ago, I went out into the southern part of the Tarkheim, uh, home uh, for tens of thousands of years to the Tarkina people. And when I was out there, I caught up with some great folk who are bravely defending some of the most magnificent forests on our planet. These forests are in a landscape that is a rich tapestry of Aboriginal cultural history. 
Uh, they are some of the most carbon dense forests uh, on the planet. Uh, they are home to some of the most beautiful and unique creatures on the planet. And of course, the reason that these folk are out in these forests uh, to receive uh, visitors such as me and who are still out in those forests today, I might add, is because the logging industry of Tasmania, cheered on by the neoliberals in this place from the Liberal National Party and the Australian Labor Party, uh, devastated that landscape. And I do mean devastated that landscape. Now remember, they're not doing it for money because every tree that's cut down actually costs the Tasmanian taxpayer money. There is no economic case to underpin native forest logging in Tasmania. But I particularly want to thank Viola, who I met for the first time uh, nearly 50 metres up uh, a giant uh, eucalyptus obliqua tree. And Viola was camped on a platform 50 metres up that tree, and I somehow managed to haul myself uh, with nothing more than a few ropes uh, and some prussic knots uh, nearly 50 metres up that tree. Now, I lost a bit of bark, as we say in Tasmania, off the fingers on the way up and down, uh, a little bit of skin. Uh, but if those people weren't out there, believe me, that beautiful, uh, magnificent standing giant of our forests would have lost a lot more than bark. It would have lost its very existence. So I want to pay tribute and thank every single person who stood up to defend those forests, the creatures in them, the carbon in them and the Aboriginal cultural heritage that surrounds them, particularly the people, including former Senator Bob Brown, who have been arrested over the latter part of last year and as recently as Monday this week, putting their bodies on the line to defend those places. They are true heroes and logging those forests are a, is a crime against nature and a crime against our climate. It reminds me of what's going on inside the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, where right now the Liberal government of Tasmania under uh, Premier Peter Gutwin is actually privatising our World Heritage Area. He is flogging it off for a pittance to tourism developers who gain exclusive rights. That means that a place like Halls Island in Lake Malbina, inside the walls of Jerusalem National Park, inside the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, that we have all agreed to protect on behalf of all of humanity because of its wilderness values and its cultural values, we can't go there anymore. We're not allowed in to our own World Heritage Area if we want to go to Halls Island. It is verboten for us to go there because it's been hived off for a pittance to a tourism developer driven by greed and profit. And ordinary Australians are now forbidden from setting foot on Halls Island after having uh, had that island open for any of us to go to uh, since Europeans arrived here uh, in this country. I mean, seriously, I used to work as a wilderness guide, did many seasons wilderness guiding uh, in Tasmania. I know two things. We need to protect wilderness for its own sake. That wilderness was there long before humanity ever set foot on this planet, and it will be there long after we're gone, as long as we look after it. That's the first thing I know. The second thing is this. For those in this place, and it is most of you, who can't see the value in anything unless you can attach a dollar sign and a job to it, I did used to be a wilderness guide, as I said. People used to take, come out in the wilderness with me. They'd pay good dollars. They'd employ lots of people. They pay for a wilderness experience. They don't pay for mechanised noise like the helicopters that will service Halls Island. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The economic consequences of the coronavirus pandemic could not have come at a less convenient time for Tasmania. In recent years, my home state had turned an economic corner and was powering ahead after years of budget mismanagement and economic turmoil under the previous state Labor-Green government. Business confidence was up. 
Retail trade was booming, cranes dominated the Hobart skyline, and Tasmania's reputation as a first-class visitor destination for interstate and international tourists alike was second to none. Tasmanians were feeling confident about the future, and an increase in the number of jobs in the state meant Tasmanians were reconsidering their need to move to the mainland for work, reversing a sad historical trend. And then the pandemic hit, bringing to a halt all of our positive momentum and slamming the brakes on the progress we had made over the last few years. I was worried that we'd see a return to the bad old days where Tasmanians were leaving the state in droves, the unemployment rate was at an all-time high and business confidence was almost non-existent. In the weeks following the initial fallout from the virus and over the course of 2020, the Morrison Coalition government introduced unprecedented levels of support for individuals, families and businesses to weather the worst of the economic downturn. Budget initiatives in the form of tax cuts have helped ease cost of living pressures by putting more money back into the pockets of Australians. Retail figures show that Tasmanians have been spending this money locally, taking up the call to support local business by buying Tasmanian produce and manufactured goods. And Tasmanians have taken it upon themselves to spread the economic love across our state, responding to the call to holiday at home. We have relished the opportunity to get out and explore our own backyard rediscovering places we haven't visited for an extended period or stopping off at locations we inevitably put off to travel further afield. Every cup of coffee, every petrol stop, every meal purchased and overnight accommodation booked supports local businesses and jobs. As a government, we have been focusing on investing in job-creating projects to further enhance Tasmania's economic recovery. A $150 million commitment to duplicate the Sorrel and Midway Point causeways will improve the safety and travel time along this busy transport corridor. An investment in Tasmania's iconic tourism drawcards, including Freycinet National Park and the celebrated Overland Track, will ensure these sites can continue to welcome visitors for years to come. This kind of targeted investment is exactly the type of stimulus the economy needs right now creating better public and community infrastructure and, most importantly, creating local jobs. While we still have a way to go, the seeds of our economic revival have begun to sprout and will only grow stronger over the course of this year. The release of the Tasmanian Treasury's revised estimates report for the 2020-2021 financial year has confirmed the island state is on the mend and our economy is starting to recover from the crisis. Strong uptake of the Commonwealth and Tasmanian Home Builder Grant programs have seen dwelling approvals skyrocket in de December last year, with the number of dwelling approvals at more than 95 per cent above the same, uh, the same period in the previous year, creating increased activity in the building and construction se sector and supporting jobs around the state. The ABS labour force statistics released last week further confirm Tasmania's positive economic trajectory with employment on par with pre-pandemic levels. Our unemployment rate is now the lowest of all the Australian states at 5.9 per cent, having fallen a further per cent just in January. This is fantastic news for the island state, which before the spread of COVID-19 was smashing economic records under the leadership of former Tasmanian Premier Will Hodgman and current Premier Peter Gutwin with the support of a federal coalition government. This doesn't happen by accident. As a government, we will be continuing our efforts to support job creation and create economic prosperity across Australia and throughout regional communities, particularly in Tasmania. The vaccination program is the next crucial step along our path to economic recovery, and the rollout, which commenced this week, has the economic forecast for 2021 looking more positive. My strong hope and the ambition I share with Tasmanians is that we can get our state back on track and continue on our journey towards economic prosperity as soon as possible. I am confident we can build upon this success to come out of this crisis stronger than ever. Senator Stilljohn. All people, all human beings, everywhere in the world should have access to the essentials we need to live a good life. And all precious places, all plants and animals, everywhere in the world should be protected and preserved. Now, in our part of the world, over the last year, 
People in our community have been struggling. With the twin crises of COVID-19 and the continuing crisis of climate change. Many people who were struggling before COVID-19 hit are doing it even harder now. People have lost work. People are staring down the barrel of losing the roof over their heads when rental moratoriums end in mere weeks' time. The sense of uncertainty in the community, the sense of worry about the future is palpable in Western Australia as it is across the entire of the country. This worry is exacerbated when people look to the very spaces where the solution should be being crafted. Their parliaments at the state level and the federal level. And yet what they see is sanctioned corruption. They see millions of dollars being funded from massive corporations, massive fossil fuel corporations like Chevron, like Woodside, funneling it to one door in the parliament and getting their legislation pumped out the other. In the state of Western Australia, what this means for us is that at a moment when we are faced with the opportunity to rebuild after COVID-19 in a way that addresses the climate crisis, in a way that delivers high quality, free health care and education and affordable housing for everyone, we are instead opening up the Kimberley to fracking, we are instead selling off public housing, we are instead dodging action on climate change, throwing up spoke springs. Mark McGowan's Labour government has been terrible when it comes to climate change. We are the only state without a renewable energy target. The state government has signed off on projects with emissions intensity four times greater than the Adani Carmichael mine. Four times more polluting. At a moment in our history when we know that we need to halve our emissions of carbon dioxide across the decade or face utter disaster. Now, it is these absences of action that are the wellspring of a deep frustration in the community when it comes to the major parties. Because we look at them and we see the reality that whether you're blue or whether you're red, you're taking the same money from the same corporations, giving them the same outcomes, when it is not what the community wants. We, as a community in Western Australia and across the country, want to see action on climate change. We want to see every person have a roof over their head, a place to go home. We want to see education for all, high quality and free, from cradle to grave. This is what we want. This is our demand to those who would seek to form a government in our name. On the 13th of March, we as a community have an opportunity to vote, and I hope that we send many more Greens back to the parliament. Yeah. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak regarding a growing issue in Australian politics, being the increasing entrenchment of a political class in parliaments across the nation. Now, this is a problem which has plagued the political landscape in the United States. And as we speak, recently appointed US President Joe Biden is returning Washington to the political class by appointing a wave of long-time Democratic functionaries, political staffers and lobbyists to key positions in his administration. 
Uh, after all, what could be more diverse than a 78-year-old white bloke who has spent 47 years as a career politician? The politics in the United States is being returned to the swamp, and Australia needs to be careful not to repeat those mistakes by bricking in a political elite of our own. The political class in this country in the past 20 years has been growing. But where did it come from? There has long been a view that the Australian Labor Party and, to an extent, the Australian Greens are too one-dimensional because they enter the workforce through a trade union or a political office and gain entry to parliament by organising numbers at a branch level. So much so that in 2017, former Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke warned that career politicians without enough life experience were letting the public down. Mr Hawke was quoted as saying, my advice consistently to every young person who comes and asks, asks me about entering politics is to make a life first. But in 2021, a rising political class is no longer an issue solely for the Labor Party, as a culture of political elitism is infecting politics at all levels. And in fact, even former Liberal Party Prime Minister John Howard recently lamented the creep of political elites when he said, we have too many people who enter parliament now, particularly at state level, who have no experience in life other than politics. If you're on my side, they skip the trade union and they go on to be politicians. We have too many now, and I think that's part of the problem we face. Now, Parliament is responsible for making and updating laws, for representing the people and holding the government to account for its policies and actions. Parliament needs a range of views from the farthest reaches of our community. A life prior to politics, before Parliament, is so important. Forget quotas, forget diversity based on gender, race, sexual orientation. We need to bring people into parliament from outside the political bubble to avoid stale thinking and cronyism. Beginning a career in a political or ministerial office means that from a young age a person surrounds themselves with politicians, lobbyists and other political staffers. It builds an expectation that the next step is a parliamentary career and it builds a culture of entitlement. Such a limited professional experience perpetuates the culture of cronyism in politics and leaves people vulnerable to limited career prospects post-parliament. The problem is universal. The problem with modern-day politics is the political class itself. Post-politics, many ex-politicians become lobbyists, further perpetuating the culture of political entitlement. Now, Federally, the Liberal Party is lucky enough to have a broad range of experience in its ranks, with many ex-service people, doctors, small business people and professionals. But politics needs people who have had careers and who have come to parliament prepared to speak their minds without fear or favour, to represent the interests of their constituencies, not watch the backs of their political allies or friends from other offices 10 years ago. There are many people who would like to consider a parliamentary career, but many who cannot crack the culture of political elitism. We should be pursuing those who might otherwise run in the opposite direction from public life. That doesn't come from political elites bricking in their own positions, but padding out their post-politics lobbying careers by ensuring their allies gain pre-selection. We must make sure that we clear the way for everyday people to serve this country. Good people who have served their country outside of a parliamentary bubble. That's real diversity. The political class cannot be allowed to dominate the field. Our country deserves better. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr Acting. Deputy President, on the 8th of March, millions of people across the world will be marking International Women's Day. We'll look back and we'll reflect on how far we've come on gender equity. The sobering fact is that we will not see gender parity in our lifetime or our children's lifetime. On current tracking, it will take four to five generations to close the global gender gap. As a woman and as a feminist, that is unpalatable for me. We have fought very hard and we have won battles, many battles. But when I think of what happens right here in my own workplace, reality hits me in the face. We haven't come very far at all. This week and last week, I have been ashamed to work here. I have felt my skin crawl with disgust every time I have walked in here. 
I know that that is nothing compared to what the survivors of sexual assault must have been feeling. I am sorry that the Australian Parliament is hurting and harming women. Brittany Higgins has said that she was sexually assaulted right here in this building. These are allegations of an abhorrent crime committed against a young woman in a place that is charged with the responsibility of keeping our whole society safe. She has said she felt pressured not to proceed with a formal complaint for fear of losing her job. Despite the silencing, Brittany Higgins has shown incredible courage by telling her story and bringing what has been done to her out of the shadows and into the light. Challenging the powerful and the privileged is never an easy task. It's even more difficult for survivors. She should not have had to do this. She should have been listened to and believed at the very start. She should have been safe in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, under whose watch this horrific alleged crime was committed, in one of his minister's offices, claims he knew nothing of it till last week. Frankly, this is hard to believe, given what we know now about how it was dealt with at that time. If he didn't know, then he presides over a culture of cover-ups. This is a culture of don't ask, don't tell, that he has cultivated. He is the highest authority in this country, and he must take responsibility. The culture of Parliament House is broken. There is no doubt about that. But let's not sidestep the failures right at the very top of the broken culture. The failure of the Prime Minister and his ministers to support Brittany Higgins, who is still looking for justice two and a half years on. The failure of ignoring and deflecting issues of bullying and harassment when they've been raised. I often wonder if there is a single woman on this planet who has not experienced unwanted sexual advance, be it verbal or physical, subtle or blatant. Young or old, white, brown or black, executive, teacher, student, political staffer, journalist or wait waitress, famous or completely anonymous. As women, no matter who we are, we are targets. Sexism and sexual abuse in the workplace comes in many shapes, from meetings where women are silenced to uninvited touch and explicitly predatory behavior and violent sexual crimes. It is part and parcel of the patriarchal order and dominant masculinity we all live with. Women get so used to sexual harassment that they feel they have to accept it or brush it off. And there can be no starker example of that than what we have seen here in the last few days. Obfuscation, deflection, victim blaming, everything but taking responsibility for actions. That's the oppression of patriarchy right on display here. It takes immense courage to speak your truth in a world where the perpetrators have the power and the influence, and Brittany Higgins has shown that courage. This is the strength of women and the camaraderie between them that will eventually bring down the patriarchy that runs deep in Parliament Senator and our Scar. society. We will force you to listen. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak uh, about an event I attended on the 14th of February 2021, which was the commemoration of the 79th anniversary of the fall of Singapore during the Second World War. And the commemoration was held at the Brisbane Shrine of Remembrance, and it was hosted by the 2nd 10th Field Regiment Association. I'd like to thank the organisers of the event, uh, in particular the association and its committee, led by Ms Libby Parkinson, OAM, who has organised the annual service for the past 17 years. I'd like to especially, especially thank Mrs Wendy Drysdale, OAM, who is known very well to uh, my friend Senator James McGrath, who's here, who actually delivered a speech at the event this year, and it was a very, uh, it was a very noble and uh, moving speech delivered by Senator McGrath. 
And Mrs Wendy Drysdale, who's helped in, in organising this event over many years, has actually been in hospital. She's not well, and she helped organise this commemoration from her hospital bed. And I think that's just such a, a wonderful example of service to the community uh, that we can all uh, respect, deeply respect. And also acknowledge that it is a bit of a family affair. So Mrs Wendy Drysdale's husband, Mr Jeff Drysdale, also assists, as does, does their daughter, Mrs Lizzie Drysdale Gardner, and, Mr. and her husband, Mr Jason Gardner. Also, I'd like to thank Regimental Sergeant Major Brian Moore, who assisted with the Catafalque party. I'd like to acknowledge that the Honourable Jane Prentice, who some people here would know quite well, who served uh, the, the constituents of the seat of Ryan with great distinction for many years, was also in attendance. And I often say those members who keep attending community events and giving to the community, I think it's a, a sign of, uh, of, and it should be acknowledged, that it's a sign that they served in this place with the right intent to help the community. I'd also acknowledge Councillor Angela Owen, the Salvation Army Band who was in attendance, the police, the QAS and everyone else. Now, the second tenth lost something like a third of its contingent during the course of imprisonment uh, under the Japanese. And there's one story in particular which I'd like to share, which after I first attended this event I've carried with me after I first attended this event, I've carried with me always. And that is the story of Dr Dominic Picconi. Dr Picconi had been a registrar at the Mater Hospital in Brisbane. He had also practised as a GP at Karoi. He was one of the three Australian medical officers who remained with the 2,400 Australian and British POWs at Santa Khan. And you would have heard, everyone here would have heard of the Santa Khan death marches. Dr Picconi and 14 other POWs were executed by the Japanese on 27 August 1945. 27 August 1945. The war actually ended on 15 August 1945 and Dr Picconi and the 14 other POWs were executed by uh, their capitals 12 days after the end of the war so they, they could not give witness to the atrocities which they saw. I'd like to end this contribution this evening with the dedication that appears on the plaque honouring the 2nd 10th Field Regiment at the Australian War Memorial. And I quote, One great benefit to those of us who have survived is the tremendous feeling of comradeship or mateship that exists between us and our families. On our banner of honour, preceding the names of our comrades who were lost in battle are the words, I quote, to live on in the hearts of those we leave behind is not to die. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to draw this place's attention to one of the most beautiful places in the world, the land of the Gunai people. Uh, which is in East Gippsland, thanks, Senator. My people, the Gunai people, are the traditional owners of what is now called Gippsland. It is told that the first Gunai came down from the Northwest Mountains with a canoe on their head. We are the people of the mountains, of the seas, and of the forests. Our people are not from country, we are of country. This is why it pains me that the ancient forests on Gunai country in East Gippsland are under threat from clear, foul logging. To our people, these are not just forests. The forest, from the roots of the trees to the tips of their leaves, is our mother. Today, I want to thank the land defenders who have held off the desecration of country for almost four weeks up on the Arunundra Plateau. Our friends and allies are putting their bodies on the line, as we have for the last 200 years, and stopping the planned logging of one of the last, last 
unburnt areas of forest on country. This country is a refuge for our wildlife, including our sacred totems and creator spirits. They need this land to survive. The Victorian state government's own environmental department said this was an important habitat and that logging is a dangerous threat to our state's endangered animals. Yet the Victorian state government's agency, Vic Forests, does what they want. No consent. Just go in, clear the land. But there are good people who know this and are calling it out. Yesterday, these land defenders also came to the state government's doorstep. They set up a tree sit in the Treasury Gardens as a peaceful protest, speaking up for the Erinundra forests, because the forests can't speak. I am thankful for everyone who acts in solidarity with our people who are also caring for country and who join us to say enough when the bulldozers move in. The traditional country of our people must not be desecrated. There is no consent. The climate science is clear that we must leave carbon stores intact. The ecological science is clear that we need to halt the extinction crisis. Yet the desecration of country because of logging still happens. Now the pockets of forests left untouched by the fire are being logged and destroyed. How much more do you want to take? This destructive colonialism is killing us, it's killing everybody, everybody. And it's killing our planet's life support systems. Those trees, the clean water, the oxygen they produce, that is what keeps us all alive. Can you imagine what kind of country we would have if you just listened to us? If you just took a moment and just heard what we have been saying? Can you imagine what kind of country we would have if you relied on our traditional knowledge, our science? We have been caring for country for thousands and thousands of generations. We know what we are talking about. How can the Andrews government be negotiating a treaty in Victoria while we're still logging it? It's not just a Victorian Labor government with blood on its hands. This government is part of the problem too. The regional forest agreements that allow logging are signed by the Premier of Victoria and the Prime Minister. The Victorian Labor government and this federal government have together announced a major event review of the bushfires. There is no doubt we need a review, but the logging must stop. And this major event review must be led by traditional owners. We need assurance that First Nations voices will be heard in this process. We need to make the transition out of native forest logging now, not in 10 years now. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise uh, this evening to uh, pay tribute to, to, a, uh, to a lady, Denise Jites, uh, who passed away earlier this year after a long battle with cancer. I, I, I'd like to recognise Denise, not, not, not really even mainly be, just because she was a good friend of mine, but uh, because I, I know while people in this chamber wouldn't have known or most people wouldn't know Denise, uh, I think all of us would know someone like Denise uh, in our political parties. It is uh, people like Denise that make all of this possible uh, and uh, for me and I know many others make it all worth it as well. Uh, Denise never sought the uh, the, the accolades or never sought office uh, uh, within our political party, the Liberal National Party, or before that the Nationals Party, but she was a tireless uh, supporter uh, behind the scenes. Without people like Denise, there would be a lot of people who wouldn't even be here. I, I, I count myself in that category. Uh, without people like Denise, there wouldn't be lamingtons and jam scrolls and uh, cups of tea uh, at all our functions. And Without people like Denise, you wouldn't have as much fun that's for sure in what this game can be quite tawdry and dirty from time to time. It was a great loss uh, for our party and, and especially for Denise's family for her to pass away this year at just 69 years of age. Uh, but uh, she led a remarkable life, uh, 
uh, from a small country town, from growing up in a small country town of Bell, uh, down to visiting here in Canberra and uh, uh, moving and shaking with prime ministers, ministers and members of parliament. Uh, as I said, I, I probably wouldn't be here without Denise um, when I was first thinking of, of, uh, of, of pursuing a political career. Someone gave me some advice to say that, look, uh, the most important people you need to convince are, are, are women. Don't worry about the blokes. Uh, convince the women, because the problem is if you get a bloke to decide to vote for you, you've got one vote. If you convince a, a female to vote for you, you'll probably get ten others, because they talk. They talk to people. Men tend not to. And perhaps it was this advice in mind that I, I had very early on called Denise, who I'd, I'd gotten to know a little bit, but not that well at this stage, and uh, asked her for her advice, what I should do. And um, uh, I was pretty chuffed when she was the first person to ever actually say that she'd vote for me. She'd vote for me in a pre-selection, and that gave me, as a, as a young, I suppose, somewhat ambitious uh, potential political candidate, a degree of confidence. My bubble was deflated a little bit, though, a few weeks later when I, when I found out that Denise wasn't actually on LNP State Council and couldn't vote for me anyway. <laughs> but I had already embarked on that, uh, that journey, and, and, and uh, I, I thank Denise uh, for it. Denise, though, despite her strong and long involvement in politics, family was at the centre of her life. And, uh, at just the age of 17, she lost her mother as the eldest child. She effectively became a surrogate mum uh, for her younger sisters. Uh, her, she, she herself went on to have three lovely children, um, Lucinda, Cameron and Julia. Uh, and it was lovely to join uh, Lucinda uh, at the service in Dolby just a few weeks ago. A uh, lovely celebration of Denise's life. Denise's life did, did um, see a fair amount of tragedy. She, she lost her, her, well, her, her son, Cameron, uh, succumbed to blindness at a very young age and, and eventually died in, in 2010, and she lost her husband in 2011. But despite all that sadness, I knew her over that period. As I said, she was a, a guiding light for so many of our party, and she, she was always there to help her local community. She was in politics for the right reasons. She secured funding for local community clubs like the Jandowie Tennis Club, the Jandowie Timber Town. And she's just the heart and soul of uh, people like Denise, the heart and soul of this country uh, that create communities, uh, that uh, maintain friendships. And as I said, really make uh, this, this, uh, this career uh, worth fighting for. And so, as I know that most of you would not know Denise, um, I, I hope that we can all remember the people like Denise that touch our lives in our political parties and movements uh, and cherish them because, as we know, life can be too short uh, uh, and it definitely was uh, for Denise Jites, Vale Denise Jites. Uh, Senator Wishwith. I'd like to make a heartfelt appeal tonight, speaking in the Australian Senate chamber, to US President Joe Biden and the new US Attorney General Merrick Garland. Firstly, Attorney General, congratulations on your recent appointment. My appeal to you is to prioritise, review and walk away from your appeal seeking the extradition of Australian award-winning journalist and WikiLeak founder Julian Assange. While I understand the US Department of Justice recently decided to appeal the UK court's decision not to extradite Julian Assange, I also understand it would have been very out of the ordinary for an acting attorney general waiting for a new attorney general in a new administration to stop any high-profile case before they started. I also understand the US prosecutor in the Assange extradition case recently said there is division within the Department of Justice on proceeding with this appeal. So this is a decision I hope you will no doubt be reviewing and contemplating shortly. Gentlemen, after Judge Vanessa Baraitza on the 5th of January this year accepted all your prosecutions substantive arguments for the extradition of Julian Assange. Legally and politically speaking, you now hold the high ground. You won your moral victory. 
The judge also made it clear by rejecting extradition on mental health grounds that Julian Assange is a broken man and extraditing him would be paramount to murder. You can now stop this extradition appeal with a stroke of a pen. I and many others are asking, why would someone so powerful continue to pursue a sick, broken man? It looks very personal and very political. The full resources of one of the world's great nation states intent on the destruction of one man. That is hardly fair, now is it? My fellow Australian citizens may be many things across all political colours, but we all have an innate sense of fairness. Pursuing Assange will be seen as an overreach. A chorus of voices from around the globe are echoing this. If you proceed with this appeal, you will risk undermining your legal judgment and your high ground, certainly in the court of public opinion. And if Mr Assange dies in prison, you also risk a significant backlash, not to mention martyring him. If you succeed in any appeal and he faces trial in the USA, you risk the actual trial being on the real and existential threats to press freedom, the First Amendment and much, much more, rather than the alleged espionage activities of Assange and WikiLeaks. If you drop this extradition treaty now, your sword or the prospect of another extradition, or worse, will hang over Julian Assange for the rest of his life. You get to have your cake and eat it, politically speaking, if you walk away now. You have made your point. Gentlemen, both of our parliamentary systems are based on the ancient Republic of Rome. One thing the Romans knew too well was that the more powerful you became, the more you needed to be challenged and held to account. Who is there in this day and age to hold the powerful to account? A greatly diminished free press, perhaps, which your extradition threatens to its core? Whistleblowers, who you throw in jail? Your deeply divided partisan political system? I think not. It is if it, gentlemen, if it is not just the destruction of Julian Assange that you seek, but also what he represents, then I ask you to consider this. Politics today feels like it is full of lies and liars. So many lies, layers upon layers of them. Call it our post-truth world or whatever, but we both know it is eating away at our parliaments and institutions of democracy. And you would know this better than anyone. The man whose administration you replaced has been caught out lying over 30,000 times during his presidency. Without a value on truth and truth-telling, there is only one path left to tread. And it gets more dark and more dangerous from here. Again, you should know this better than anyone after the desecration of your own capital, all because of lies, lying with no consequences and no accountability. What is there left if we demonstrate we don't value the truth, especially from our leaders? Lies are the cancer on our polity. You might truly believe that what was published by WikiLeaks on the Iraq war was stolen by a whistleblower, Chelsea Manning, and to quote Mike Pompeo, published by a hostile actor, Julian Assange, and WikiLeaks. But I ask you to please put politics and personality aside and ask yourself, how is it morally hostile that publishing war crimes, other criminality, exposing lies and deceit so that citizens know the truth. How is that hostile? 
I'm sure, like myself, on honest reflection, you were both angered and deeply saddened by some of the terrible things that were made public in these disclosures, things that needed to change. I'd ask you to reflect on the fact that everything published, the documents you are extraditing Assange over, were 100 per cent factual and clearly in the public interest. No lies here. This is beyond dispute. Now, these disclosures may well make you uncomfortable, and the manner in which they were made public may make you angry. But surely citizens have a right to know what is done, the decisions that are made in their names, in their country's names, with their taxpayer dollars, especially when this involves invading another country and the aggression and tragic loss of life involved in a war. And I remind you, reliable estimates and credible estimates have put the civilian death toll of the Iraq war at over a million people. You see, it was a lie and a terrible deceit that led us to war in Iraq in the first place, your country and mine, and manufactured deception by some of the most powerful people and organisations on this planet. Perhaps the most egregious, dangerous lie of our time. And it appears they have all got away with it. By going after my fellow countryman Julian Assange, you are going after the truth teller of this terrible war, this dark chapter in our collective history. And by doing so, you are reminding people of this lie. They will not forget this. It is not acceptable to send any messages that crimes can be covered up and truth tellers prosecuted and persecuted in the name of secrecy and national security. I invite you to reflect on how this looks and how this extradition appeal process will simply continue to erode trust in our political leadership, in our democracy, in our institutions and, importantly, in our nation's deep and abiding friendship, but most importantly in eroding the value of truth and truth-telling. I trust you are honest men and you value the truth and the importance of protecting press freedoms, especially at this juncture in history. Once more, I invite you to reflect on what is really at stake here and choose the truth. It's not too late, and history will judge you well for this intervention. Thank you. Senator Ferravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I have previously suggested the time has come for a Royal Commission into the relationship between the Victorian Labor Government and Victoria Police. With spectacular timing, yesterday Premier Andrews initiated a royal commission into Crown Casino, saying it was about making sure that those who hold a casino licence in Victoria uphold the highest standards of probity and integrity and that they're accountable for their actions. Perhaps that was the reason, or was it, as journalist Damon Johnson suggested, Andrews was beginning to look exposed and so made the classic, if you're going to go late, you've got to go big political move. One can only assume that Victoria Police, who govern the application of the laws in Victoria, would be held to an equal or higher standard than casino operators. If Crown Casino events are sufficient to justify a royal commission, then the events of the Pell case would, to borrow a gaming phrase, present a royal flush. A royal commission would be about much more than Cardinal Pell. It would be about whether the people of Victoria can have confidence in the probity and integrity of their police force. Even prior to the Pell investigation, charges, trial and unjust imprisonment, there was an indication that some within the highest ranks of Victoria Police were not willing to tell inconvenient truths that didn't match up to the prevailing narrative pushed by certain media outlets. Detective Sergeant Carson of Ballarat Police produced two reports in September 2011 and February 2012 into suicides in Victoria that were linked to childhood sexual assault by clergy members. The Carson reports claimed that there was an inordinate number of suicides that appeared to be a consequence of sexual offending. They claimed that 43 suicide deaths 
had occurred as a result of clerical sexual abuse and called for an inquiry which, the report said, would likely uncover many more deaths as a consequence of clergy sexual abuse of which the Catholic Church would no doubt be aware but had chosen to remain silent. The call for an inquiry was successful and Carson's reports had the desired effect, but only after those reports were provided to sympathetic media. On 13 April 2012, The Age published an article quoting the leaked reports at length. Four days later, the Victorian parliamentary inquiry into the handling of child abuse by religious and other organisations was announced. The claims of 43 suicides was also gained the attention of the Victorian coroner, who was urged to reopen the investigations into these deaths based on the Car Carson reports. The coroner referred the matter back to Victoria Police, whose sexual crime squad investigated the veracity of the claims made in the reports. This investigation became known as Operation Plangeur. It was tasked with seeking to substantiate the scope of the issues outlined in the Carson reports, including the identification of the persons mentioned, their living status, and if they were deceased, the cause and, and any associated factors contributing to their death. Despite being handed down on 1 November 2012, less than two weeks after the commencement of the Victorian parliamentary inquiry, Plangeur, the, the Operation Plangeur report was not made public until May 2015, long after the uh, parliamentary inquiry had completed its work and delivered its findings. The Plangeur investigation completed, completely decimated the claims made in the Carson reports. It said that there were severe limitations to the data supplied by Detective Sergeant Carson, including matters such as full names, birth dates, addresses or information about the alleged offenders or offences. The missing information could not be verified in most cases because no source was provided for the claim that a suicide death had occurred. There were no dates provided for the reports being made, how the person reporting the death made contact or who they were made contact with. When the Plangeur team sought more detail from Carson, it found that he could not provide any further information or records to substantiate the claims in his reports. Plangeur found that it could only positively identify 25 persons of the 43 persons alleged to have commit, committed suicide as a direct result of alleged instances of childhood sexual assault by clergy members. Of those 25, that were capable of being positively identified, only 16 had been categorised as having committed suicide and only four were the victims of childhood sexual assault. Of those four, only one case had identified childhood sexual assault by a member of the clergy as a contributing factor in the motivations of the person for their suicide. Despite the findings essentially destroying the narrative of an epidemic of suicide as a result of clergy sexual abuse and despite their relevance to the parliamentary inquiry, the Plangeur report would remain confidential for another two and a half years. It is important to pause at this point and be absolutely clear. All suicide deaths are a tragedy and even one death or one attempted suicide because of clergy sexual abuse is inexcusable. But justice requires that the truth be told. Regrettably, the truth of this report was not told to the parliamentary inquiry. When then Deputy Commissioner Ashton appeared before the inquiry, he was asked about the alleged suicides. He was um, asked whether he had seen an increase in suicides as a consequence of the abuse and whether he had the data to support it. His response was, I need to tread a little carefully on the suicide issue. Earlier this year, we received a report from one of our detectives regarding work that was being pulled together on the issue of suicides as a result of clergy abuse. We have seen suicides as a result of clergy abuse. In relation to the material that was provided to us in a compiled format earlier this year, we met with the coroner and discussed the issues around those particular alleged suicides. I think there were 43 in number that were talked about at the broad level that needed to be looked at. The coroner asked us to do a review of those individual cases to determine whether she, would, she should reopen any of the matters. We have now concluded that research and we will be in a position very shortly, maybe in the next a week or two to go back to see the coroner and give her the results of that work. So I am just a bit reluctant in open forum to provide you with those details. While Ashton was not um, perhaps in a position to detail the findings uh, to the inquiry, he would no no nonetheless have been in a position to know that the claim of the 43 suicides had no data behind it. It was totally disingenuous of him to repeat that figure and place it on the parliamentary record when it was false 
and it was clear that it would be revised down to a single death. Um, this allowed a narrative of an extremely high rate of clergy abuse to play out um, nationally through the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse because that was well underway. In many corners, this narrative is still, still prevalent, demonstrating just how damaging those allegations based on unverified information were. So what was the motivation of Victoria Police in keeping the information secret for so long? Why did Ashton wait until July 2013 to tell the Victorian Parliament that the claim was overstated and lacking in evidentiary, uh, an evidentiary basis? Why did Ashton also not provide a correction to media outlets who had received and reported on the overstated claims? Why did the Plangeur report, which was completed more than 12 months before the inquiry handed down its final report? So there was ample opportunity to correct the record, uh, but this wasn't done. Ashton continued to feature heavily in the Pell saga as Chief Commissioner from 2015 to 2020. It was he, Ashton, who oversaw the public appeal by Victoria Police Task Force Sano for victims at St Patrick's Cathedral to step forward. He was the one who approved his then deputy and now successor, Shane Patton, to travel to Rome to interview Pell. Um, it was Ashton who was in the top job when they decided to lay charges against Pell. At every stage, Ashton was in a position of influence. And in her book, uh, Louise Milligan notes that Operation Plangeur report unwittingly undermined the force's new commissioner, that is Graham Ashton, and the police case against Pell. It might be inferred that the dogged pursuit of charges against Pell, even in light of the mountain of contradicting uh, evidence, was an attempt to save face, but without a proper inquiry the Victorian public will never know. In some ways the story of the Carson reports and the grossly overstated number of suicides is a small matter in a much larger story of abuse and cover-up in institutions, of police leaking information to media and keeping contradictory reports secret, of allowing media outlets like Fairfax and the ABC to create a narrative that saw an innocent man imprisoned for more than a year. Looking at the matters pertaining to the Crown Casino matter, which have only yesterday seen a Royal Commission launched in the state of Victoria, the Pell case provides even further reason for a royal commission into Victoria Police to restore confidence and to ask deep questions about government manipulation of people's lives for the sake of the political process. To be continued. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to leader, teacher, wise man and Walpuri warrior, Mr Jagamara Nelson. A gentleman who led the way walking in two worlds, Jagamara was a land rights champion from the early days. Born on Mount Doreen Station, Mr Nelson was six years old when his family was moved to Yundamu, a welfare ration depot around 1946. He was the fifth of nine siblings and his father had four wives. Even though he only attended the community school until grade five, he benefited from additional tuition by Baptist missionary Tom Fleming. I was lucky, he recalled, in the Central Land Council's oral history collection, every hill got a story. The Whitefellow missionary used to teach me after hours to give me extra education. That's where I managed to pick up my command of English. Jagamara considered himself blessed to have received a two-way education with regular breaks from settlement life. You'd go to church every Sunday, he said, practice our culture every night if possible. After a mechanic apprenticeship, Jagamara attended Teachers College in Darwin and returned to the Yundamu School to teach, becoming one of the first Aboriginal teachers in Central Australia. After five years teaching, he joined the Department of Aboriginal Affairs to support the outstation movement as an assistant community advisor. During early Central Land Council meetings, he worked as a Walpuri interpreter and went on to represent the Central Land Council as an active member nationally and also internationally. He was a champion of Aboriginal-led economic development, 
serving on the advisory committee of the Aboriginal Benefits Account and as the director of Yundamu's Yapakalangu Ngura Aboriginal Corporation. Jagamara was a passionate supporter of the Yundamu football club, the Mighty Magpies, serving as president for many years. He was a strong advocate against the Northern Territory intervention, and he spoke publicly many times about the impacts of this destructive legislation on his community and his family. I'd like to share some of his words on that that were reported in the media in 2016. The intervention came in when we were getting into self-government. I'm talking about Yundamu. We were controlled, the workforce here, it all worked out. Then new laws came in. Me personally, that broke my heart. It chopped the wings off the dreams I had of improving the living conditions of the people here. Ten years later, it's still hurting. I am anyway, definitely. We could have been miles in front by now. Intervention money should have spent on roads, going out to the homelands, drilling rigs, good supplies of water." End of quote. Jagamara left us still advocating for better roads, better housing, better education in the bush. He was a lifelong advocate for truth-telling, with one of his last public appearances as MC at the 90th anniversary of the Coniston Massacre commemoration in 2018. He was still working for his people and his community despite ill health until his passing. I had the personal pleasure of working beside him for many, many years in my time as member for Arnhem and as a minister for statehood in the Northern Territory, where Mr Nelson would advise me quietly, confidently, growl me at times about the direction to empower First Nations people, but to empower the Northern Territory people to become the seventh state in the Australian Federation. Following the last CLC elections in 2019, he told the many new young delegates why he was not yet ready to retire then. <coughs> We're still very strong and still battling with the government and others who are damaging our country. I'm talking about the mining companies. That's why I joined the Central Land Council, he said. To the senators here, and to his family and all the families in Central Australia, I wish to express that my thoughts are with Mr Nelson's wife Lynette, his children and families, and my sincere condolences to all of you on this sadness, but also to remember the incredible legacy he leaves not only to you, his family, but indeed to all the people of the Northern Territory. Mr Acting Deputy President, Mr President, I would like to pay tribute to Kunmanara Nipa, Anangu Elder, who recently left us, and one of the principal figures in the history and development of Uluru Karajuda National Park. Mrs Nipa was born in the Western Desert. It's estimated that she was born in the late 1920s, making her well into her 90s when she passed away. A senior Anangu woman, Mrs Nipper played a key role in the campaign for land rights and the handing back of Uluru to traditional owners in the 1980s. She, she helped establish the joint management arrangements for Uluru Karajuda National Park and was a tireless board member for many years. Mrs Nipper was involved in almost every aspect of park work at Uluru, from manual labour to establishing three park businesses and the cultural centre through to negotiations with federal and northern territory ministers. Mrs Nipper was a formidable tracker. Her skills were particularly highlighted with her tracking of the infamous dingo in the Azaria Chamberlain case in the 1980s. Her contribution to her people and the development of Uluru Karajuda National Park was recognised in 2006 with an Order of Australia medal. My sincere condolences go out to Mrs Nipper's family and many friends, supporters and admirers, not just in Central Australia but right across the Northern Territory and indeed Australia. And I say thank you for the legacy and work of Mrs Nipper and all she did for her people. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to speak about Australian timber. Proper plans 
require careful consideration of the variables, setting measurable outcomes, meaningful participation from stakeholders and commitment to implementation. Plantation timber and forestry is a long game. There's a saying, it takes nine months to have a baby. Well, it takes 25 years to grow a tree to the point in which it can be harvested and processed. So in the timber industry, you know, knee-jerk knee reactions, that can't change anything. And catchy slogans can't change things. And even lots of money can't change things. Growth of uh, properly managed and sustained timber industry uh, brings a whole range of benefits to Australia. The timber industry is, manuf is manufacturing. It's industry where Australia adds value, taking raw products through each of the processing stages. Trees are good for the environment, with carbon sequestration, provision of transpiration and shelter. In 2018, there were about 70,000 Australians directly employed in the industry. The sector generates $23 billion of economic activity. Growth of the Australian forestry sector is not new. It's been a policy objective of successive Australian governments for some time. So go back to 1992, where we had the National Forestry Policy Statement. 1997, we had Plantations for Australia, the 2020 vision. Now, of course, 2020 has passed, and in March uh, 2020, at estimates, uh, the government was asked what the final assessment of this program was, and the answer was a report was being prepared and should be available by the end of the year. We haven't seen that. And then, of course, in 2018, another program, Growing a Better, uh, Better Australia, a billion trees for jobs and growth. A key theme of the 2018 plan was over the, the next decade a billion new trees were to be planted in forestry plantations. Now, if you do the sums over uh, 12 years to, uh, uh, to uh, 2030, that's, bit, that's about 20, uh, sorry, 83 million trees per annum. Okay, and uh, on top of that, what we need to do is uh, additionally add about 70 million trees per annum to take the, uh, the, the harvested trees or to replace the harvested, harvested trees uh, from the plantations. Now, the program is intended to, to boost the Australian economy, drive jobs and growth. Now, it was announced uh, um, in 2018. $20 million over four years out to 21-22. Now, nominally, we're about 65 per cent of the way through the period of funding, but there's no evidence of increased planting. In March uh, 2020, when the department was asked how many trees have been planted under the program to date and where have the new trees been planted, the department responded with this, and I quote, the 2019-20 bushfires have had significant impacts on plantation forests in some regions. In these areas, it's likely that plantation owners will be investing in plantation re-establishment re initially. The full detailed assessment, analysis and planning by the individual companies is still underway. Now, there's Sir Humphrey Appleby speaking, if I've ever, if I've ever heard it. Basically, covering up the fact that I don't think anything has been done. Now, I'll be asking questions at the next estimates uh, next month to see what's happening. Now, of course, I understand that bushfires did have an impact. In terms of planta commercial plantation, uh, plantations affected by the fire, about 130,000 hectares. In South Australia, there was uh, 15,275 hectares of forestry lost, with an economic cost in excess of $140 million. So, just to understand when we're planting trees, we're trying to get uh, about um, 83 million new trees a year, plus 70 million to replace what's being harvested, harvested. But we also have to deal with the fact that we lost a lot of trees in the fires. Now, 
I've recently been told that uh, some plantain, pl plantation owners are not replanting because they can't secure access to water. Now, that will be a further hit to the industry and those that work in it uh, with a flow-on effect to the market with the reduction of products. So there's a huge disconnect. There's a disconnect between announcements and delivery, and we have to think very carefully about this. Now, in terms of shortages, the previously alluded to uh, forecast shortages are, for a variety of reasons, being felt by our population, with uh, potentially worse to come. Now, just we we all recall Home Builder, and I'm not going to be critical of the program. Uh, st stimulation of the building se sector is a good concept. People need houses, building trades need work, it's good for training, and it puts more money into the economy. However, what if this drives us into a shortage of materials? Are we setting ourselves up to fail? In June 2020, the forecast was that residential construction would decline, expected to be about 37 per cent lower than the previous forecast despite the fact that there were more than 3,100 homes destroyed in the bushfires. From an ABS-issued media release of 3 February this year, they have said private sector house approvals rose for the sixth consecutive month in December. Now, dwelling approvals rose across all states in seasonally adjustable, uh, adjusted terms. Tasmania led the way, rising 66.5 per cent, followed by Queensland, with 24 per cent, South Australia with 16.7 per cent, Victoria 8.6 per cent, Western Australia 7.8 per cent and New South Wales 1.8 per cent. In uh, December 2020, dwelling approvals were up 10.9 uh, per cent. For, um, private sector uh, houses had increased by 15.8 per cent, a record high. So, We've got lots and lots of demand, lots and lots of demand, but access to timber is down. Timber merchants can't get timber. Builders can't uh, get the timbers. Carpenters can't get timber. Domestic sawmills are running at capacity. Now Australia is a net importer of timber. There's been an in impact on those supplies. We're being outbid uh, uh, with. Uh, our colleagues or our friends in the United States. So we're now in a situation where we're pushing businesses who can't source timber, who have, uh, they have work, they simply can't get the product necessary to do the job, uh, that we're pushing them into operating and ultimately financial stress. So we've got this fragility in our supply chain, so we need action. At the first instance, the government needs to extend the period to commence construction for the Home Builder program. This would provide some immediate release, relief, and I note the Senate passed a motion to that order last week. But this is clearly going to be an issue for the longer term. We'll have to look at mechanisms to better utilise our timber, alternate building constructions such as double brick, uh, product variances, use of laminated or structural timbers. What can we do to advance? timber recycling. Let's stimulate investment in the timber industry. Of further concern is the government's plan for uh, manufacturing, uh, repeatedly, repeatedly overlooking the, uh, the, the timber uh, industry. Australians, individuals and businesses are fed up about studies and the launch of plans or strategies. They want to see a plan that's implemented with measurable milestones which actually work towards realistic goals. Lip service and slogans, but no meaningful action, actioning of plans, is not a good way forward. Thank you. Senator Rice. I rise tonight to speak out about human rights violations. The Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected in all countries and for all people. And that includes criticising our own government here in Australia when we believe that we should be doing more to protect human rights, and there is certainly more that we can be doing. 
I want to particularly mention the Universal Periodic Review, which is the UN Human Rights Council human rights review process that occurs every five years. And Australia has recently appeared before the UPR Working Group. Now, I want to mention particularly the issue that was highlighted by a coalition of non-government organisations in their report that was submitted as part of the UPR process. And they said the growing Black Lives and Aboriginal Lives Matter movements have drawn fresh attention to the long struggle of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to address systemic racism, police brutality and deaths in custody. And a crucial issue here is the long-standing community-led campaign to raise the age of legal responsibility. More than two dozen countries through the UPR process have pressured Australia to raise the age of legal responsibility. The current minimum age of legal responsibility across the country is only 10. Ten-year-olds are children. And in 2019, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommended that the age should be increased to at least 14, and Australia has repeatedly failed to act on this issue. And this low age of legal responsibility particularly hurts First Nations children. While First Nations young people make up only 6 per cent of young people aged between 10 and 17, they make up approximately 57 per cent of those in youth detention. And this is not because they commit more crime, but because they are over-targeted, over-policed and punished harsher and more often than their non-First Nations counterparts. So then, as well as human rights in Australia, we call for action by governments all around the world to protect human rights, wherever attacks on human rights occur. And sadly, I want to start with in India, where the government is increasingly undermining human rights. In its 2020 report, Freedom House said, the Indian government has taken its Hindu nationalist agenda to a new level with a succession of policies that abrogate the rights of different segments of its Muslim population, threatening the democratic future of a country long seen as a potential bulwark of freedom in Asia and the world. And concerningly, these steps by the Indian government can, will have implications and do have implications for the sustainability of democracy. Freedom House said the BJP has distanced itself from the country's founding commitment to pluralism and individual rights, without which democracy cannot long survive. And sadly, we've seen that shift towards nationalism and a willingness to undermine human rights play out in multiple areas. We're particularly concerned that Amnesty India was forced to close its offices. Now, I've spoken previously about our concerns for the farmers pro protesting for their rights and the need to protect them from corporations exploiting small farmers. And we affirm our solidarity with those farmers and their right to protest. I also want to particularly mention the case of Disha Ravi, who is a young activist who was recently detained, which reflects a worrying pattern of attacking environmental activists. So I'm calling for the Indian government to ensure that she has the full protection of the law and is not simply persecuted because the government is sensitive about her environmental activism. In another concerning instance of human rights being undermined, I want to particularly mention a new report by Amnesty International titled Old Ghosts in New Garb, Sri Lankans Return to Fear. As the executive summary of that report states, the Sri Lankan government has launched a renewed crackdown on dissent. Civil society organisations and human rights defenders are under renewed attack by the government and face numerous challenges to operate freely and, safe and safely. In only a year after a new government came into power in 2019, the authorities have escalated this into a full assault on dissent, where a climate of fear and censorship has quickly expanded around the country, targeting key voices critical of the government and human rights defenders. And that concern for the ability of human rights defenders to dissent, to protest and to speak up it matches what I've heard from community groups here in Australia. Now, I want to particularly thank tonight the range of community organisations and their rep representatives who took the time to meet with me in Melbourne recently and share their profound concerns about what's been happening in Sri Lanka. They particularly raise concerns about forced cremations of COVID-19 victims. And despite a recent announcement by Sri Lanka's Prime Minister that the forced cremation policy would no longer apply, the government appears to have backtracked. 
And as Human Rights Watch noted, despite the pledge, the government has, has continued to forcibly cremate Muslims and is backtracking by claiming the policy can only be changed following deliberations by an expert committee. Now, I want to also mention a particular issue that the community groups raised with me about the destruction of a monument to Tamils killed in the conflict. And I'm concerned about the destruction of this monument and the threat to erase the memory of those who have died. I want to particularly mention some of the words that were shared with me in my meeting last week, as they're incredibly powerful. And they said, this wasn't just a monument built with stones, cement and sand. It was a painstakingly crafted structure uh, depicting skulls and lifeless bodies with hands reaching out to heavens for protection from the rain of artillery shells. The monument bore no names or numbers. Built 10 years after the end of the war, the sculptor's sole purpose was to convey the indescribable agony inflicted on the people by the tyranny of war. It was an artwork with a message for both the victors and the vanquished. So I say to those community groups who are very concerned about Sri Lanka, we see you, we hear you, and we call upon the Sri Lankan government to reverse these policies and to protect the human rights of all of its citizens. And we urge our Australian government, particularly Minister Payne, to raise this issue with, this, with our Sri Lankan counterparts at both ambassadorial and ministerial level. I now want to highlight the human rights situation in Pakistan, in particular the disappearance of Idris Khattak. He's a human rights defender, a former consultant with Amnesty International, and he worked extensively on forced disappearances, which makes what has happened to him even more concerning. He was taken in November 2019, and it has only been very recently that the authorities have confirmed that he's in their custody. He must receive a fair process, not to be held indefinitely under their official secrets acts. His family have only recently had access to him and he's at risk of COVID-19 in the prison. And in particular, I want to share the words of his brave daughter, Talia Kutik. My father, Idris Kutak, a devoted human rights defender and the most selfless man I know, was forcibly disappeared on the 13th of November 2019. My father is not a case file. He is a human being who cannot be wiped away like an inconvenient streak of dirt. He is a person and he deserves the protection of the law. So we call upon the government of Pakistan to address this issue. They should immediately release Idris Khattak unless there is sufficient credible evidence that he has committed an internationally recognised offence. And in the meantime, they should ensure that he is remanded by a civilian, not a military court, and granted a fair trial quickly. And finally, we urge the government of Pakistan to sign the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance, because despite public commitments in 2019, that has not yet occurred. It would be a welcome step. I want to also thank the Kurdish community groups that I met with recently, and we're particularly concerned about the arrest of Kurdish mayors in Turkey. I would like to note the comments from Human, right, Human Rights Watch here that the Erdogan government refuses to distinguish between the PKK and the democratically elected People's Democratic Party, which won 11.7 per cent of the national vote in the 2018 parliamentary elections and was elected in 65 local municipalities in the 2019 local elections. And former party co-chairs Selahattin Dermatash and Figen Yusegdag have been in detention since November 2016. Turkey has refused to comply with the 2020 European Court of Human Rights ruling that Dermatash should be immediately released. So we call upon the Turkish government to protect human rights and ensure due process for all its citizens and for those whom it's imprisoned, and not to be using criminal prosecutions for, for political purposes. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. I know better to expect a good outcome from this government. I'd settle for good enough, but there's good, there's good enough, then apparently there's 25 bucks a week. So I guess that's good enough. I've seen all the outrage from people saying that, $20, that 25 a week is a slap in the face for people who need help. I've got to say I get where that, that's coming from. Really, people have been calling out for so long for a pretty basic bit of help. A bit of help they get is not really enough. It isn't enough to put food in kids' bellies and get their parents into a decent suit, and certainly not enough to get them out to a job interview. 
If you go to a doctor and the doctor says, take four tablets a day or you'll die, it's not better than nothing to take one tablet a day. We're lifting a payment that left people in desperate poverty to a level where they're still going to be living in desperate poverty. I can't applaud that. I just can't. As a matter of fact, I find it extremely heartless. And this is what gets me the most. The government's come out today and said it's time for people on Job Seeker to go and find some work. Good on you. People are going to have to go out and do 15 job applications a fortnight through April and then back to 20 in July. I know a lot of people won't like that part, but I reckon the government's right that people should be getting out there and getting some work now that things are picking up a little. But whatever the government says about wanting people to get into work, they're not actually going to support them to do it. That's because the income tests are coming back in April too, and anyone who works two shifts a fortnight will lose half the money they made in their second day of work. They'll lose more than half of what they make on the third day. Not very encouraging, not exactly a carrot at the end of the stick. Oh, it looks like we're going backwards, back to where we were before COVID. It baffles me, it baffles me that Liberal National Party politicians come to this chamber every day and tell us that the best form of welfare is to get a job when they're slapping a great big tax on anyone who actually manages to land one, let alone makes the effort to work extra hours because you're just going to take the money basically back off them. I, I just don't get the weather encouraged. I'm missing the whole encouragement thing here. Sorry, I'm just not, not getting the whole carrot. You're out there high and, high and mighty telling people to pull their finger out and you're punishing them while they're, while they're actually doing it. How does that make any sense? How is that fair? How is that Australian? It's no wonder people are outraged. What we've seen today is just completely and utterly outrageous. But the sad fact of the matter is that this place will let them get away with it. I'm not going to stand in the way of poor people getting more money, all of 50 bucks a fortnight, 25 bucks a week, not even a cup of coffee each day for seven days a week. Yep, that'd be right. And if the government was going to offer unemployed people so much as a bus ticket, I'd wave it through. Not because it's all that they need, but because there's much more, because there's much more than they need. And any start's better than not starting. So let me make a prediction. I know what's going to happen here. We'll get 30 speeches attacking the government for being stingy. Then we'll get 30 speeches praising the government for being generous. And then the Senate will all vote to agree with each other to give these poor people 50 bucks a fortnight. That's how it'll work. Because Labor won't have the guts to stand up and say, no way, You're not we're not going to accept this 50 bucks. We just won't, because it's not enough. They'll say, bugger these, stand if we do, Dan, if we don't, and we'll just give them 50 bucks, that's it, and we'll walk off. That's how it's going to happen. The fact that we don't have the option is pretty damning, to be honest, and things are so bad, anything is better than this. Every time I speak with the government about ways to help people on Job Seeker, I'm told it's too expensive. Don't worry about the results, but it's too expensive. Then I come back with ways to help people on Job Seeker that's less expensive. I've told, oh, guess what? It's too difficult to administer. Like the top of the public service aren't paid more than enough money to get the job done. Then I come back with ways to help people on Job Seeker that's less expensive, that's easy to administer, and then I'm told the politics are too difficult. Jeez, can't win here. And I'm starting to think they just don't want to help people on Job Seeker. As a matter of fact, they just don't want to help the most vulnerable. $9 billion helping people who need is a massive, massive deal, and I understand that. But you can't point to the fact that they're spending $9 billion on this as evidence of how generous you actually are. I mean, we've seen those big tax cuts you've given in 24-25. Trust me. I'm not, I just don't take you that seriously anymore. That's how Job Seeker is. You're going to throw $9 billion at a problem and still have people unable to pay off their bills. That's not something to brag about. You can't brag about that. You can draw attention to the fact you're spending $9 billion on this problem by all means, but you can't expect to get praised for it. If you're bragging about how it's going to cost $9 billion to fix a problem you created, someone has to explain to you what bragging means, because it's not bragging rights. The fact that it isn't enough is all that you should need to know about how bad we've let things slide. The government is out there saying this is the biggest increase in 30 years. <laughs> That's because there hasn't been an increase in 30 years. You could tell people on Job Seeker you're giving them an extra 40 cents for a phone call and you'd still get to call, call it the biggest increase in 30 years. As much, we, as, much as we'd all like this to be higher, higher, it's also fair to say that it could still be lower. 
You've got to be grateful for that, I guess. Maybe we're all like punch-drunk boxers that have been fighting for so long we keep swinging even after the bells have rung. Because I'd be honest, $9 billion is better than no billion. $44 a day is better than $40 a day, but living on $44 is still really awful. You ask anybody on JobSeeker whether they'd like us to vote for an extra $25 a week, and they'd ask us if we had two heads, because, of course, they want that. Just because they need more doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need they don't need this. Starting somewhere is much better than not starting, apparently. But I'm treating this like a starting position, not a final position. We're not going to get what we need if we, want the, if we wait for the government to hand it over. That's not how, how we do things. I'll talk to the government about how we can make this situation better. And when they tell me it's impossible, like they usually do, because it's all too hard, you know, or it just doesn't suit their agenda, I'll tell them that's what we, you've been saying about raising the rate for the last 30 years. Today, proof, today is proof that it's actually not impossible. It's just hard work. That's what, last I checked, that's what we're elected to do. Earlier today, Mr Minister Birmingham was good enough to answer some questions about a friend who I know is looking for a job. I'm delighted to help my friend find a $400,000 a year tax funder, taxpayer funded job. I'm all about creating jobs for people who need a hand to find work. It's hard out there for ex-government members of parliament. So I'm delighted to hear Mr Birmingham tell the Senate that my mate should send in his resume. I'm delighted to hear he'll be in the mix for the next plum job that's up for grabs. And why wouldn't he be? He's got all the, qualification you, all the qualifications you need. I mean, let's be honest, he used to be a Liberal member of parliament. Surely that gives you all the qualifications you need for a $400,000 $400, a plum job. Sure, when he was a Liberal uh, member of parliament, he was censured by his own government for working as a lobbyist while he was working as a member of parliament. What's a little conflict of interest between friends, eh? Nothing wrong with that up here, surely. Standard procedure. Sure, he was being paid by the taxpayer to represent them. Sure, he was being paid by his lobbying clients to represent them. And sure, he was working against government policy to help his clients. Well, that's all good. That's what a good lobbyist does, apparently. There's nothing we can do to stop him doing that because he's not a member of parliament. Plus, it's not technically a breach of the lobbying code of conduct to be a member of parliament while you're also a lobbyist. Because let's be honest, the lobbying code of conduct isn't worth the paper it's written on. So if anything, he's overqualified. God bless him. It'd be hard not to be. What would you have to do to disqualify yourself for a plum gig up here these days? The only qualifications you seem to need is a blue tie and the title of former member of parliament. You can take a job as a lobbyist while you're working as a member of parliament. If you don't disclose, all you have to do is apologise. So I'll get him to chuck his resume in, shall I? Even if there's no jobs going publicly, doesn't mean there isn't one going privately now, does it? That's how it works up here. Jobs for mates. And when the right ex-member of parliament comes along, you don't need a selection criteria because that doesn't suit you or them. You don't even need to advertise a role. You find a way to pay them six figures because that's what matters, doesn't, doesn't it? It's not about the country. It's about looking after your mates first. That seems to be the practice these days up here in parliament. All about mates, not who is best for the job, not who should have the job not who is most qualified to have the job, but as long as they're a mate first, that is the first criteria. That's how it works. No rules, no standards. Get a mate, you're a mate. That's wonderful. Uh, let's go. You can have your 400000 bucks a year. Thanks for coming. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to sp speak about one of the major issues facing my home state of Queensland, and that is preserving jobs uh, as we recover from COVID-19. I especially want to talk about the threat to Queensland jobs in an industry that my state is known around the world for, and that is tourism. Uh, we are well known right around the world for our incredible tourism icons, ranging from the Great Barrier Reef uh, to Fraser Island, uh, to the rainforest, to the outback and many more beaches and many other attractions as well. 
Uh, and the tourism industry supplies tens of thousands of jobs right around Queensland, literally from the tip of Cape York right down to Coolangatta and all the way out west as well. Uh, and right now, tourism businesses and tourism workers are really hurting as a result of COVID-19, the restrictions on people's travel, uh, especially from international destinations. Uh, I've met with tourism businesses and tourism workers everywhere from Cairns to the Gold Coast and everywhere in between who've told me how hard they have been finding the last 12 months and how fearful they are about the conditions that lie ahead. Of course, these problems are magnified by the fact that international borders remain closed indefinitely. None of us know when international travel will resume to Queensland or to anywhere else in Australia. And for those parts of my home state which are particularly dependent on international tourists, there is a very grim future ahead indeed. Uh, what is an even more imminent threat, though, is the government's impending removal of JobKeeper in only a few weeks' time. The only thing that has been keeping tourism businesses and tourism jobs afloat in Queensland over the last few months is the government's JobKeeper payment, a payment which is worth remembering is something that the federal opposition encouraged the government to do in the first instance. We have been very supportive of the government paying JobKeeper to tourism and other businesses as an important means of keeping jobs afloat, both in the tourism industry and in other industries again. Uh, but the reality is that conditions are still very tough, particularly in the tourism industry in many parts of Queensland, uh, and removing JobKeeper will literally uh, ring the death knell for many tourism businesses and tourism jobs right around our state. Now, if you listen to the government, including in question time today, everything's fine. Everything's going to be fine when JobKeeper is cut off at the end of March because the, two, the, indus, the industries across the country and the economy generally are on the rebound. Every time we hear a government member say that, it just demonstrates how spectacularly out of touch the government is with the real world that exists in many parts of Queensland now, particularly those parts of Queensland that rely on the tourism industry. Only a couple of weeks ago I was in Cairns uh, with Senator Nita Green and the Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers meeting with tourism businesses and tourism workers, and you could literally tell the fear that these people had, people who had put all of their life savings into running a business and into employing people, uh, who had been running these businesses for decades and were now faced with imminent closure because of the government's stubbornness and refusal to extend JobKeeper where it is des desperately needed. And we keep being assured by government ministers that not only are things on the improve and everything is going to be fine, but they keep hinting at some kind of package that they're going to have for the tourism industry. And in the meantime, everyone should just be patient and put up with things as they currently stand. Again, this just shows how incredibly out of touch the government is with what is actually happening in the real world in the Queensland tourism industry right now. We are already seeing big and small tourism businesses around Queensland laying off workers because they have no certainty about what this government is going to do once JobKeeper is, is finished. This isn't a matter of businesses just sitting tight, waiting until they get an announcement from the government about their future and keeping people on. The reality is that businesses are making hard decisions right now to lay off uh, dozens and, in some cases, hundreds of staff, people who have worked in the tourism industry for a very long time and who we will want working in the tourism industry when we can eventually have international tourists coming back to our country. So it is deeply unfortunate that the government just seems to think that everything's going to be fine, they don't need to rush, they'll get there in their own time. In the meantime, businesses should just keep on chugging on, even though they've got no revenue coming in. Uh, the reason that these businesses have been able to stay afloat is because the government has been propping them up with the JobKeeper payment. And the minute that is removed, in the absence of an influx of tourists who aren't actually able to get to the country, then these businesses will go to the wall and we will see even more job losses right around Queensland in this incredibly important industry. Now, you know, it's not just me saying this. I noticed a report in uh, the Sunday Mail uh, in Queensland on the weekend. Uh, headed how 10,000 tourism firms could go broke. It says that recent research predicted up to a quarter of Queensland's 40,000 tourism businesses could go broke as a result of the devastating impact of the coronavirus and the looming end on March 28 of the JobKeeper supplement, which has helped to keep many businesses afloat. On the Gold Coast, 
Aqueduct Saf Safaris has been a tourism institution for decades, but General Manager Sarah Colgate said the future was under threat. Ms Colgate says it will mean job losses, especially through the winter months. The tourism industry will lose professional, long-term, passionate employees. Red Cat Adventures owner Julie Telford said the award-winning with Sunday business would be set back years if staff were lost over the end of the subsidy. Her quote, it feels as though we are standing on the edge of a cliff, not knowing if we will be pushed over it or pulled back from the brink. In Cairns, arguably the region hardest hit by the tourism downturn, Captor Group Managing Director Peter Woodward said 96 per cent of the 187 employees of his business were receiving JobKeeper payments. And he says, we fear that no replacement of the government funding, whether through an extension of JobKeeper or a specific tourism support package, will result in a significant reduction uh, of our skilled workforce. These are people who are on the front line, running businesses, employing people, who are telling us that the government's decision to remove JobKeeper, quote, will mean job losses in Queensland. It cannot be clearer to the government that we are facing a catastrophe in the Queensland tourism industry, which can potentially cost tens of thousands of jobs and see, and see thousands of businesses also go broke. That will have devastating impact on regional economies right around Queensland. And unfortunately, the government seems to think that they can just sit back, get there in their own time, and in the meantime, these businesses should just chug along and put up with it. That is not good enough. We need to see some urgency from this government. We need to know uh, what they are going to be doing to make sure that our tourism businesses don't fall over and that we don't see tens of thousands of tourism workers uh, lose their incomes. That would be devastating for the workers, that would be devastating for their families, but it would be devastating for regional economies where tourism is such an important industry. If we see thousands of tourism workers put out of work, that is going to mean less money in people's pockets, less money going through local shops, and we will see the spiral continue. It is absolutely critical that we hear from the government immediately about what their plan is, particularly for the tourism industry, uh, uh, once we see JobKeeper cut out at the end of March. The clock is ticking. We need an answer now. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you.